I went far beyond what I thought my body was capable of, both physically and mentally. And so with that being said, I don't have any regrets or anything I left on, I felt like I left on the table. It goes back to what Charles Poliquin used to say all the time, people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what can happen in five. And Poliquin also said people should be reading at least multiple hours. Like my, I don't think it was one, I think it was multiple yeah. hours a day. Yeah. So. And he did, I mean, he was a walking textbook, but yeah. I like to keep it around one hour. Um, and just because I don't want to burn out. Here's the thing, it's like, how hard can you train in a session versus how much tonnage can you do in a month? Yeah. If you work out too hard in one day and you got to back off, you're actually better off training easy three days in a row versus mm -hmm. one hard day and have to take two down. You want to get your bench bigger, build your triceps. How many times did you hear that from Louie? Yeah, all the time. For the last 20 years? Yeah. Okay, there was a paper that just came out and said at maximum weights, the tricep is the main presser and the pec is a stabilizer. If I see a powerlifter having an elbow issue and then I ask, you know, well, how do you squat? Well, I, I squat with a straight bar. How many times do you squat with a straight bar? Two times a week for the last five years. <laughs> There's your fucking elbow problem, asshole, <laughs> right? You are in this position twice a week, straining your ass off and you're asking me why your elbow hurts. But in reality, here's my thing. And maybe I'm biased because I've trained hard for a lot of years. But if it was so good at developing anything, why does Ben Patrick have no leg size? If I were to take Ben Patrick and show him how to squat my way, he wouldn't be any good at it. I go his way, I could still squat a load. If you look at how Ben Patrick talks about squats, it's very similar to 20 years ago what Charles Poliquin was saying. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah, he, Charles he references Poliquin a lot. He does, but I'll tell you this, I was Poliquin the last five, six years he was alive, and after he went and did seminars with me and Eddie, he changed his mind. I just like this one because they highlight right here. Close. Steroids. Okay. <laughs> yeah, badass, right? So there's me and Mark on the steroid yeah, one. Yeah, right <laughs> All the way over. Okay, so. And then Natty over here. <laughs> there's Natty down at the bottom. We were we were both a little more bloated back then. Yeah. Kind of. You were already starting bit. to get leaner then, though. Y'all have some double chins. Yeah. Well, you want a backup chin. <laughs> was this 2015? Quite a bit The worst bigger, part yeah. about that whole thing is that's a 3X shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you filled no. it out quite well. Yeah. Power Project family, how's it going? Now, a lot of you guys are lifters, athletes. You're serious about the gym, and we are too. And that's why we've been using Slingshot products for years, all right? You have the original Slingshot, obviously the glittery pink hip circle, which is my <laughs> personal favorite. But if you don't like that, then you have the normal hip circle that's used to warm up the hips. But on the website, they have tons of equipment, knee sleeves, elbow sleeves, the gangster wraps right there. <laughs> so you need to go check them out. And Andrew, can you tell them more about it? Yes, that's over at markbellslingshot.com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order. Uh, links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. How old yeah. is she? She was 86. Mm, okay. So it's not like, you know, she died too young. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's hard when you get to that age because talking with my grandma, she was just ready to go. All of her friends were already gone. All the people that she had all the fun with other than me were already gone. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, fuck. You know, I mean, I think that's a really big wake-up call for us. You don't realize the people that are in your life and how important they could be or are right now. Yeah. That's that's all temporary. Mm -hmm. You know, all Why does this headset look so small on his head? Is it, is it because a of a large head. training? <laughs> it's bigger than mine, and I usually get made fun of for that shit. Those so. headphones are stretched out. They're almost straight across. <laughs> <laughs> I got a big fucking head. Damn, bro. That's nice. That's a head of strength, though. I guess. Remember, Lou <laughs> Louie would talk about like guys with small heads. He's like, yeah. they're not good for strength training. God, you remember Mike Ruggieri's head? <laughs> yeah. Huge. He Biggest a, fucking head I've ever seen. He had a pumpkin head. Massive. I what's, think. What's up with this 520 pound squat for 24 reps? And did you nearly die from it? Because it was it was a 24 reps. And why didn't you get to depth on any of your reps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Squatting so high, so high. So yeah. So I saw it and I was like, oh, dude, these definitely all look good. They would have passed in any federation. And then I I was like, motherfucker. The funniest part was <laughs> the internet judges. Two weeks beforehand, I had done 325 for 25. I was slowly just kind of working my way up just to feel it out, make mm -hmm. sure. Didn't you do it for 26 and you did it deeper? And it wasn't 535 that you used? <laughs> Tom Platt style. <laughs> Which is funny that they all compare it to Tom Platt's because the video, you can't see Tom Platt's depth. I mm -hmm. think he's wearing a squat suit, too. And he's wearing a squat suit. I mean, I'm not hating. And then he's like, he was doing it with no sleeves. <laughs> he had a fucking Z-suit on. Put I'm a like, I'm done. Do it know? again and do it with a squat suit yeah. on. <laughs> I think that was a one-time thing. But I did the 325, and obviously at my strength level and my mileage, 325 is very hard for me to break parallel with. Because, 525, you mean? Well, the week before. Oh. oh. 
So I do 225 for 25. Then mm-hmm. the next week I do 325 for 25. And I'm like, okay, it's it's there. It feels good. And yeah. people are like, oh, that's a long way from 520. And I was like, it's not for me. Like people don't realize when I was competing, I would start the bar at 500. That's the first fucking set. So <laughs> I'm just checking my wind. Wait, this, wait, wait, like you'd go in, you wouldn't do anything else. You just put 500, and that'd be the thing that so would. So when warm I squatted 865 and a half, the all-time world record in the belt only, which was 2016, um, my first set after my winning warmups was 500. So I would do like 315 for 25 on the belt squat. 500 was the first set, and so that way I learned this quickly because <laughs> one time I went to a meet. And the hotel, you know how the meets were at the hotels? <clears throat> well, Don't try this at home, by the way. <laughs> no, don't try this at home. So one time, I'm up in my room. I don't like to be at the meet before I compete. It just wears me out watching other people. So I tell my friend, I'm like, hey, let me know when I'm about an hour and a half away from my flight starting. The son of a bitch fucking forgets. <laughs> I have my buddy running up to my hotel room and goes, dude, you got 25 minutes before your first fucking attempt. I'm like, oh, shit. So I had to start at 500. Mm-hmm. Well, I did, and that's when I was still in equipment. I did, and I squatted 1197.6, the all-time world record in gear. So oh, I was shit. like, I didn't need to fucking do all those warm-ups. Mm-hmm. And ironically, I had more left in the tank for deadlifts. Yeah. So anyway. Um, it's amazing because no matter how much you wor- you warm up, there's always that set that you get from a war- from a particular warm up where you're like, I'm good now. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't happen in the early sets. It doesn't no. happen with a plate. It doesn't happen with two plates. It doesn't have. It happens when you get to I don't know maybe around sixty or seventy percent. You get kind of over the hump, mm-hmm. and then in your head you're like, okay, I think I can handle something pretty good today. Yeah, and I never base how good a meet or a workout's going to go by how the warm up sets feel, mm. because I've had some of the worst warm up <laughs> sets, and then. For some reason, my body just wakes the fuck up and says it's time to go, and then it's game on. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I think having that ability to flip that switch on demand without going, well, I didn't have enough warm-ups, or well, I didn't have this, or I didn't have this optimal environment. It was too fucking hot. I mean, how many gyms here and my gym, we don't have fucking AC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you go to a meet, it's like a fucking vacation because now it's a controlled 70, 68. My gym, when I did that, 520 for 24 was 103. Oh, fuck. Yo. I had a fan on me. That's all I had. Because mm-hmm. it was in the end of July, I believe, in Ohio. You Humid. know the humidity and yeah. heat. Brutal. So I go in a little bit early. I said, hey, guys, let's all get there at 8 o'clock before it gets too hot. Mm-hmm. I probably started that squat at 9 a.m. So it wasn't quite hot enough yet, but my place is an old warehouse. It just absorbs heat. So it was hot. And I was like, dude, if I'd have waited about another month now, because it's like 64 back there now. Yeah. I probably would have been able to squeeze out a couple of more, but I was just tired of putting it off for so long. So are you going to pull up the video? Yeah, I was looking for it on your Instagram. I I don't understand. I look at this and I'm like, how in the fuck is that not below parallel? Oh, it is. The internet (laughs) just... So it's just funny because to me, if you look at... You're cheating. I, you got a belt on. You have those... Uh, those are strong sleeves. Yeah, those mm, are way too strong. Probably marked too size too small. small. Well, what's funny com. is they're, they're a 4X sleeve. I mean, I put them on myself, you know? <laughs> but uh, people were asking about the wrap around the left hip. So when I was training at Louie's at Westside, um, I had tore my left hip squatting 1,055, and mm. it didn't hurt when I tore it. It was actually in the joint like I... Like I hurt some part of the, the hip socket. Let's go back and watch that last rep. I don't. I got. I got some problems with this last. The rep. The last rep got nasty. Yeah. Yeah. What happened here? Is this a completed rep, guys? Like, let's <laughs> let's let's judge this. Let's be yeah. internet judges. Let's be picky. <laughs> so what happened was I was about ready to hit my face to the fucking floor. So, <laughs> so at twenty, at twenty, I'm like, okay, now I know why this is a world fucking record. At this twenty two, I'm having to really check my that right there. You can almost see I'm starting to almost lose my balance. This is what's this is what's impressive. Oh, brutal! This is what's impressive. That just hurt. I like hurt. did not notice my wind being the problem. My conditioning because of my winning warmups were so good. Yeah, that was a complete, total, full body muscle failure. Mm. So what you didn't see is after I got done with that, I laid on the ground. I couldn't move for I would say about twelve <laughs> to fifteen minutes. Shit. Like Ooh. I felt like if I moved, my body was gonna fucking like go into some place I didn't want it to go. Welcome yeah. to CrossFit. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> with real weights. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, but but you know, this is a really interesting thing because it's like okay, the the record was twenty three, you got twenty four, and it's that whole concept of 
if you know what the barrier is, you'll just go right past it and then you just, just well, exhaust. So my goal was 25. Okay. That was the goal. Yeah. I thought, honestly, I thought probably two weeks prior, I thought that maybe around 30 was close. I think the heat is what got me a little. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it was like I wanted to be, at least for me, myself, I wanted to be the only squatter that ever broke world records equipped, raw, and had at least something in the rep range that was fucking insane. Yeah. And so for me, it was one of those things I knew I was going to be 43 in a couple of months. I'll be 43 in a couple of weeks now. And I was like, I cannot wait any longer. Like the body is going to start not letting me do this at some point. I need to put the hammer down and just fucking do it. And that's why I didn't wait till it got cooler. Mm -hmm. I felt good doing the 325 for 25. I'm like, I'm going for it next week. Fuck it. And I knew at the week after that, I was going out to talk to Jeff Cavalier and speak at his conference. So that was going to put a ding in the training cycle. And so I just had to do it, you know. So right now you can you can uh, you can go and train and do just about anything that you want in strength, right? If you wanted to set your sights again on an eight hundred pound deadlift, I'm sure you could probably accomplish that. If you wanted to get back in gear, mm -hmm. you could probably do some of those things. Do you think that those would any of those things interest you anymore? Or are you just like you you did that and you're cool with it? I felt like at each division of what I did, I felt like I gave everything I had. And I think the only thing to gain from going back and doing that is just injury. I mean, at this point, I feel like, you know, I, some people look back, I think the people that have those issues are people that maybe have not attained the goals that they thought were possible. I went far beyond what I thought my body was capable of, both physically and mentally. And so with that being said, I don't have any regrets or anything I left on, I felt like I left on the table. But I also feel like I got extremely lucky that I didn't accumulate any mileage or injuries. So it's kind of like, how many times can you go to the blackjack table and win before you lose? Mm. And for me, it's not worth losing anymore. I mean, let's just get, let's just put this in perspective. How many fucking guys can squat over 500 pounds for close to 25 reps? Not many. And only 13,000 people gave a fuck. Now, if, so, if that video would have went viral and it had 10 million views, and people are like, dude, you got to try something crazier, you know, or that would have picked up maybe right. some bigger sponsors for the for the YouTube channel. Maybe I consider it. But the mileage to risk ratio is not fucking worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that because I thought that I could beat Platts' record. And in my opinion, I did. What's the point after that? You know, it, it's to the point now you get old enough that you start looking back at the shit you and I did and you start going, okay, that was fucking insane. Now, what's the point of it? The point of it was is that I pushed my limits as far as I thought I could, and I got away with no injuries. So to me, I won. Because there's so many guys that we competed against that can't fucking walk good anymore. They can't even they can't even train anymore because they're so beat up. Somehow, either because of my smarts or some luck or some education, I got the ability to push past that and go further than I ever thought I could, but without accumulation of mileage. And that was my whole goal. I wanted people to realize, like, look, Maybe I had a little bit of gifts when I was a kid and I was had the potential to be stronger than a lot of people, but I lasted for 30 years too. Mm -hmm. You can't take that away. And so for me, it's it's one of those things where I just felt like I didn't leave anything on the table and any particular thing. Now, I just want to feel good, look good, be healthy, including you know constant blood work. Um, and I was always pretty healthy for being a bigger guy, but you know you can't sustain... 300 pounds in your 40s and 50s and not re retain some health issues. So right now, 255 to 63, my blood work looks amazing. And that's where I know my body needs to be. If I push into the 270s, my triglycerides and blood sugars start to act weird, no matter how clean I try to do it. So it's not worth it to me. Yeah. And that's always what I think people need to balance is get as good as you can at whatever you want to be good at, but don't put your health behind that because eventually you'll have neither Right. If you're not healthy getting up to that point, you will not sustain it. And then you're going to pay for it more than you think. How can other people do that in whatever particular sport they're interested in? Do you think like, cause a lot of people they'll do jujitsu for a long time. They get real excited. They jump into it for, you know, they're, they're doing it frequently. They're doing it at a high intensity. Uh, we see it a lot with lifting and a lot of lifters will complain to me like, man, how do you keep your elbows and how do you keep your knees? And I'm thinking like, 
Well, you know, during my powerlifting career, I did run into issues with the elbows and the knees and stuff like that. But right now I feel fucking awesome. I don't have any more problems. So how do you think some other people can avoid the trap of like being so obsessed with just getting better today yeah. and maybe see off into the distance a little bit so they can. Well, maybe that's a, maybe that's a trait that I just have that gives me the advantages. But I will say this one, always get your blood work done. There's always some creeping issue that either you're fighting genetically or because you're abusing bad foods or whatever, bad genetics. So I'll give you an example. When my dad found out he was sick, if I live another year, I will outlive my dad. When my dad found out he was sick, his triglycerides were 1,270 at the doctor. Oh, my goodness. Highs 300. Mm -hmm. He had cancer so bad that within six months, he was six foot five, weighed 280, and in six months, he was 90 pounds. Oh and they God. told him, he's like, we're just going to try to keep you comfortable because it's everywhere. And so he was exposed to Agent Orange of Vietnam. He also was a smoker, which accelerated it. Yeah. So a lot of different compounding factors. But the point is, is I think the first thing you need to do is make sure that you're trying to do everything you can to be healthy. The second thing I think is just as, or maybe if not more important and more controllable, is always be looking at structural and muscular weaknesses. So your training should be developing the shortcomings of your physical body, meaning if you have bad hamstring to quadricep ratio, you need to get that closer to a proper ratio, which should be as close to one-to-one -one as possible. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a strong core or transverse abdominal muscles, you know, which I think is the most important ab muscle you have, which is the deeper one that goes this way, instead of the six-pack that everybody thinks, the TVA is actually what braces in and locks. Is that more like obliques and things of that nature? It'd be underneath the oblique. Okay. So that muscle group, in my opinion, is really connected heavily into the lower back mm -hmm. and back injuries. So TVA is insanely important to be strong. So how do you like, real quick, pausing on the TVA, how do you work on that specifically? What movements would well, you Well, you got planks, right? Mm -hmm. When you squat and deadlift, the body forces them to turn on. As long as your posture and everything is so, maybe sound. do some stuff without a belt here and there, or something like that. Beltless training, side planks, mm -hmm. uh, leg raises, anything that's going to require bracing is going to require TVA. Anything that attaches the upper and lower extremities together to produce a movement is going to attack the TVA. Farmer carry. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Farmers carry overhead squats, which you know I'm not a huge fan of overhead stuff, but but maybe walking with something overhead. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. My point is, is one, make sure you're healthy internally. Yeah. Two, make sure you're healthy externally by meaning look at your posture and muscle balances and make sure that those are as even as you possibly can. But the problem is, say you have a hamstring weakness, which I would say 60% of the people watching this, hamstrings are not strong enough to do what they want to do. Would mm -hmm. we agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're going to make a program for somebody's hamstrings to get better, how long does that actually take? Well, oh. I can tell you because the Bulgarians and Russians wrote about it, 36 months. <laughs> why did they come up with that fucking number? Fucking years. Because yeah. what I think, they didn't really say why they came up with the number, because the hamstring is not a great leverage style muscle. Let's look at the quadricep, for example. If we look at the quadricep, you got multiple muscles coming down to the kneecap. The kneecap is not only a protector of the knee if you fall, it's a lever system. It's the only joint in your body that has a bone over the joint to create a lever. That floats, yeah. So how in the fuck does the hamstring stay in balance with the quadricep with that level of leverage in the front? It's insanely hard. Yeah. So the Soviets figured out a long time ago that it's going to take three years to create some sort of balance at that joint, which is why I feel we have so many knee issues, but it's also why I feel it's very important to squat with vertical shanks and learn how to do that before you go to any other training style. I'm not saying you don't use it occasionally, like mm -hmm. a knee over toe or an Olympic-style squat. But learn how to squat using the posterior chain as a primary mover because it's probably your primary fucking weakness. Don't most powerlifters do that, though, because they squat low bar and they drive into their hips when they're squatting? Or are they doing something off well, when I they're think, doing that? I think with Louis passing and Westside's information kind of not becoming lost but not relevant today— because of whatever the lifters are, we're finding the freaks out of the, now people don't develop anymore. They just are or not. Yeah. Would you agree? So I would say that's that, a fair statement. Yeah. I would say that squatting technique in general has been a little bit lost because the guys that are good at it now are probably good at it because their leverages are good, not because they learned how to do it right. 
Whereas, you know, we saw guys at Westside when you and I were there that were not built to squat what they could squat, but they learned how to lever the weight correctly. Look at Corey Gregory. Yeah, Corey he's Gregory. still squatting, you know, pretty heavy weights. He's a, and he's a thinner guy. He's probably an inch taller than me. He just yeah. does not have leverage to squat. No, and he's close to fifty. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, he's still doing it. So, I think you have to be healthy in both ways, internal and external. But you don't find anybody talking about correcting postural deficiencies and muscular weaknesses before extreme loading occurs. And that's why everybody's in and out in two to four years versus like you and I are in it for thirty years. Mm. So that, that to me is one of the biggest problems I see today is the fact that we're not, we're not looking at everything long-term. And in reality, in reality, if you want to be insanely strong, let's say this is, you know, because I would say that most people watching this like to work out, yeah. but maybe they don't have the potential right now to be elite or one of the best in the world. But is it because you're not good enough genetically or your timeline's too short? Because I'll tell you one of the biggest things that was ever told to me that shaped my entire career. 21 years old, I squat my first 700. Okay? 21. 21. How long were you powerlifting at that point? Already almost 10 years. Whew. I just won, mm -hmm. I won my first world title at 19. I'd already been training for seven years. I started when I was 12. Yeah. And in and the long story short, there were a lot of supportive people in the area that were decent powerlifters that were only a mile from my house. So I got mm -hmm. lucky starting younger and they would never let me push until I failed. They always worked on technique first, blah, blah, blah. But the big thing is, is that at 22, I'm up closer to Chicago and I squat 700. Guess who's there? Ed Cohen. And I didn't know him very well, but my coach knew of him. And he goes, you need to talk to him. And I talked to Eddie and Eddie goes, man, that 700 pound squat looked really good. If you can stay healthy in five or eight years, you'll squat 800. And for an average person, they go, well, what? I, Another 100 pounds is going to take me five fucking years. Mm -hmm. I didn't care because I liked training. So to me, it was, it's not going to take me that long in my mind, but I didn't care if it did or not because I just like being in the gym. So the thing of it is, is my timeline was never, I want to be this by 25 or I want to be this by next week. I will be as patient as I need to be to get where I need to be, period. And I think that's missing today. It's missing in almost in every aspect of sport or whatever. Even with weight loss. Yeah, but I was when I was flying here from Ohio, <clears throat> I was reading some books because I was I'm actually going to write a book for human kinetics on conjugate training. Sick. Which is awesome, but it's a lot of work. And I was reading some things and they said if you read for one hour a day, which is five percent or ten percent of your day, in five to eight years you will be a master of your field if you read in that field. <laughs> Five years. Mm -hmm. It goes back to what Charles Poliquin used to say all the time. People overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what can happen in five. And Poliquin also said people should be reading at least multiple hours. Like not, I don't think it was one. I think it was multiple yeah. hours a day. Yeah. So. And he did. I mean, he was a walking textbook. But yeah. I like to keep it around one hour um, and just because I don't want to burn out. Here's the thing. It's like how hard can you train in a session versus how much tonnage can you do in a month? Yeah. If you work out too hard in one day and you got to back off, you're actually better off training easy three days in a row versus mm -hmm. one hard day and having to take two down. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with education, in my opinion. Slow, methodical amounts are more important than intense amounts at one bout. And that can be in education or in physical ability, in my opinion. You know, one thing that you were saying when Ed told you, you, you squatted 700, you said five to eight years to be able to squat 800. First off... You know, you're talking about people wanting to do things super quickly. Well, on social, the crazy thing is you see cats one year, they're squatting 700, and then the next year they're squatting 800 or they're getting very close to 800. You see guys who are deadlifting 850 or 900 one year, and the next year they're deadlifting 1,000. So I, I, it makes me wonder because, I mean, e even myself, when I came here to ST, I was deadlifting 620 and then in like six or seven months i deadlifted 750 but it was because of all the people around me so i wonder if number one yeah strength does take time but is it partially because a lot of people are seeing some people do this kind of quickly that maybe some of the processes are a little bit better but also they're maybe going too fast at it at yeah. the same time the big question is though okay let's say a guy goes from 700 to 850 in a year Where's he at the next year? Yeah. He's fucking injured and he's gone. Yeah. That's the problem with today is you see these guys do these immense things, but you don't see dudes lasting like Mike Bridges and Larry Pacifico. 
I mean, think about this. Larry Pacifico won 10 world titles in a row. Could you imagine being the best in the world in your weight class for 10 straight fucking years? At anything? Yeah. That is called the guy I want to fucking talk to. Mm -hmm. Because not only has he figured out how to be the best, he's figured out how to fucking stay there. And that's the big problem we and have And you know is. for a fact that he wasn't always the strongest. You know what I mean? No. Like, he had to use his wits. He had to figure out, like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to catch this guy on my deadlift. Or he had to be strategic, I'm sure. Yeah, strategic. But the point is, is I don't take anybody's advice, per se, in certain things, unless they show me that they know what they're talking about for at least 10 years. <laughs> because now their longevity— I'm going to come back to the idea in 10 years. <laughs> so the, the longevity aspect of that creates the education. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked about that earlier, but there's just, there's so much lack of education these days. There's so much information out now, but nobody's utilizing it and nothing's long-term. We look at all these strength studies. How many of them are longer than a year? None. And who are they studying? And who, yeah, exactly. Who are they studying? That's another issue. You know, I don't want to hear that you figured out how to bench press from a study that trained recreational lifters in college they could only bench press 185 fucking pounds yep <laughs> because they went from 185 to 225 you're like i don't care about that study yeah, yeah. awesome bicep curl jackass right. <laughs> but now you oh. show me a study that takes somebody say from 450 to 500 10 percent at that level now i want to hear what you have to say and so there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago i'd have to cite it for you but they showed how long has Louie and myself and a handful of other guys talked about the bench press being a tricep mover? Hmm. A lot, right? How You want to get your bench bigger, build your triceps. How many times did you hear that from Louie? Yeah, all the time. For the last 20 years? Yep. Okay, there was a paper that just came out and said at maximum weights, the tricep is the main presser and the pec is a stabilizer. <laughs> no shit, motherfucker. I love this shit. Did this, see? this paper came out the day Louis, the, the day, day after Louis, Louis died. died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Just the way things went for him. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I mean, Charlie Francis had a great meme. I'll post it later today so people can see it. But Charlie Francis was the guy that trained Ben Johnson. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the best Olympic sprint coaches to ever live. From Most Canada. influential, yeah. And influential. And he had a hellacious meme. He's been dead for a while. He said, the job of the researcher is to prove what I already know works. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and I was like, fucking A, right? Yeah, that's Matt, an amazing quote. I'm, I'm really curious about this, man, because we have so many people that, uh, number one, come on the podcast, they talk about evidence-based stuff, social media, there's a lot of people who are super evidence-based, right? And some of the shit you, you see, you're like, ah, even though that's evidence-based, it kind of seems like bullshit. You are big into learning, reading, educating yourself, uh, but you're also big into the practical aspects of a lot of things. Sure. Now, how do you navigate and, and uh, kind of filter the evidence-based side of things and then the practicality side of things. Because something that you've been, you guys have been saying for 20 years about the bench press and the tricep is something that when you tell that to an evidence-based guy, he'd be like, oh, no, when you look at the biomechanics of that, that doesn't make any sense. And then research shows up to kind of back up what the guys who've been practically doing this shit have been saying for years. Uh -huh. How do you balance that? Well, the first thing is, is you, you take research with a grain of salt. Because, again, you don't know what the population that they're studying. Now, that is the real advantage to the old Bulgarian, Soviet, Eastern Bloc country researching because they wouldn't do research on people that weren't already elite. The A.S. Prilipin chart was situated with lifters wow. that were already good and were practiced with thousands of lifters. Mm -hmm. So Louis' thought process on volume, which I still follow today, how many speed works do you do? How many speed reps do you do in a, in a week? How many max effort that was all learned 60 fucking years ago. Nobody wants to listen. The thing of it is, if you have thousands of elite athletes and they and that system all works for almost all of those guys, now you're telling me something. But you take 10 people from the gym at your, at your high school or college and you put them into a weight training program, all you got to do is read the fucking study. But that's where highly experienced lifters can look at something and tell if it's garbage or it's not. Um a lot of the stuff that I learned about muscle in particular was, was veterinarian studies because you can control mice. Mm. You can make them eat, sleep, and train anytime you want and whatever you want to do. So They don't bench press very well, though. <laughs> no, they're terrible benchers. <laughs> but the thing of it is, is if you, if you look at the research that was done in the old Eastern Bloc countries, they were as close to controlled as possible. They were in barracks. They trained. They didn't work. They were separated from families for multiple months at a time. So you're taking away variables. You're taking away stressors. So if that's optimal, why not follow the optimal? And so to me, 
I don't hold a lot of clout into the new research because of the population that they're training. If you could separate somebody and put them in a scenario like a con or a, a communist state where when you decide or they decide for you that you are going to be an Olympic lifter or a gymnast and now the next 10 years of your life is dedicated to that, now you have some research. Yeah. And it sucks because nobody thinks, well, I don't want to live like that. Well, if you're a scientist and you want to study, you definitely want that scenario. We can't really replicate that in today's global situation. The Chinese are probably as close as to the Olympic lifting is that they can to do that. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the Soviet coaches are over there now. So in the 90s, when the Soviet Union fell apart, a lot of the Soviet coaches went to China. And the reason was they don't want to come to America because they don't have any control of the athlete. I mean, look, let's look mm -hmm. at Mark Henry, for example. Mm. Mike Stone, which applied and didn't get hired, but he was going to be my professor in grad school when Kramer left and went to UConn. He came in and we got to sit down and talk for quite a while. And he said, Mark Henry was the most genetically gifted guy he'd ever seen, but he was too lazy for him to train. He would come in and be like, I don't feel like working out today and just walk out. You didn't do that in the Soviet system, mm -hmm. right? It was a privilege to represent your country. It was a privilege to have the capacity to win gold medals. And then you start looking at the fact that you had t dozens, if not hundreds of researchers working for the same goal. So let's just look at it from that perspective. Imagine if we had medical doctors, psychologists, biomechanical experts, all working with the USOC and the athlete had to live that life. We would probably find some really cool research and get even better. But in my opinion, we just can't replicate that now. And so with that particular situation, we have a problem with research today. So what I always do is I read it. I look at the thing, the, the research as a whole. But then I also remember my core values of what took me 30 years to understand, which is I know AS Prolopin's chart's pretty damn close. I know that we need to max. I know that we need repetition effort work, and I know we need Andrew, dynamic see if, work. see if you can pull that up, the Prolopin's chart. Oh, man. Yeah. It so shouldn't be too hard to with, find. With me being that particular, I try to see what fits into that and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, if you balance that with knowing structural weaknesses, so how do you find structural uh -huh. weaknesses? Well, you either have an advanced coach or you've been around it long enough to, to look at your own videos and go, that didn't look right. This is the muscle group I think is the problem. Yeah, and sometimes you're wrong, but you'll still find yeah, it eventually. Eventually you'll find yeah. it if you're cognitive about what you're doing. And that's another big issue you see with uh, training today is people might be videoing it to post it on Instagram or anything of that nature. But what you start finding is that who's training really cognitive and who has monthly and, say, quarterly or biannual training modalities set in place? They don't. Mm -hmm. Give They're us – Give us a give us a little dissertation on this, uh, if you will, like kind of guide us through, okay. uh, you know how someone would utilize some of these some so of these numbers. This looks like a modification of the mm. prolopin chart, but let's just say it's the right one. So if we look at um, percent of one RM is ninety five to one hundred percent. I believe ninety percent. So and I base everything off of RPE, mm. and so did Prilipin and them guys after this chart was made, and I want to say the mid '60s. Rate of perceived effort, is that right? right? So Exertion. for those of you that are utilizing percentage-based training, it is very good about keeping you honest, but it also doesn't build in the fluctuation of day-to-day -day stressors. Yeah. So the RPE scale allows you to do a nine or ninety percent when it's applicable. So you're always training as hard as you can. So, for instance, I've been sipping on this water for the last 20 minutes, and it's only down to here. Well, if I've worked my ass off and i got a family and kids, this is how much I can train. I might want to train this whole can. Mm. I only have this much energy left. RPE is adaptable to that. Mm -hmm. So, with that being said, it allows you to train harder. But let's just go back to the, to the Prilipin chart. So, it's telling us that we need to be around one to three reps per set. That keeps us in the maximal effort range. Total reps per workout, which is about seven, um, four to 10, and then that creates maximal strength. 85 to 95% is going to be strength as well. I find that is probably the sweet spot to not overtrain. So what you'll find in the book, and it's not going to come out for a long time, but the Soviets figured out with warm-ups, main lifts, and accessories that the average percentage of the workout needed to be between 72 and 76% for optimal recovery and optimal performance gain. Anything above that, overtraining, anything under that wasn't enough stimulus. Mm -hmm. So if we break down this particular scenario, what it's doing is telling you how many reps per percentage area you need to train in order for your body to adapt to the training. Anything above that's over and anything under that is 
not optimal. So when your intensity is higher, when you're utilizing more weight, when you're getting closer to your one rep max, you're also going to be doing less sets, correct? Yeah, and that's where you have to understand. See that 95 to 100 at the top? You have to ask yourself one big thing, especially the way I train or powerlifters train. You have to ask yourself, are you testing what you have or are you building something new? In reality, you can't do both at the same time. So I find that 85, 95% allows you to strain, tells the body enough information, hey, we need to get stronger, but also allows adaptability because the percentage isn't a fight or flight scenario. And if you're using like a new bar or new exercise, yeah. be really fucking careful, right? Because yeah. it's a novel thing to your body, right? Absolutely. So you look at the video that I gave you yesterday. I benched, I got off the plane, no meals, got up and left my house at 4 a.m. to come here and bench 500 with the Cadillac bar from Kabuki. I've yep. never used that bar. Never. Ever. Whew. So grab something you've never done before and still hit within, I'd say that's about 90% of what I could bench. Yeah, it still looks pretty easy, yeah. Okay, I stopped. There's no point in going heavier. My Don't body's greedy, going, hey, yeah. this is a new fucking environment. We just got you, because that Cadillac bar is not only a very close to hammer grip, it's also arced. So now you're an inch and a half deeper than you probably would be on a normal bar. Well, for an elite bencher, that's a completely different environment. So I know that if I can use almost any bar and be within 90% of my best, my training is actually developing new strengths without testing. But it's still max effort, though. Mm -hmm. So how do you change and make these percentages adjust? You change the exercise, the stimulus. Because if, say, the Cadillac bar, let's say 525 was my max that day. 500 is enough to get better. 525 would overtrain, stop right before the overtraining process occurs. But that requires a lot of skill and a lot of swallowing your pride and your ego. Mm. I mean, I hadn't seen your brother for years. So for him to see me bench five plates right off the plane was like crazy. I could have impressed him more, but I know when to stop. Yeah. And that comes with experience, right? So percentages basically give you an idea of where you need to be. Um, I wouldn't say that that chart would be the one I would select. I would go with the one that's the original chart. Um, so it looks like just, it's got bluish top. If you show me, like Matt has it in his pocket, yeah. probably somewhere. <laughs> but here's, here's my chart. Uh, the one on the left, which got this the blue one? and white. That's the original chart right there. Mm. Yep. Okay. Oh, nice. There we go. Right now, this is where I think that other chart had messed up. These are how many you need about per month. Notice also too, this is a strength chart, right? And what I noticed right away is that a hundred percent's not on there. It's not. And th this is where I started to understand that 9 RPE or 90% was the trick to max effort for years to come. And for even something like sprinting, right? Like so, yeah. you know, Hussein Bolt, these guys, they yeah. how often do they do max sprints? 100%, very, very seldom. Every four years, maybe, when he shows up to the Olympics and smokes some people, yeah. right? So the key is, are you testing or are you building new? 90%, in my opinion, builds new. Over 90% tests your strength, but it's not necessarily making you better because it's too strenuous and the body starts throwing governors and anxiety. Mm. I mean, we've been there for years. Yeah. You go a little too heavy, what happens the next week? You're neurologically drained. You feel like shit. You may have to push through your training. That's telling your body to shut down. It was too difficult for me uh, to do percentage-based training for that reason. It's the reason why I didn't have much programming because when I did that, it just, it would stress me out before the gym. It's almost like Mike, the Mike Tyson stare down where he had the guy beat before <laughs> the weights had me beat sometimes. And I was like, man, that's, that's not like me. I'm more, I'm normally more carefree. I normally have more fun in the gym and I would just stiffen up and I'd be super tight thinking about the double that I had to do with 935 or whatever the yeah, fuck it was. So what I would do is when I was competing, this might be helpful for some that are listening is I would do like, let's say. Uh, eight weeks out, I would do, say, if I was going to squat 850, I'd do 700 for four, right? But that was a percentage, maybe 80% for four. The two weeks between that, I would pick a bar and I would stop when I felt like I had strained enough, which is about a nine. So I'd do a safety bar band, safety bar chains or camber bar or whatever. Then three weeks after that point, so that was week eight, let's say, week four, I would do 750 for three, another higher percentage one less rep. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a percentage conjugate. So I would percent to make my body understand what needed to be done. And then in between those weeks, I'm still straining, but I'm using a different stimulus that's based on RPE. So I go percentage, RPE, RPE, percentage, RPE, RPE. And every time I'd ramp it up, go to a meet, boom, break a world record. This reminds me uh, of 
the way that some people will run. Some people choose to run and they might run for time one day, but they don't check the distance. Mm -hmm. On another day, they might just run the distance and not check the time. Other times they check both to kind of see where they're at and, yep. and to measure where they're at. Some days they're going to go harder, but again, back back to like the some of the things that were on that chart, they're going to be, for most of their training, if somebody's training smart, is going to, pro and the higher level athlete can get away with maybe not having the percentage quite as high. Um, but I think, you know, that 75 to maybe 90% is mm -hmm. where most people should hang out most of the time. But a lot of times you see people, they just want the PR. They want the PR, whether it be running, lifting, mm -hmm. whatever it is they're doing. And over a period of time, normally your luck runs out. And then if it doesn't, people will always point to the one guy on Instagram where it hasn't run out, someone like a John Hack. But we don't really know, like John, you know, he's posting the main lift. He's he's posting the cool thing that he did for the day. And obviously he's lifting crazy weights. He might be the strongest lifter that ever lived. He's doing an amazing job. Uh, but we're also not seeing like him doing pull-ups. We're not seeing him doing weighted dips. And or how these... long he's taking on an off season. Right. We had all, we don't have any idea of some of these things. How often does I mean, he compete, right? Well, bodybuilders have been doing that for years. I mean, think about like, well, every bodybuilder, but let's just go back to Arnold's day. Yeah. He would lean out and get ready for an Olympia, take an ass load of pictures and then use them all year. So people thought he'd literally look like that all year round. And he mm -hmm. probably did stay pretty fit. I'm not saying he got yeah, like right. bloated or nasty, but my point is, is that, you know, bodybuilders, I remember Johnny Jackson talking about that mm -hmm. a long time ago. He grew out facial hair. They take a bunch of pictures with him with a beard. Then the next day they'd shave it. So it looked like a different timeline. And then he'd go to a oh. bodybuilding show and then he'd put back on another 10% body fat and train his ass off. Mm -hmm. But Genius. then everybody for a whole year <laughs> thought that he looked like that year round. Yeah. You know, and I remember like Dexter Jackson used to talk about that and <clears throat> all those other people. But the point is, is like you have to build in off seasons. You have to build in transitional seasons where you're working on different qualities. So I think one of the biggest reasons that I lasted as long as I did and I'm still around and can still do crazy things is because I'll do phases where I work on isolateral balance. So like left and rights. Mm -hmm. I'll work on phases where I'm working on speed work more than max work. I'm working on straining more than conditioning. Then I go to other phases where I'm working on capacity versus strength. It doesn't mean I don't maintain those other areas. It just means the emphasis is switched. So if you look at the system that I use, the winning warmups, they mostly stay around a four RPE. The reason is because if you go four RPE in that, nine RPE on your main lift, which is either as fast or as heavy as possible, mm -hmm. and around eight RPE on the accessories, do the math and tell me what percentage that comes out to be. It's like 73%. What did I just say? You have to keep your percentages as an overall basis around 75% of workout as far as total intensity or you're going to get beat up or get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that, either from the, the East Germans or the, the Bulgarian systems, I started realizing that there was some magic in those percentages. So RPE4 on the warm-up stays that way all the time because I want that average of 75% of total exertion at the end of – the cumulative percentage of strain. Yeah. Where but, do you think like some screaming joint pain comes from? Like how do we go back and like find maybe the origin of it? And, and what is like, what is some of your ways to help solve that? Cause I know there's some guys, especially like with the elbow. And I just think like, man, the elbow joint is really involved in like almost every single movement that we're doing in the gym. Cause we're always like holding a weight to some degree, pulling mm -hmm. it or pushing it. So what are some things that you would advocate to, help with that well the first thing is is that pain is not simple pain can sometimes be completely developed from something else so again your knee pain might be caused from your foot your knee pain could be caused from your lower back it could be caused from a hip issue it could be caused my opinion most of the time from a muscular imbalance or activation issue the point is is that when you get pain in my opinion for the average listener look at the other side of that joint so if your elbow hurts, it could be bicep tendonitis, right? Might, your pain might be back here, but the problem's here. Mm -hmm. And then you start, most of the time when I've seen people that have shoulder or elbow pain, I start digging into their training. They're doing too much isolated bicep work. And even when they do back work, they're doing so much bicep work that they're not even really working their back because their arm's dominant neurologically. Yeah. So you start looking at all those factors. You start seeing the pieces of the puzzle come together. So if you have elbow issues, look at the shoulder look at your wrist, look at your forearms, start looking at the area as a whole versus compartmentalizing. Well, I only have pain in my right knee. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it could be your right hamstring. It could be your right glute. It could be your foot. So it sounds like, well, hell, how do I look that up? Trial and error. That's how you really figure everything out. You get smarter every time you figure out your own problem, you know, and that's through research and training and experience and working around different kinks and bruises and dings, you start really realizing how your body functions and what really happens. So, so if we think that way, then you can start to say, well, maybe if I use a different bar when I squat, <laughs> right? Because then your hands are down here, yep. like a cambered bar, safety bar. How do I take pressure off the elbow? What are some things I can do in my training yep. where I can still do a lot of stuff that I love, but I can do less reps where my arm is in a weird compromised position. So now you're getting into the meats and potatoes, a conjugate and the thought process of why you train the way we trained, which is rotation of movement. So a lot of times if I see, say, a powerlifter, let's just say that's my background. If I see a powerlifter having an elbow issue and then I ask, you know, well, how do you squat? Well, I, I squat with a straight bar. How many times do you squat with a straight bar? Two times a week for the last five years. <laughs> There's your fucking elbow problem, asshole. <laughs> Right? You are in this position twice a week straining your ass off and you're asking me why your elbow hurts. Mm. So if he were to go safety bar, no elbow pressure at all, camber bar, minimal elbow pressure, and then a straight bar, and then rotated that around, there's no joint pain because you're changing the pressure gradient and now the joints may still be squatting, but the specificity of the exact movement has changed just enough to give pressure in areas of the joint a break. Or maybe skip a squat workout, for God's sake. skip a squat workout (laughs) and just work on accessories. There's been many times I walk into the gym and I cut the core lift out and do the warm-ups and do the accessories. And I'll tell you why. Because in my opinion, for almost everybody's goal, the lacking issue is that they forget that GPP is the base on which everything is built. So if you're not fit enough to recover from a max effort exercise, eventually you're not going to do max effort. If you're not mobile enough, eventually the joint's going to be pissed off and not let you through the range of motion. The point is every time you go through a cycle where you may PR and whatever you like to PR in, it could be a running distance or a lifting amount, you need to go back to the basics and reanalyze everything and figure out where are the shortcomings and then develop your training based on those areas versus thinking you got it figured out because the body is a constant change either through aging, mileage, could be all kinds of different factors. But I always sit back down when I get down, say like when I did that Tom Platt squat, it was a reanalyzation of everything that I did. I watched the squat. And as you can see in the video, there was no technical breakdown. I was just fucking trash. Yeah. That is mastery because I was tired. My my eyes were blacking out. My body wanted to die and I did not change my form. That shows you the level of technical mastery. Because the average person would have knees would have started bucking in at 15, back would have started rounding at 18. Mm-hmm. My body just said, I've had enough, but it didn't break form. And that's when you start realizing that the ability to use video to find your weakness at that level becomes nearly impossible. It's what you feel because you can't see it in the video. It's not there. My knees didn't come in, my shins didn't go forward, my back didn't round. Where's the weakness? I mean, at that level, there's no fucking weakness. Yeah. Because if there's a weakness, it shows quickly once there's about, there's more ways than this, but to make it simple and quick, there's three ways you can see a weakness. You can see it by moving insanely fast. So if I say, I want you to speed squat, but you got to move as fast as you can, you're going to make a form error if you don't have balance, Mm. like structural balance. But you're going to have to be a pretty good coach to see it because it's going to be quick. You can go heavy as shit. And then that's going to show you where your weaknesses are because when you go into strain, there is no amount of coaching that happens at fight or flight. Or if I put, you know, let's say 500 pounds in your hands right now to bench, Mm -hmm. you're going to show me what the problem is really fucking fast, right? Again, there's one other way. I can go very unstable. I could take a bar and hang a bunch of kettlebells on it and watch you squat. What are you going to do? You're going to do whatever you can to stay in that situation, which is going to show me all your strengths and your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So you can go unstable, you can go quickness, or you can go heavy. Those three ways could show you as an assessment tool of what you need to be working on in in general. That's what I utilize those for. So when you're maxing or you're doing speed work or you're doing shit till failure, don't use it as, well, I got 26 reps with 100-pound dumbbells on the bench. You tell me where the weakness was and what started to happen when you got Mm -hmm. tired. That's the information you should be getting, not the end result. And that's where I think people will mess up is they might be testing what they're doing, but they're not assessing what they're doing. You know, I know you're probably going to mention the longevity aspect of things, but 
you know, some people are very scared, especially if let's say they're a competing powerlifter. Mm -hmm. um, number one, maybe they don't give themselves a long enough time horizon, but let's say that they do need to start working on certain weaknesses. Well, when you see some of your favorite lifters and they've just been squatting, they've been deadlifting, they've been benching, and you just keep seeing videos and videos of them continuing to do that and continuing to get stronger, it's hard for someone to think that I need to stop benching for now to get stronger at bench or I need to stop deadlifting to get stronger at deadlift. It seems like I just need to continue specify. specify. And uh, one of the things uh, a few years ago when, when I first heard about conjugate, when I'd hear certain people that were really prominent coaches talk about conjugate, they'd be like, how the fuck does this work? Cause you're not specific enough. Like it's totally getting rid of the specificity aspect. So why, why would somebody want to actually make that switch if they're actually going away from the movements that they need to do on the platform? That's a good question because there are some people that are anthropometrically built to constantly do those lifts. Mm. But I think if they were to run into Ed Cohen right now at nearly 60 years old and see that he can't wash his hair and his body's all banged up because he trained very specifically constantly, you might want to reconsider that. Because at the end of the day, performance, I know that most younger kids, all they care about is the number. But in reality, in my opinion, it's a balance of the number and the mileage. So if you, say, squat an all-time world record, but you need your knees replaced at 40 years old, you did not win. And that's the biggest thing I think people don't understand. But the specificity of the movement is not nearly, nearly as important as the specificity of your weakness. That's where the, the key comes in. So, for instance, the straight bar for me was fucking easy to squat with. Mm -hmm. It was like walking... Getting my shoe, well, not getting my shoes on. We talked about that earlier. Getting my sandals on. <laughs> yeah. Getting my sandals on in the morning. So there was very little room to develop anything new from that traditional movement. But the safety bar brought out everything. Because I have a taller torso and I'm six foot one. So to squat all time world records, I didn't ha necessarily have the leverage that the shorter guys like Lillibridge and them had. Mm -hmm. So the safety bar made it worse. And so I. When I saw technical breakdown with the safety bar, I knew that's what needed to be fixed with the straight bar. So my point is, is that although the lift may not be specific, let's say safety bar back squat and regular bar back squat, they may have some differences, but if one of them hits your weaknesses more, how is that not specific to your weaknesses? And that's where everybody gets screwed up. They specify based on the event versus what their body needs individually. That's my answer to that mm -hmm. is if, you're not mobile, but you keep hiding that, eventually it's going to call your trump card. Yeah. So you have to work your weaknesses whether you want to or not, because if you don't, it's either going to stagnate performance or it's going to cause injury. And those, those issues could come from anything. It could come from a muscle imbalance, a flexibility imbalance, like, you know, control or, you know, being able to um, <clears throat> balance the antagonist antagonist muscle groups. Mm -hmm. It could come all kinds of different ways, but you have to know where those limitations are and then be working on those areas. That's the real specificity that people need to be thinking about versus specificity of sport. Right. I mean, and that's why the Soviets again, and the Eastern Bloc countries made everybody a great athlete, then made them a good at one sport. Mm. Let's look at how many people go to the NFL or I'll say Ohio state. Cause they're five minutes from my gym. I remember sitting down and talking with Trestle for quite a quite a long time. I was I used to train Earl Bruce, and he was the head football coach from 1979 to 1989, right before Cooper. And he was in his early 80s when I trained him, and this was close to 10 years ago. He took me in to talk to Trestle, and Trestle goes, we don't look at anybody that's not a three-sport athlete. And I thought that was interesting, right? He, I go, why is that? He goes, because they have higher ability to get higher in the chain in football. If they're already good at this, this, and this, and then I specify them into football, they're going to get better by the time they're a junior or senior. But if all they've ever played is football, I only have what I recruited. I can't make them better because they're already too specific. So there's my answer to that fucking bullshit. Mm -hmm. And that's huge, though, because when it comes to, like, let's look at powerlifting. You have been doing it since you were 12, right? Yeah, I did my first bench meet at 13. That first match at 13. Now, when a lot of people like first meet the gym, they might be in their you know, late teens, early 20s. Sure. They get into bodybuilding, but they're like, ah, that's not fun. Then they go into powerlifting and maybe they didn't do many sports. Maybe the strength is their first thing. Well, they're just now attacking heavy barbells without the blend of all these other things that certain top level powerlifters right now were former athletes. Mm -hmm. Like they have former basis of really good movement, strength, mobility within sport. And then they go behind a bar and they're like, fuck, 
Just Boom. everything gets strong. Well, I'll tell you what was told to me. And when I was a kid, it was the ultimate heartbreak. But now that I'm older, I understand. Wade Russell played. He was my head strength coach at Ball State. and He was the guy that taught me everything I knew in college. He actually works for me now as an online coach, mm. which is cool as shit, right? Six foot six, 280, 46, 840 in 1981. Jesus. And when Damn. I came in, I thought I was a strong bencher. I was benching 500. We went in one day. He was already in his late 30s and was just dicking around with weights. He benched 405 for 10. <laughs> okay? So this dude's legit, right? Anyway, he goes, you know, you powerlifters crack me up. You guys think you're all hot shit. And I'm like, because well, we are. We're badass, right? I'm stronger than everybody on your football team. He goes, yeah, here at Ball State, but I'm going to tell you right now, mm -hmm. if the running backs in the NFL saw that there was $50 million to break a squat record, you guys would all die. <laughs> 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 and I started going, no, dude, they're not like us. We're fucking, you know. And then as I got older and watched, I'll give you an example. I trained Jay Richardson when he got drafted from the Raiders. So Jay Richardson was on the 2002 national team for Ohio State. He gets drafted by the Raiders in 03, comes to see me at Westside, in 04, so his first off season, I trained him for 15 weeks. I am not shitting you. His squat went from 535 to 715 weeks, and he's six foot six. And, oh. Dude, and I'm, I'm not making those numbers up. I saw it, and I'm like, Wade was right. Mm -hmm. Like, and could you imagine if he was Darren Sproles or somebody that short that had the leverages? Mm -hmm. You're thinking, fuck, dude. Like, these guys are next level. But that's where everybody screws up. They think, you know, and I, like I said, I get all the credit in the world to hack and some of these new lifters don't let these pro football guys come out and show you how it's done because if all they had to focus on was lifting weights we would all be in big trouble mm. i mean think about it you run like a bo jackson for example there's his rookie card right there a 41340 and didn't work out could you imagine if he squatted <laughs> done right <Yeah. laughs> and you said like you talked he said he didn't lift weights no. so he said that. he told that to me in person at the 2003 national conference when i was at the nsca i came up to him and i was you know i was already collegiate national record holder yeah. i'd already won a world as a teen so i look like i lift the weights i come up to him he's probably in his early 40s at the time and i go dude you look like you're still in really good shape man what have you been doing he goes man i haven't done anything physical in like 12 years and i walked away just going fuck you you know like this dude has this level of genetics like what and i i don't know like to me it's 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 tough but Here's the thing is that I love and, you know, I get I get drive and motivation from like anybody else from the superstars, Jordan, Bo Jackson, but replicating what they were able to do at a certain time is not smart. And mm. any high-level book tells you that. Like I try to tell people like the reason I got good is because I was patient and I was willing to learn every step along the way and I had no fucking timeline. I didn't care if it took me till I was 40 to break my first world record. If I started lifting when I was 12, I didn't break my first world record until I was 28. 16 years? Yeah. And I'm talking 16 years that I can guarantee you, even after contests, I didn't take more than two to three months off total in that 16 years. That's how much dedication it took me to reach that level. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I was just, boom, automatically I was crazy strong. But it's also why it lasted, because I slowly, progressively gave my body that resistance to adapt to Therefore, the ligaments, the tendons, the bones, and the muscles were prepared for that level of intensity versus punching a bunch of drugs and then getting strong in two years, and now your soft tissue is not ready, and now you're just a ticking time bomb. And that's what happens to average people that try to do above-average things. The impatience just gets them, like, too fast. And so as much as I like to use people for motivation, look at people that have done something for 10 or more years with minimal injuries, and they probably are going to know more than your idols. I think Stan was uh, around our age when he broke his first world record. You know, it, it took him many years. He was just bodybuilding. He did do a powerlifting meet. I think he did like a deadlift competition. He already did deadlift 800 pounds. I mean, he was already very strong. Um, he mm -hmm. competed actually here in Sacramento uh, at just like some local meet. That's kind of how I found out about him. And I was like... Who is this weird, like German looking dude making all these weird noises lifting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, making all these strange noises. So I, I uh, contacted him anyway. He started coming to super training. But even using him as an example, Stan trained with me. He did the conjugate stuff. Then he got excited by some other methods that he thought were going to be in his best interest. And he tried periodization and he immediately got hurt. Almost to the point where he thought he was done, he mm -hmm. thought it was over with. Yep. 
he came back and he did more West Side stuff. I mean, that's not proof that the system is uh, bulletproof. But bulletproof, but yeah, it it it, it does, was a good example. Well, it does make you raise an eyebrow. Yeah, right. You know, really, if anybody takes anything away from this, and I've said it a thousand times in the last ten years, it's not what you can do; it's what you can recover from. And if you look at Prolipin's chart. And you look at a lot of the periodization and stuff that Louie talked about and I talk about and you talk about, it's all about setting up for restoration. Training's great, but if you don't understand how long it takes for the body to restore itself to prep for the next cycle or the next training session, you got a big problem. So sometimes to go two steps forward, you got to take one step back. And a lot of people think everything's linear. And in reality, the body doesn't adapt the training in a linear fashion. It does it in waves. And you have to be able to ride the waves. And like I said, that starts with having a passion to train, not necessarily having a passion to excel. The excelling comes from the consistency. The passion comes from something completely different. I didn't keep training because I wanted to break records. I kept training because I had a training group. I liked to work out. I liked to push myself. And if that meant records, great. And if it didn't, I was okay with that too. What you got over there, Andrew? Uh, what you cooking up? I did want to go back to the uh, the, the um, like elbow pain when you're squatting. Yeah. You're like, okay, motherfucker, use a different bar. Like that makes a lot of sense. But my first thought is like, is that just like kind of putting a band aid on a more like significant problem that needs to be addressed? I really think that by me saying that, I think what I'm trying to get at is that stop with the specific mileage. So if I switch the bar and give my body seven days break on that joint and it feels better, it's telling you it's being overused. So what I find is that if your training automatically already builds in an educated rotation of movements, then what you're doing is allowing recovery at each particular mileage point. The straight bar has particular mileage to it with elbows, knees, back that need to be rotated in order for it to recover, Right. Um, you, you can apply that to any sport that you want, but there's reasons why you have to have off seasons, transitional mm -hmm. loads, different rep ranges, not only because one, the biggest reason most people quit training is because it gets fucking boring, but two, because it reduces the mileage at the joint while still allowing movement. Mm -hmm. So if I can squat, you know, I, and I will take this to my grave, but like you take somebody who squats with a straight bar every week, week in and week out for 10 years, and let's say they survive. The guy that trains with multiple bars and strategically puts that straight bar back in when it's needed will be stronger in 10 years mm -hmm. because they have all different types of strength, right? They're yeah. strong in all different areas where this person is only strong in one way. Athletically, if I bring a, a fireman in, for example, to the gym, and they're a proficient squatter with the safety bar, and they're a proficient squatter with the camber bar, and they're proficient free, and they're proficient with a box, and they're proficient narrow and wide— that person has way more transfer and way more athletic than a guy that's only practiced the same thing over and over and over again. That's all he's good at. Because as soon as that becomes not doable through, either through an injury or just because it gets heavy and the, the form breaks, they're not finishing it. Whereas the real reason I was able to take that 520 for 24 and not break form was because I was strong everywhere versus one spot. Yeah. Power Project family, I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. Now, Mark, Andrew, and myself have been cold plunging for a while now. We actually use the Cold Plunge XL. But the reason why this has become part of our daily routine every single day is because of, honestly, how good it makes us feel coming out of that water. Now, if you want to take a cold shower, that is beneficial, and you need to be doing that if you don't have a cold plunge. But if you do get a cold plunge that goes all the way down to 39 degrees, it's crazy because Andrew Huberman actually talked about the benefits of dopamine Post cold plunging. Now, cocaine gives you a 2.5 rise in your dopamine release. Cold plunging gives you that also, but it also gives you a sustained higher level of dopamine throughout your day. That's just one of the benefits, as there are many. So if you guys want to get on it, Andrew, how can they? Oh, yes. You guys got to head over to thecoldplunge.com and check out enter promo code POWERPROJECT to save $150 off. And before we drop off here, I do have to say that this has been the absolute best thing I have ever done for my mental health. Every single day I get in this cold plunge and I come out a happier, more positive, and more vibrant human. I can't recommend this enough. Again, thecoldplunge.com, promo code Power Project to save $150 off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. And using that uh, reference of, of the firefighters that you work with, I would imagine some of those guys, even though they're not squatting 500 pounds, 600 pounds, I would imagine that some of those guys that squat 315, that have a full schedule, that have a wife, they got other responsibilities, 
they're able to probably do a lot of other things in the gym with proficiency and even the things outside the gym, the demands that they're asked to do. So you end up with someone that maybe they're not the strongest when it comes to like the squat, but they have great overall strength, great overall athleticism. They probably feel really good day to day, right? Well, that's, that's the, that's the key is because here's the problem. With fire department stuff, especially, <clears throat> they might come in around 2021. 20, That's the say in their prime. Those dudes have to last until they're almost 60 now. They have to work 25, 30 years now to reach full retirement. Mm-hmm. They cannot have a stupid training program because guess what? They're going to be fried by the time they're 30 and they got 25 more years to work. Mm-hmm. That creates a completely different scenario than what's, say, in the military where the guys are in there from 19 to 24. And that's why you can't use military-style training unless it's special ops stuff where guys are there long-term. You can't utilize anything that they do because they're dealing with only people in their prime. And then once you can't do it, you just get out. Versus in the fire department, here's the difference. Let's say a guy gets injured because he trains like an idiot or he just doesn't train at all because he's lifting obese patients all the time. That person becomes a liability if they have to come out of the job at 30. They're paying for them for the rest of their lives through the union. Think about how much money that is to replace them, to train somebody else. So again, that's where the smarts come in. And that's where I started to realize, like, I'll give you an example. On average, one of the fire departments I've been at in Dublin for 15 years, when I got there, they could swing, on average, 130 guys could swing a 35-pound kettlebell for 40 seconds before they dropped. Hmm. Sounds terrible to us because we're all pretty good athletes. Yeah. But you watch it, and I'm like, oh, no, these guys have no work capacity at all. So building a strength program around no work capacity is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I did was all winning warm-ups for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Just winning warm-ups, four sets of 25, three exercises. Some of it involved kettlebell swinging. Some of it involved belt squats, right? I mean, we're doing big movements. We did that for about 18 months, and I went back. And the average time went from 48 seconds to four minutes. Mm-hmm. Now, this is guys from 21 to 55. I'm not talking fucking dudes that are 24. Yeah. The entire age spectrum. And I'm thinking, fuck, right now, I, I'm starting to understand that work capacity and GPP is the baseline of everything. Then I developed the strength program for the next two to three years. The average deadlift went from no bullshit, 185 to 400. Mm. From guys that were 19, <laughs> 20, all the way to 55. So I had dudes in their 50s pulling way over 400 easily, double overhand. Where we started, they were in the low twos if they were lucky. Yeah. And now, guess what? They don't get hurt lifting fat people and putting them in the ambulances and taking them to the hospital because three of those guys go do that job, and now three of them can deadlift 400. That's 1,200 pounds. Mm -hmm. When they got there, their max deadlift combined was 600 pounds. Mm -hmm. And now you got a 600-pound patient. You're at max. Yeah. Now you make one wrong move, and you're Mm -hmm. in deep shit. So what I started to realize was it, it, it started to reaffirm my thought processes, build work capacity, build mobility, then build strength and have a long-term thought process because they're there 30 years anyway. Yeah. I don't need to get them strong tomorrow. So I started to see what the timeline was. And the timeline to get better was 36 months. So when I go in for these interviews of these jobs, I said, if I'm not here for at least five years, I don't want your job. I don't care how much it pays. Because mm-hmm. I know that's how long it's going to take to fix everybody and get them better. You're dealing with different age groups. you got to get people to buy in because they're a union. That means they don't have to do shit that you tell them. So i got to attack some people and say, hey, I'm going to make you retire and be able to do anything you want to do. Okay, I'm in. I want to make you stronger, the athlete guys. I want to make you stronger so when you go on the job, you can do whatever you need to do. For some people, that's not a drive. They just want to come and collect a check. So how do you get that guy to want to work out when he doesn't even want to be there? Mm-hmm. So you start getting all these guys to buy in. Well, that's part of the five-year process too. But I started realizing about 36 to 48 months, everything changed around. And now we've went from spending, and this is this exact department I'm talking about, they were spending $600,000 a year in pay time off premiums, workman comp claims. 2018, they were under 100000 and the average age went up three years. So the average age when I started was 40, 41, and then it was 44. So it's not like they got rid of a bunch of old guys and a bunch of new guys came in, which would make it skewed. Mm-hmm. These guys, on average, stayed on the job. I mean, I think we had maybe only 5% of went in and new guys came in. Mm-hmm. So my point is the average age went up. We dropped their percentage of savings down almost a half a million dollars a year. 
And that's what started the process of all the other fire departments going, what the fuck are these guys doing? We need on this because we're spending too much money. It doesn't take very long with lower back problems and ACL repairs, strains, hernias, things like that to start adding up to a half a million dollars with 130 guys yeah. on an insurance premium, right? So that's when I started to realize with that population, how long it really does take to get better. So my timeline on everything increased even more. So that's really interesting. What else you got, Andrew? You got something else? TVAs. What did that stand for again? Transverse abdominis. Okay. I know, I know you talked about like like how to train that, but because like I've had lower back issues and I know um, whatever the fuck the core strength is, I know mine's always been weak. You know, like whether we're doing like leg extensions or some like random bodybuilding workout, my whole body just starts trembling. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I want to look into. Well, and the, the, your TVA embracing capacity in your core is mm -hmm. going to have to work harder the less built you are to do those things. So you're taller and thinner with a mm -hmm. longer torso. That means your core has to work percentages higher mm -hmm. versus guys like Ed Cohen where their torso is this tall. <laughs> well, make that strong too. And now their capacity to be strong is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So my point is, is TV, I've always seen, you can always find people, if they have a strong TVA, all the rest of the core muscles are strong. But if, if you don't have a strong TVA, and let's just say you have a six pack, that doesn't necessarily mean you can do anything. Mm -hmm. So TVA is one of those hidden muscle groups, I think, that really needs to be put into play. I know um, a lot of uh, – who who's the big back dot guy that's uh, – Stu McGill. McGill. Stu McGill. If you look at almost everything he does, it's TVA activation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's considered by most to be the godfather of all that shit. But we do tons of planks, side planks, things like that. I've even gotten to the point now – I have to find the video, but – I'm doing planks while my 320-pound partner is standing on me. Oh, snap. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, Rob plank. would just stand up and just stand on me, not for like a whole minute, mm -hmm. but like 10, 15 seconds. I don't need it any fucking longer. I'm a squatter. But people are like, what the fuck? I'm like, yeah, dude. So they put like 100, 200-pound dumbbells on me, and I was sit there. I might be shaking and like hurting, but I'm not moving. Yeah. So that is TVA. What are some of your favorite things to do for lower back uh, issues? Well, I mean, you know, I've always been a huge component of the reverse hyper, but 45 degree back extension is huge because it ties some, in the entire posterior let's chain. Let's uh, stop on the reverse hyper for a second. Some people end up getting some pain when they get on there and sometimes it bothers their stomach and stuff. Do you have any recommendations? Well, if it's hurting your stomach, your TVA is weak as garbage because the TVA is going to lock everything in and keep that pad and that weight from pushing on your stomach and making it shitty, right? So when I brace in on the reverse hyper, I don't notice it's pushing on me at all. But is that because my TVA is strong? In my opinion, yes. But I feel like if you have pain doing the reverse hyper, it's because you fucking need it. Now, here's the other factor. Should people maybe start with like no weight on there or something They should like start that? isolateral, one leg at a okay. time, because everybody has a left or right imbalance, mm -hmm. no matter how good you are. So if you keep it light and keep it tempoed where you're not – and that's the other thing I see people having pain with it. They're letting it swing too much. So if you go one, two, one, two, single-legged with just 25 pounds to start with, build up each leg separately, then combine it with bilateral reverse hyper, now you can turn on the juice. But I would say that would be a six-week six to 12-week process depending on how weak you are. Patience. Patience. Again, patience. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just gonna say that because, like, when when I do the reverse hyper, yeah, it does kind of bother the stomach, but I just it's just something I don't really mess with because uh, my back does like to kind of get aggravated on that. But also, like, I get like random really bad headaches when I get on there because I think I'm bracing too much because I'm feeling too your much. Your blood pressure goes way up. Yeah, so it's try crazy. it isolateral, super light, and okay. tempo, and tell me if it's the same problem. I bet it's not. I, yeah, I've never tried that, so yeah, I'll there give you it go. a go. Yeah. I'll fix that. I want to go back to actually the, um, the the volume thing you were mentioning because there's there's a few things that just correlate really well into that. First, we had Andre Milanichev on the yeah. podcast a while ago, and he mentioned that was every he drooling while he was on here because <laughs> when I talked to him, he just looked like he was spaced out, didn't know where the fuck he was. You remember that? We were 2014. Yeah. I squat the all time world record 832 take from Scott Weech, uh -huh. and Milanichev squats like a thousand in knee wraps, which nobody I don't think had done yet. Right. I, and I beat him on the bench, so I was like in the back in my mind. I'm like, fuck you, you know? Uh -huh. And then he ends up pulling something crazy too. But I go back to talk to him, and he just looks at me, and you can just see him like drooling out of his mouth. And like his eyes were glazed over. And I go over look at his coach, and I'm like, what's wrong with him? And I found out that before the meet, he fucking was already there warming up two hours before the squat session started. I'm like, what is wrong with this dude? Like he took 135 and sat down for 20 minutes. You remember this? Yeah. 
Then he took 225 for a couple reps and rested for 20 minutes. Then 315. So it took him like an hour and a half to get ready to squat. And I was like, that's not good. But Whoa. I remember talking to him, and I'm thinking, man, I think this guy's like, he's got problems. Like, he's mental. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he wasn't all there or something. Well, like, he had a lobotomy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like he was very concentrated on what he was doing. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, when he came onto the show, he mentioned how he, when, when he looks at somebody and he wants them to start getting stronger, he first is like, have you, how long have you been working with a good amount of training volume? And if you haven't, you need to be working with a good amount of training volume for maybe two years sure. before you start to try to get stronger. So there's that. But then there's also the aspect. So it matched what I was found out with the fire department. Exactly. And, and also, I was just thinking about the idea of the work capacity thing because when you see a lot of, individuals from sports like football, soccer, et cetera, where they're doing these sports where they're running around, running around, running around, and then they start lifting. It seems that like they, they just handle volume really well mm -hmm. and perform really well in those sports because their work capacity is here, even though they have been focusing on building muscle over the years. You're, so yeah. it's just, if you don't have that work capacity, you got to build that shit. Or, or, or it's only going to, it's going to limit your ceiling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, let's say, Stan Efferding's another one who was a former soccer player, but yeah, former soccer player, and then started off with extreme bodybuilding volumes, volume. then cut that back down to powerlifting volumes, and he became a fucking tank. Uh huh. So it, again, you're going to build the base whether you want to or not. You're either going to build it the wrong way by starting too specific, mm -hmm. and then you're going to create a bunch of injuries, and your limiting factor is going to be your capacity, or you're going to take the long road, build your capacity first, and then raise it up. But either way. It's going to either help or hurt your ability to make progress. Yeah. It depends on when do you want to pay for that. To me, I'd rather build the easy shit. I wouldn't say it's the easy shit. I, w I would build the stuff that is going to allow me to recover and allow my ligaments and tendons to play an integral part of not getting hurt when I'm doing crazy shit first, then train hard and not accumulate injury yeah. versus the other way around. Well, I'm going to, oh, I have to go back to all this now because I'm hurt all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a kick in the ass, and most people just quit. So in my opinion, like I said, it's all about long term. But I, I agree. I think 36, 24 to 36 months is a crucial point in developing athleticism. Then decide what you want to do. Yeah. Right? So and the Soviets figured that out years ago. They would start training the kids at four and five years old, not necessarily as an Olympic lifter, as a gymnast. They would – I mean, imagine if you wanted to bench, right? Let's say you wanted to be a bench presser and you knew it from the time you were four years old, which is not common. But let's just say you, you did. Mm-hmm. What, could you imagine if we had a kid walk into super training right now that was seven years old and it's been able to walk on his hands for the last year and a half, can brace with however long you want to put him on a plank, can drag a sled with his body weight for a half a mile and doesn't even break a sweat, and then you want to teach him how to get strong? Dude, give me that kid. Yeah. But that's what you have to develop first. You mm. have to have capacity, mobility, control then loading. Mm -hmm. But I think everybody wants to go to the loading first, and that causes the biggest problem. What's been some of your thought process behind uh, being a business owner? Um, because I know that sometimes that transition isn't easy for people, and maybe you never really thought of yourself that way. Sometimes people uh, will even have like limiting beliefs, like because you, you had uh, a lot of success when you were young, you said, with swimming. And then a lot of success with powerlifting. But sometimes when we branch off into something new or different, sometimes we're like, I don't know about this. How has that process been for you? And, uh, you, you know, you're making equipment, you're selling programs, you're driving a lot of people to your website, you got a YouTube channel, like yeah. you're, you're doing a lot of things. So how has that process been for you? It's, it's definitely different. I mean, the process changes as you grow because, well, as you will know, the more employees you have, it ain't about you anymore. It's about the group. So, you know, I got five, six media team guys, you know, I got people that help me like online coaches, you know, five of them guys. I mean, I got other people that depend on me to do a good job and help. And that starts to change the demographic of what you're focusing on because mm. I want to grow everybody in my crew. I don't, I don't, me will grow if they grow. And that, that becomes an issue because in powerlifting, it's a singular sport and you focus on you. But I learned through training with Louie and Chuck and them guys that we needed to be better as a unit. Mm. And that really changed everything, which I don't think I would have ever seen it at that capacity. Because, you know, when we were at Westside, you had me, Greg, Harrington, Vlad, uh, Chuck. So we had six, we had six or eight guys in one group that could all squat over a thousand. The average was a thousand thirty. 
everybody could bench six, 700 pounds. Everybody could pull 800 and everybody tried to get everybody better because if they got better, we got better. And the pressure was the group pressure. It wasn't just one person. And so I use, utilize that similar thought process in my business where what's the weak link? How do I make it better? And what happens? And sometimes the weak link shows in ways you don't know. So COVID happened in 20. I had all these fire contracts. Well, they didn't want any outsiders as an administration to come in. So I'm froze. I had just built my new house. And I'm thinking, shit, like, this is not good. Like, if they all freeze for an extended period of time, I'm not even sure I'm going to pay my mortgage. Because, you know, you go from making however much a month, you got your budgeting set, and you're like, okay, this is what I got coming in. Then all of a sudden, six, eight grand a month is gone. And so I'm starting to think, like, almost panicked a little bit. Like, I'm like, oh, fuck, the whole economy is going to change. So I started going, okay, well, I got all these manuals sitting in my bank on my computer that I've been playing with, writing my own training down, just getting notes here and there. And I never really just at first decided that they were going to be products. I just wanted to create timelines. So if I wanted to train, say, power building, or I wanted to go hypertrophy, or I wanted to go a transition cycle, I had them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, these are fucking manuals. So I started making manuals on them and putting everything down that I knew. And within like six months of that happening, the internet started to outsell what I was making in person. And I was like, shit, I should have done this five years ago. But you know, you you always wondered like, well, who wants to listen to what I have to say? You know, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there were quite a few people that wanted to know what I knew. So I started to do that. It started to change my business model, started to add more into the, the YouTube channel, started to add more into Instagram. And just started to realize that, okay, it's time to transition into being a longevity lifter that has some things to sell, but also trying to teach people to slow down and take, be patient and get better the right way. Um, so it doesn't with, sound like it'll sell well. No, <laughs> actually it's, it's, it can be difficult sometimes. So with that being said, you just have to be open to change. I think business is, is about change. You might have the market whipped for a minute and then I've, all of a sudden other people caught up or somebody else has a better idea. And then you have to, you always, you always got to be developing. So I'm, I usually spend most of my off day on Friday sitting around going, where's the weakness in the business? How do I make it better? Mm. And I seem to be, have made the right choices. But again, I think business is half strategic and half luck. You know, now I had to put all the work in. I already had a name before the business started. That helps tremendously. But at the end of the day, um, some of it's just being at the right place at the right time. I mean, you know, and I think the big issue with the exercise community is we're just sold on so much bullshit that sometimes it's a breath of fresh air for somebody to bring everything back down to square one and go, look, this is how you should do it. These are the references of where I got this from, and hopefully you'll listen, you know. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I my first love was welding and fabricating. Uh, my family used to build uh, gas tankers for marathons, so the big semis you see taking gas to the gas stations, mm -hmm. they used to build those. Wow. So I knew how to weld as a kid. And initially, um, I went to a pretty shitty high school that it, there was a lot of compounding factors. So my dad passes away right before I start my freshman year. I don't know how to deal with any of that. So it kind of radiated into school being a problem. Not, not that I was a problem student. I just had problem learning and just focusing. I was just kind of lost for a while. And I didn't know what that was. Yeah. But it, it was definitely that. And <clears throat> so I was put into a lot of vocational schools you know, like schooling, like shop classes and, well, math's just not college material. And at that time, they were probably right. So I'm like, well, fuck, I'm probably just going to be a welder. So I started setting my eyes towards iron worker, pipe fitters union, because I knew I could make big money. And if I wanted to travel, my ultimate goal, because I liked to swim, was I wanted to be an underwater welder on a fucking oil rig. Whoa. Six months a year, go out in the Pacific Ocean. Work Sounds on a, kind of amazing, but <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, yeah. There's there's some crazy stories on that. So the guy that taught me to weld at that level was a guy named Ted Stevens, and he welded on the Alaskan pipelines have, in the 70s. Have either one of you guys ever welded before? Nope. Uh, very, very little on the, it's, my like, track car, yeah. It's completely impossible. <laughs> it, like, when, if, you ever took, if you ever took just a handful of minutes to try it, you would not understand how anything exists. So that are like, bench, how the fuck... Do they make, yeah, how the fuck do they make that bench, so that, that squat rack? So that is so that, hard. How do so, they make it without it looking like complete dog shit? So the, shit? One, <laughs> the one black bench, when you guys walk in, the one farthest away on the left, Yeah, I built that one by hand, and then I built your guys' belt squat. They powder-coated it for me. So 
Again, I can't, I, I can't build nothing. I'm not fast <laughs> enough at it to make a ton of money. So what I do is anytime we make a new product, I go in and make the prototype. Then they have they have the ability to copy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that that's what I was going to do for a living. I wanted to go on like world in the Alaskan pipelines or be an oil rig underwater welder. The guys make fucking crazy money. And uh, some way or another, I ended up skating into school. Did really well and changed direction, but I learned those particular skills that 10 years later came into play big time. Yeah. Because here's the thing. I, I, I'm always a huge fan of it. you kind of skipped over a pretty important. Yeah. <laughs> like you went to like the university for, for, uh, for uh, yeah. what, what it was, kinesiology, right? Um, biomechanics. Biomechanics. So when That's I, a big school for that. That's like a he, well-known the, ball the state. The best one in the world at the time. Yeah. So, this, he just was like, oh, I okay. slipped into school. <laughs> well, I don't know how far you want to go into that story, but well, so I think it's important. That's we'll go all. into it. So the welding, the welding was going to be the the career. Mm-hmm. Eventually, I got out of it and decided I wanted to do something with sports performance. How that started was, <clears throat> I had just graduated high school, and I didn't have very good college grades, so I knew that it was going to be hard for me to get into college. Um, I go to visit my mom at the hospital. She's in charge of surgery, and. One of the ladies that she works with, her son's maybe five, seven years older than me. He's an accountant for the Colts. So he's walking, just happened to be walking in the hallway and saw my name in the paper because I had just won Worlds. Mm -hmm. He goes, dude, you're that fucking kid that was just on Channel 6, right? And it was funny because when they were talking, Anthony Calhoun, he still does the Colts games. He comes in to interview me at, at... at the Y and he's like, this is Matt winning. And I'm sitting there doing 225 <laughs> for like 50 reps as a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so he's like, uh, so I knew Anthony Calhoun, but he didn't have any real connections at the Colts at that time. He was just starting as a broadcaster, but this fucking kid was in the office and he goes, man, he, I go, well, I want to do something with weight training, but I was from this small town. The internet hadn't started really yet. I didn't know that there were strength coaches. Mm-hmm. I just thought personal training. I didn't know. He goes, well, you ought to come down and talk to the head strength coach of the Colts. Maybe he can give you some guidance. I'm like, they have a coach, strength coach. I'm like, fuck yeah. So, uh, about two weeks later, he has an opening. I go down, John Torine. I don't know if you know who he was, but mm-hmm. he was the head strength coach at Indianapolis from '97 to '14. You know how wow. crazy that is in the pros. Yeah, I mean, he was at the same team for that long. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Uh, multiple Super Bowls. Peyton Manning's like right hand dude. Long story short, he sits down and he goes. He goes, well, what do you want? What do you want to do? I said, I want your job. <laughs> he just starts <laughs> laughing, right? And he's like, well, I mean, I heard you're a pretty strong kid, but it's going to take a lot more than being strong to do this kind of job. You're going to need to get a degree and probably a master's. And I'm thinking kind of the wind out of my sails. I'm like, fuck, right? <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm cut for school because I sucked in high school. Mm-hmm. But my teachers were fucking terrible, to be honest. And I and I did, I was in a bad spot at that time. But when you want something so fucking bad, you're willing to cut your hand off to get it. Yeah. It's a different story. And when it's your own money, it's a different story. So he goes, where are you from? Because he didn't even know I was from the state. I go, what, from up in months? He goes, yeah, Ball State. I'm like thinking, yeah, fucking Ball State. It's like my home school because I had done no research. He goes, that is the number one school in the world for exercise science and biomechanics. Wow. I go, what? My, you mean the school that's five blocks from my house? <laughs> he goes, yeah, Dr. Kramer's there. All the founders from the NSCA are there. He goes, it's a fucking juggernaut. Dr. Costell was there, and they're doing studies on astronauts right now for anti-gravity. Because what you don't know is that when an astronaut goes into space for about 10 days, when they come back down, they're 50% weaker in 10 days. There's no gravity. Yeah. So it's like being bedridden for 10 days straight. No movement. So um, so I'm like, oh, shit, okay. So I'm working as an assistant welder at the hospital because I would work weekend hours, and a lot of those guys wanted to work Monday through Friday and have mm-hmm. weekends off for their kids. So Ted Stevens, the guy I was telling you that taught me how to weld, welded on the Alaskan pipelines. He was retired, but his wife worked at the hospital, so he just decided to work in maintenance so they could have lunches together and spend time together on their breaks. And so I'm there with this guy. He's fucking badass. He's already in his early 60s, can work me to death. Mm -hmm. But like with me, I mean, climbing up ladders, walking across pipes, welding in weird positions, dude was an animal. And he go, I go, yeah, I went and talked to John Torrey, but he's telling me I need to go to school and... I had no confidence because I had sucked so bad in high school. And he goes, well, go over to admissions and fucking tell him you want in. He didn't understand it either, but he's like, trust me when I tell you, you walk in there with confidence and bust the fucking door down, they're going to let you in. So I go in and talk with the guy. This is fucking crazy. Talk about stars aligning. So I go in to talk to admissions and I sit down and this guy looks super familiar. And Mm -hmm. he's like, 
He's like, you look really familiar. I said, yeah, I was just on the news for being a winning worlds and you know, whatever. And, and he goes, yeah, I work out the Y where you work out. I didn't even know it. Right. Wow, so this dude. fucking guy <laughs> had seen me for the last five years, mm-hmm. grinding my ass off in the gym. He knew I was serious. Uh-huh. He goes, your grades are fucking terrible. But he goes, <laughs> I might be able to sneak you in on, uh, like, um, what would you call it? Probation. But this means that you're going to have to get over a 3.0 GPA the first semester. They're going to kick you out permanently. There's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll fucking do it. I'll do it. And he goes, I can't promise you anything, but we're looking for a letter in two weeks. So I go back to work, and Ted goes, well, how the fuck did it go? And I said, well, I think they're going to let me in, but I got to wait two weeks. He goes, see, I told you. Just go in there and fucking act like you own the place, and they'll give you what you (laughs) want. Yeah. So two weeks later, I had uh, acceptance from probation, and then the first semester, I got a 3.8. Shit. So I'm in like Flynn. So mm-hmm. now I talk, I, got, I call Tori and I'm like, dude, I'm in school, you know, and he's fucking proud as shit of me. I've been trying to get a hold of him for a while because I want to really, he kind of pushed the button to get me to go to do that. And he lives in Jersey somewhere. So um, I tell Ted and I call, I call up Tori and Tori goes, you go to class, you get straight fucking A's and I want you to go straight down to Wade. He didn't know who the strength coach was, but I want you to go straight down to Wade and I want you to shove your head so far up his ass every hour you have off from school that you don't know what to do. I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to be in class. He goes, class is only this. He goes, Wade or the head strength coach at the time is going to teach you how to coach. He's going to teach you that being strong is only a portion of what makes you a good strength coach. And I could see Wade take 30 people and just like instruct them like fucking, you know, like crazy, like I mean, he's got these guys that are all the same size as him. Mm-hmm. I mean, at that time, we had the biggest offensive line in the NCAA. The average weight was three twenty five. Oh, <laughs> Aaron Aaron Johnson played <laughs> semi pro ball. We had a couple guys get big pro looks. Yeah, I mean, they were at small D one school, but they got some good recruits that year. Not played well as a team, but had individual guys that were just animals. Mm-hmm. And I watched, wait, all right, guys, we're going to blah, 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 do this. And I'm watching, mm-hmm. I'm going, dude, I don't know if I can talk to these guys like that. And he goes, you will in, you know, six or eight months, you'll get used to it, blah, blah, blah. And he was right. So he gave me the shit teams he didn't want to train at first. So I was working with men's and women's swimming and women's, like, softball and all these wow. fucking – but here's where I started to learn. I started to learn how to talk to all different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. All that Some of those people didn't want to be there at all. It was just part of the schooling, like, you know, part of the, yeah. you know, whatever. So I did that in three or four years, and then Wade got me in. The first year, I was an unpaid assistant as an undergrad. So now I did such a good job that they were actually paying me to be down there as going to school. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of an assistant strength coach as an undergrad. Well, all of that work and all those hours when I went and applied for grad school, shoe in. So Dr. Newton, Dr. Kramer got me into graduate school, and that was that. I mean, and then I was still welding a little bit and still keeping up on that. Um, And- it was amazing how all that stuff came together and became the business. But it just like, you know, people look back, oh man, I'd like to redo this part of my life or that. I honestly, there's nothing I could have done mm. better. I couldn't have rolled the dice better. I couldn't have been more confident in what I was trying to do. And I was nervous every step of that way. I mean, it was, it was I look back at it sometimes and it's almost like emotional because <clears throat> there's probably five or six different roads and avenues that I could have went the opposite way and it completely changed everything. And somehow I picked the right way, you know, whether it was training or it was going to school or this or that. I mean, I could have just been a shithead welder back home and I probably would have been good at it, Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have been what I'm at, what I do now. And it's just, I think confidence is one of those things that will lead you in places you never even thought, you know? So I know you're close to your grandmother. You you told us before about uh, riding around the country with her on the back of your motorcycle and stuff like that. What about your parents? Were you pretty close with your dad? You know, I know he passed when you were young, but were you pretty close with your dad? And is your mom, was your mom very involved in your life? My mom was involved, but in a weird way. She was always supportive no matter what I wanted to do. But she was more of a role model as far as work ethic. You know, she was in charge of surgery. She was the head cardiac nurse. So if somebody was having open heart surgery, she's handing the tools and half the time, she knew more than some of the doctors did on mm. what to do with this and that. Like, she could have been a doctor. Yeah. I always get on her real bad. I'm like, Mom, you're so fucking smart. Well, I, always, I just wanted to be a nurse. I didn't want to be a fucking doctor. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but if you would have been a fucking doctor, we'd be rich now. <laughs> you know, selfishly. But <laughs> I'm like, now I'm like, fuck, right? So anyway, um, but my dad, it was a weird situation. Um, my dad was a hard-ass Marine from Vietnam. 
and you didn't fuck around. Mm. I remember like on Saturdays, I'd get up, I'd go to swim practice. I'd get home about, we started swim practice at like sometimes 5.45, 6 o'clock. Mm. Could you imagine five, six years old? The pool was right <laughs> across the fucking street, private pool. My dad's like, you're going to the fucking swim team. <laughs> you know, because for him, it was like, you're get like, the fuck okay. out of the house. Yeah. Right? <laughs> get, the, get out of the house so I can probably bang my mom or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, most likely. Yeah, yeah, probably. So I would go to swim practice and get home, and it was two and a half hours of chores on Saturday after that. Clean your room pick everything up, do the dishes, finish the laundry. So I started that structure process, but I hated my dad for that because I watch all my other friends, they get up whatever they wanted on Saturday <laughs> and go do whatever they wanted. So it was it's odd to say, but when my dad passed, it was almost like a relief thing because he was so hard on me. Mm. And I remember um, him talking to my mom about it, and he's like, I just see too much of him and me. you know. Like, And it wasn't a good way at that time because I hadn't been doing anything super impressive. All of these things that you guys know me for didn't happen until after he died. So I'm just like this kid that's just rebellious. I run out in front of cars and get hit by fucking cars. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I mean, so, you know, and another thing is my dad was constantly stressed because my sister was born four years after me and, and her heart was backwards. Mm. So she's the oldest living person in the world that they know of. She goes to Duke for all of her shit. Her, her heart is turned backwards. So the pulmonary side pumps her body and the body side pumps her lungs. So she has lung hypertension and low blood pressure in her body. And most kids die before 13 with it because once they start to grow, mm -hmm. the heart can't keep up. So they did an experimental surgery when she was like seven or eight and she's still alive and she's 37. Oh, so now wow. Duke treats her for free. I mean, we're talking like she's had three open heart surgeries she has, if you saw her, like you knew something was wrong. Her color is just off. Mm -hmm. But her VO2 max is 14. That They can't understand why she's alive. But her body is basically adapted like she lives in the Himalayas. Yeah. Because mm. she was born that way, her body adapted to low oxygen. Oh. Yeah. But if, she, if that happened to you right now, you would die. Mm -hmm. But her body accommodated to it as a kid. So as she grew, now she's not going to have the lifespan that you or I have. So think about dealing with all of that. Then you got this kid with high energy that's a fucking rager. And now, you know, you come home, dad comes home from work and he's, it's just ass busting time. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? So I was like trying to get out of the house. I was actually, it was, it was kind of nice to go get hit by a car and stay in the hospital for a while. But wait, yeah. What happened when you got hit by that car? Like, cause yeah. you mentioned like, as far as injuries, it's, it's still, that's the, one of the only lingering things, but how the fuck that happened? So we were playing, so the pool, the private pool, you had to pay, I don't know, 400 bucks a year to be a member. And it was for the, the people that lived in the community or the, the neighborhood only. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have that in Sacramento, but we have some places stuff like, like that. that yeah. Private pools. And they'd swim against each other, the pools. So um, right across the street was a huge basketball court, you know, all, and it was like a private like training area. You had basketball, tennis, the swimming pool. And we mm -hmm. lived right across the street. So my buddy, Zach we are play this game called bike tag and we'd be on our bicycles and then we'd, you have to touch them or hit them with the tire, you know, like mm -hmm. bump them into the tire, touch them and then they're it. And they chase you. It sounds fun as fuck. So Zach chases, <laughs> I chase Zach right out it into is. the fucking street. And this lady's driving drunk 25. She's doing 15 to 25 and fucking nails me. So this leg on the right side is broken six places, shatters my pelvis and breaks my left leg in four rips Holy all my hair shit. out. I'm drug under the car. So there was a blood stain from my head, which is probably why I'm half retarded. There's a, blood, <laughs> there's a blood stain. There was a blood stain on that concrete until they redid it for 15 fucking years with gouge marks that deep from my bike going into the pavement. And so, Jeez. yeah, I got fucking nailed. But the only thing I remember is I woke up in the ambulance and they had their compression pants on me so my legs wouldn't move anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, if you saw my right calf, you'd see a huge scar where the bone came out of my leg. Mm -hmm. So it not only snapped, they came out of my leg and compounded. Well, they put me in these, pat in these pants so I couldn't move and it was August. It was hotter than fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember waking up and my legs were so fucking hot. I couldn't feel anything and I could see the lights in the ambulance and they ended up just like knocking me right back out. So I get to the hospital. Who's working in surgery? My fucking mom. Oh my God. So oh. there's a young kid hitting Haltman Village coming in for multiple leg fractures. They don't even know what else. And my mom's in charge of surgery. She's in the surgical room while I'm getting my legs fixed. Could you fucking imagine? That's your kid on the table getting all that shit done. So I had to go through three leg surgeries. My pelvis was broken like six places. I, I mean, to be able to do the shit that I've done is just yeah. fucking mm -hmm. insane. 
But I started to realize that I was um, my right leg is nine millimeters shorter than my left, so I have to wear a special heel lift inside the shoe that lifts my leg up to match it perfect. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that until I could squat 800. I started getting my back back pain, mm -hmm. and I'm like, what the fuck? And I was telling mom, I was like, why is my back hurt when I squat? She's like, you squat 800, you fucking dumbass. Because <laughs> she'd never seen anything like that. Yeah. You know, she's from a little town or whatever, not really into sports. And I said, no, it feels like something's off. Like, it's just weird. But I didn't notice it at all until I got up to close to 800. So they go in and they do a bone link discrepancy test on me, which is like a full body MRI. Mm -hmm. And they measure it, and my shin bone from the, my knee to my ankle was nine millimeters shorter. So they built me a special heel lift, and within, I'd say, a year and a half, squatted 865, a IPF, mm. and no back pain. Wow. And I was like, fuck, right? So talk about learning balance quickly. Uh -huh. I had a structural imbalance from a car accident. So that's when I started realizing that it was so important to balance the left and right side and started studying a bunch of from Poliquin at the time. But um, that's the shit that we were dealing with in the family, and that's why my dad and I— we didn't get along really well. I actually went and lived with my my great grandma uh, when I was in cast because they didn't want my brother and sister to be around me and actually hit my leg mm -hmm. or refracture it. So, um, but my great grandma was a huge drive for me. She, uh, you know, she never really had a ton of money, um, but she had a hellacious work ethic and she was so driven to be somebody that by the time she finished raising my my grandmother, she went back and got a nursing degree after at 40 years old wow. because she wanted to do it so bad. And that's where my mom got the drive to be a nurse from my, her grandmother, my great grandma. And she, she lived until I was almost 22, but I'd go over there and help her with anything I could. And we had a lot of fun that year, even though I was in a hospital bed and I couldn't move. Yeah. She, um, she taught me a lot because she was that old school style, like, I'll give you a funny story. This is fucking hilarious. So is this uh, all in Ohio. This, no, this is Indiana. Remember, I'm from oh right. I'm from Muncie, so Ball State. So um, this is a funny story, kind of not really embarrassing, but odd. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this hospital bed, and I tell mom, like, Mom, I don't want to like pee in front of my great grandma, mm -hmm. right? You know, because I can't move. Yeah. And she's like, Oh, it'll be okay. She's a nurse, you know. But it's still your fucking great grandma. It's weird, you know. Mm -hmm. She's 75. You're six. You got to get your dick out. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so you know, I have one of those like those bed urinal things. Like yeah. it looks like a cup with a big hole in it. And I, I told my grandma, I was like, Grandma, I don't, I think that thing's too big. Like, you know, because I'm thinking my dick's supposed to fit in this monster hole. And she, <laughs> and she goes, Don't worry, they're all small. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make me feel comfortable. And I'm just like, Oh my God, this is so fucking embarrassing. <laughs> Made you it know, 10 times like, worse. Because I'm six years old and I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking this thing's the wrong size. <laughs> and she's like, You know, oh. I remember her just going, They're all small like that. <laughs> That's fucking And hilarious. I was like, Oh my God, that was pretty funny funny dude have you ever gotten your um a dexa scan to see your bone density because with all oh, the years of powerlifting dude. what is your bone density so yeah i did so serrano wanted me to go and get one done because he wanted to see what it was too so an average man's bone density is like 1.1 1 .1, yeah. 1.12 mine's 3.96 so I'm, okay. my bones are three and a half times stronger than a normal man's interesting yeah. okay damn but it's funny uh when they did that test they came back and go uh they go, what happened to you as a kid? Yeah. And I said, well, I was in a car accident, broke my legs. Where my bones restructured themselves was unknown material to the DEXA. Mm. Didn't know it was bone anymore. It was blue. <laughs> so I had blue all over my bones, yeah. around my legs. Like almost looked like a fucking exoskeleton from yeah. Wolverine. Well, that's some freak shit, man. They were like, it would take, they, they told me it would take three times the pressure to break my shin bone in that area than it would a normal mm -hmm. bone. Like, he's like, it would hurt like fuck, but you could probably take a baseball bat to your leg, Jesus. like, at full speed. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I'm like, I don't want to try that. He goes, but, he goes, I have never seen. It's like seen that Adam Sandler scene where they drive that, uh, yeah. the, that hot poker into his foot. Um, yeah. yeah, the docs were like, we have never seen that density of material in a, in a, in a DEXA scan unless it was metal, like yeah. stainless steel rods That's or something. Crazy. And my oh, bones had structured themselves. And even down in my like, lumbar, my uh -huh. discs, or my, uh, my vertebrae, we all have blue around the discs for unknown material. Then you also had an injury, your pelvis. Pelvis was broke, yeah. And that's why I had to learn how to get be a great dead, uh, a good deadlifter for a three lift guy. I had to learn to be a good deadlifter in a roundabout way. I couldn't just pull all the time deadlifts because it agitated that fucking injury really bad. So I did a lot of good morning or a lot of uh, 45 degree back extensions, reverse hypers, and then I would pull every two or three weeks because that's all my body would let me do. Mm -hmm. And Ended up pulling over 800, you know, 
doing it a roundabout way. Again, not attacking things specifically. So the injury taught me to not specifically attack the area. Because mm. if I would have went at it like a normal guy would, yeah. now I would have fucking never made it. Mm-hmm. Because my body was not going to let me train that way, no matter what I wanted to do. Yeah, uh, Switching gears a little bit. Um, there's a lot of information, you know, swirling around on the internet and people are getting sometimes really helpful and great information. Sometimes it's motivating people, uh, to move and stuff, but we've talked a little bit about it briefly and I'd love to get your thoughts on, um, you and I learned how to box squat and Louie taught a lot about like sitting back on the box and not specifically driving the knees forward. Mm -hmm. And now you're seeing more people talking about driving the knees forward. Some of powerlifting as we knew it changed because they got rid of the gear people started to squat a little lower and when you squat a little bit lower your knees tend to want to pitch forward a bit uh we had ben patrick on the show he's a friend of ours uh we've talked a lot about like the knees over toes type of stuff what are some things that you might think are maybe a little bit off about some of that message and what are just your kind of thoughts in general about um, you know, box squatting versus yeah. like specifically trying to drive the knees forward. So the so. initial box squat wasn't a technical thing from Louie. What it was, was it separated the eccentric and concentric chain of the movement. So it's like, go bench press. Like if you're listening to this right now, just pause, go over to the bench press and bench press 135, touch and go, and then 135 with a two second pause and tell me which one's easier or harder. That was the whole point. Mm -hmm. The point was the box separated the downward phase from the upward phase, which taught you, one, how to stay tight, but two, it also started to change your form a little bit, teaches you about lateral pressure. So when Louie would have you sit on the box, you might loosen up the vertical pressure, but the lateral pressure stays 100%, right? And so it teaches you where to stay tight. Um, With that being said, if you look at all the – and not all the squatters, but most of the great all-time greats. So we could talk about Hack and some of these other guys. I think to be an all-time great, they're going to need to be around quite a bit longer. Mm-hmm. But if we look at, say, Don Reinholdt, we look at um, – who was the first guy to squat a 1,000? I can't remember what his name was. Uh, it's it's – uh, I haven't talked about him in a while. There was uh, Dr. Squat. Um, well, Dr. Squat, but bef- I think it was before – David Waddington. Oh, yeah. Dave Waddington. If you look at Dave Waddington, Ed Cohen, Mike Bridges – so I'm trying to cover all these weight classes, and um, Don Reinholdt, you start realizing that they don't squat with their shins coming forward, and that's where Louie initially got that idea for technique. And at least for as far as I remember him talking to me about it at training and breakfast. So I started modeling my squat mostly off of Chuck because I knew Chuck was modeling it off of what Louie was telling him from Bridges and Cohen and all them guys. So if you go back and watch those dudes squat – you start seeing their shins are very vertical. Mm. And the the thought process for it is to utilize more posterior chain to squat. So when people see like my, I'll give you an example. You see the 520 for 24 and people are like, well, that's not as deep as, say, Tom Platts did his. Yeah. Well, are you measuring how far his shins go forward or how deep his actual hips are? Because if you look at it that way, it's pretty damn close. Because if your knees go forward in Louie's thought process and really mine, it's wasted energy. Mm -hmm. Because as you go forward, you're not going deeper in the hip. So what you start to realize is that forward, in some ways, can be a waste of energy. Like a sissy squat. You can keep driving your knees forward and you never come close to breaking parallel. Exactly. So what's the point of squatting is in competition, you break parallel. Now, whether it's by this much or that much, Mm -hmm. it's still still good or bad. It doesn't matter. So here's the thing. Um, My thought process on the knees going over the toes is that it is a it is an exercise that should be done on occasion but in my opinion if we look at where people's muscle imbalances are most of the time they're anteriorly strong or at least dominant and they're posteriorly weak when i let my knee go over my toe i'm basically focusing on all quad and if it's all quad it's a lot of lower back well if i sit back and push my knees out Now my hamstrings, my glutes, my lower back, and my quads all work together in one synchronous unit. That should be mastered first before you go knees over toes. The reason that most people, when they squat vertical shank, they think it looks higher than than letting the shins travel forward is because it's the most efficient way to break parallel. Mm. If I sit back and push out, then it looks almost like it's high, but it's not because there's no wasted energy. If you ever watch Chuck Vogelpool squat, it's like fucking magic. Yeah, when you squat, one of the objectives, to, especially in powerlifting, because you mentioned you're just trying to get your hip lower yeah. than your knee, 
one of the objectives is to not move your knees any lower. And sometimes that's the first thing that people do. Mm -hmm. They're moving the uh, object that they're supposed to dip down below parallel uh, down by by yep. jamming the knees forward with the first part of that movement. So you really want to sit back yep. so that knee stays nice and high. In reality, how far you sit back is how far you push out. So if I push my knees out as hard as I can, my body sits back automatically because it doesn't want to go forward. Yeah. But the big thing is, is what's the number one thing that most coaches back in the day and doctors told you was bad squatting? Your knees. It's going to kill your knees. Mm -hmm. Well, not if you squat with all the pressure everywhere. The problem is when you let the knee travel way too far over the toe, it puts too much shear force at one particular area, therefore causing an issue. And then people will go like, well, why would you Why would you do that? And I was like, well, Olympic lifting is different because they need to catch the bar. So this is Chuck probably squatting somewhere around 1150 at 242. And this is a wide-ass squat. And that's super wide, but look at his shins. <laughs> Jesus <Yeah>. Christ. <laughs> that's his, his shins stay totally straight. Now, the thing of it is, if you were to watch, say, like a Tom Platts with his knees go way over his toes, it's not any deeper at the hip. It's just wasted mo motion forward. So it's, it's difficult because everybody has their opinion on it. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you know, here's the thing. I, I think it's interesting. And like I said, I think there's a lot of things that Patrick and a lot of those guys have to offer that I think some people need to listen to. But in reality, here's my thing. And maybe I'm biased because I've trained hard for a lot of years. But if it was so good at developing anything, why does Ben Patrick have no leg size? Actually, in person, he's got he, pretty good legs. He has pretty in. solid yeah. legs. See, every time I've seen him, I on video. Well, he's a thin. Look, he's a kind of a thin shaped yeah. guy, but he ha his legs are pretty jacked. So for, here's my thing: is yeah. my legs got to be thirty one and a half inches around with multiple leg fractures, and I was bedridden mm -hmm. for fucking two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That to me shows I didn't have a knee problem. My joint didn't hurt. I was fucking broke. Yeah, and I got my legs to grow that big. So I'm starting to wonder, like, if my knee was to go way over my toe. How did I get all that quadricep development mm. from not doing that? So my my thought process is why not use a squat particular technique that develops everything, mm -hmm. not just one area. So I think there are some things that he talks about. And like I said, I'm not a guru of his information, but I know he does talk a lot about glute ham raises. Yeah, yeah he does talk a lot chain. about hamstrings and balancing it out. Yeah. Here's my yeah. thing. It's transfer. So here's my deal. You put me in heel shoes, ultra narrow, and you watch how much I can fucking squat. They'll still squat a lot. Yeah, I just did 600 for 10, like fucking probably six mm. months ago. Mm -hmm. And then put me back <laughs> in my position and see what I can squat. My point is, is that to me, teaching those positions only makes you good. Again, we go back to the beginning. Only makes you good in one way. If I were to take Ben Patrick and show him how to squat my way, he wouldn't be any good at it. I go his way. I could still squat a shitload. Mm. I think he'd be kind of surprised though. Maybe. Because th there's 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 two things. Um he covers a lot of ground with his training. So yeah. you know, the the Instagram posts are only what we Some can we see. see yeah. But he he does cover a lot of ground in his training. Yeah. yeah. Um he's oddly enough, when it comes to the the knees over toes stuff, right? Um, it I don't think you'd argue that it it is it's not not beneficial to be able to develop some comfort within that position. It can't, it shouldn't be maybe the whole the way primary. you squat, the primary yep. way you squat, especially if you're a power lifter. If you're a power lifter, you'd probably want to develop a way of squatting that would allow you to move the Maximum most weight, weight possible. Mm -hmm. And squatting in that fashion probably is not going to, the way that Ben does, probably is not going to allow you to do that. Uh, but a power lifter who does squat in that fashion, developing some of that, like let's say in an outside training block when they're not working the specific squats, yeah. it's probably a, probably a decent idea. But the other thing, I think like, you know, Mark mentioned he does work like GHRs and hamstrings and, and that type of stuff a lot. When he came in here, it's not a crazy amount of weight, especially when thinking of a powerlifter, but he came in, he deadlifted. 465. With, deadlift, I think it was 475. Yeah, yeah. And it was super, It's he's never done that before, by the way. It's not like he deadlifts, but he easily deadlifted 475. Trap bar deadlift. Trap yep. bar deadlift. And it was pretty ha gluten hamstring dominant. So- I, th I I get what you're saying. You know, yeah. if someone goes too far down that rabbit hole and only just hammers yeah. that. It's the same. I think it's a similar thing to the powerlifter who yeah. just stays low bar squatting their yeah. whole training cycle year after year after year. My point is, is like if you put me in Patrick's position mm -hmm. within reason, I'll excel at it. Oh yeah. Put me in the other position, I'll break a world record. I think it's it's being able to have transition. But what I see on the internet, and like I said, I don't study it a ton. Mm -hmm is that it's the same positioning he's showing over and over. That's what I see, and that's mm -hmm. where I have an issue. I say, if you squat like this, say, once every six or eight weeks, mm -hmm. I'm down. 
I think it's a great idea. But utilizing the exact same position all the time or saying that that alleviates certain issues, it, to me, is a little off. Like, I think that, you know, really squatting is going to be dependent on a few things. It's going to be dependent on how you're built. Mm -hmm. It's going to be dependent on where your muscle weaknesses are and how much you're attacking your weaknesses. And then, like I said, you know, you need to last a long time before you start doing advice. Meaning I would not be standing here talking to you about squats and my positioning on it unless I lasted through fucking four world records and I don't have any knee problems and I'm 43. Yeah. That's when you start going, well, uh, see, and that's when I start sitting back going, okay, well, last another 10 years and then tell me you have the same thought process. Because my thought process has come from many, many years of grinding mm -hmm. for at, at the highest level that I could possibly obtain. And I try to tell people, I'm like, look, it's all about, again, you can have a great idea, but that idea changes over time as you evolve. So how I think about things now isn't all the same as what it was 10 years ago, but it's a lot of it solidifies where I've been and what I've done and who I have fixed. So seeing guys like, uh, you know, like my 350 firemen that I train and watching them get stronger and then watch their injury rates go down. But I don't see anybody making that famous. And that's mm -hmm. guys between 20 years old and 60. Yeah. And they have no injuries and we're saving them a half a million dollars per department. Like that's where I would think the average person would go. I want to fucking listen to this dude. Mm -hmm. But it's just not the case because it's not sexy or new or whatever. And this is the other big thing. If you look at how Ben Patrick talks about squats, it's very similar to 20 years ago what Charles Poliquin was saying. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. He, Charles he pa references Poliquin a lot. He does. But I'll tell you this. I was Poliquin the last five, six years he was alive. And after he went and did seminars with me and Eddie, he changed his mind. Oh, in what way? Vertical shank. So, so what did he say about it? Was he talking about like this is the – way people like what did he mention about so it? what he started to say was oh, i'll give you i'll give you the prime day we were in his close to his hometown i was doing a seminar in colorado springs after we went to amsterdam and prague and shot seminars and me and eddie were showing paul Cohn was showing his olympic style squat and me and eddie were showing ours mm -hmm. we get to colorado springs to do the last seminar and i'm i'm squatting and eddie's fucking around with squatting because he's already older at that time and I do something like 600 for 10 vertical shank, just a belt. We take, Charles gets smashed with 275 with his knees over his toes. And he's like, man, I can't figure it out. I was like, dude, you're not using any hamstrings to squat. You're not using a fucking bit of your posterior chain. So me and Eddie showed him how to do some vertical shank squatting. He went back home. And about four or five months later, he called me. And he goes, I went back to squatting the way that I used to squat he goes, my squat just went up 75 fucking pounds. Mm -hmm. He goes, I completely changed my thought process on it. And that was partially, though, because he started working the posterior chain, squatting vertical shin, right? Right. And But this is, see, this is where I think maybe there might be, um, I don't know, misunderstanding of mm -hmm. maybe what some of Ben is doing, because visually you see the knee over toe, knee over toe, knee over toe. Right. But in between those posts and when you go into like what he actually does with his right. programming, there's so there's a lot of posterior chain. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of hamstring. There's a lot of glute. There's there's yeah. Nordics. There's a, there's a bunch of things that really dive into that posterior chain. Sure. Where it, let's say that that thing that might be a weak link of continuing to hammer that knee over toe is equalized, counterbalanced, counterbalanced by working that. Yeah, posterior he's all chain. about like hip flexor and well, shin I, yeah. and all those. And with all things. that stuff, I agree. Like yeah, I said, yeah. the transferability is put him in six different squats and see how he responds. Yeah. If he's not very good at three or four of them, then the, then my opinion is don't train that way. Mm -hmm. But again, if you can put it, somebody that trains in multiple fashions and ways, like I said, I don't think knees over toes is a bad idea occasionally. Mm -hmm. Just like I think box squats are good occasionally, but we've all seen it. Guys that only box squat have a problem. They go to a meet, they bomb fucking out because mm -hmm. they're not comfortable yeah. getting in the hole, but it doesn't mean the box squat's bad. It meant that it was overused for that particular person at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes, what do you need at that time? And where I have a problem is I've never seen an athlete that had weak quads. I've seen athletes have weak fucking hamstrings. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. although he has everything right with the accessories, why squat in a dominant way that makes those muscle groups even yeah. more dominant? That's my problem with yeah. it. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Like, like you may, you may not even need knees over toes if you know how to squat right. in the fashion that you're talking Utilize about. Utilize every type of squat position that you can to develop a full yeah. range of motion, to develop strength in all different capacities. 
I've but, never had any knee injuries in, in any of no. my lifting. Uh, my right knee has like a little bit of like tendonitis um, and that developed years ago, like forever ago when I was in high school, playing, sure. just playing basketball. Sure. And it just was something that would always uh, come back. But um, yeah. I didn't really necessarily have to uh, do anything to fix some of that. But yeah. when Ben came around and started talking about the backward sled drag and all that kind of stuff, I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I think I can still make my knee a little stronger. So yeah. I practiced a lot of what you're saying is like go upstream and downstream of the injury. Ben was talking about the shins and all that stuff. So I, not only do I stretch the shins a bit, um, but I also uh, dig into them with some myofascial mm -hmm. release. I train them. I train some of the muscles around the knee and I don't have, I have zero pain in the knee at the moment. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. It's been really, yeah, like helpful. I said, some, for some things for a second. I, I got to switch this hard drive really fast. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Pop Project Fam, this episode is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. We've been wearing these shoes for almost a year now. They're flexible. They have a wide toe box. They allow your feet to get connected to the ground and they will make your feet stronger and they don't look like shit like a lot of these <laughs> other barefoot shoes. Andrew, how can they get them? For the best barefoot shoes on the planet and they also look really, really good, <laughs> head over to vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject at checkout. Enter promo code powerproject20 to save 20% off. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject, promo code powerproject. Power Project 20 to save 20% off. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's go ahead and get back to this podcast. My bad. Go ahead, guys. It's cool. So, yeah, I think the thing of it is, is there's probably things that you can pick up from him or me and then hybrid it into what you need at that time. Mm -hmm. Everything that I'm saying is probably not 100% for everybody right now. Same thing applies with Ben's stuff. So you just have to figure out what you need at what time, where's your weaknesses. And that's what I'm okay with. But what I find is that I've never ran into a fireman or a special ops guy or any of the people that I work with and go, dude, your fucking quads are weak. Yeah, It's always something in the posterior chain. So I, in my opinion, I would look at Ben Patrick's stuff and I would focus more on what he's talking about for accessories. Mm -hmm. The squatting type stuff, I look at it and I go, I would never try to bend that way unless it was just every once in a while to train a different range of motion. That's just my opinion on the thing. Makes sense. Yeah, I dig it. Um, I was gonna, I don't know if we already touched on this, but I was really curious when we were in the gym, you mentioned that training now, like you think like 20 years ago or 25 years ago, we were ahead as far as like, I guess maybe what's being applied in terms of strength yeah. or what's actually being done in terms of strength and right now. And I found that to be a really interesting statement because in my head, I was like, but how, like there's so much, there is so much information mm -hmm. being spread now. And so many people are, are popularizing new things, but we were ahead maybe 25 years ago. So I was curious what you were thinking when you were saying mm. that. Well, there's, there's some different aspects to that particular topic. So, and maybe it was my timeline in general, when I was learning what I was learning, but Poliquin gone, mm -hmm. Kramer's retired. You look at guys that were doing a lot of the big strength research from say 88 to 2006. A lot of those dudes are retired or they're dead. And what you found is that I think it tied in a little bit to when we were flying astronauts into space. So I'll tell you this. When I was in graduate school, we were studying anti-gravity and retention of muscle mass. So NASA was funding a lot of strength research at my college. Oh, okay. But spe like specifically for that or is funding? Well, just in all. general. So let's Shit. say I get, let's say I get a $2 million grant and they want to study muscle retention and strength. Mm -hmm. Well, that could be in a lot of different things. And I think what I, what I'm, kind of upset with with the NFL, the NBA, and other strength-related sports. When's the last time you heard the NBA give $20 million to colleges to study more power and strength? <laughs> they don't. They should, though. Because here's the thing is, like, how do we know what strength coaches are doing is actually perfect? We really don't. Yeah. Like, everything, and I'm, and I'm even talking about myself, everything that we have is a hypothesis and an idea. It's not a belief. We don't know for sure what does what? I mean, we have ideas and some of those ideas I feel are right, mm -hmm. but they're still, they're still methodologies. They're not, they're not set in stone. And that's why I see, we see so much change, but I think we were on the right path to finding actually what was working and what we were doing mm -hmm. a, a while back, mostly because I think more funding was there. The other fact of the matter is, is think about how many professors, like, let's go back to the founders of the NSCA. Dr. Kramer, Dr. Volick, Dr. Pearson, a lot of the guys that were my professors back in the day, yeah. they had an immense passion to understand strength and performance. 
You go to a college now, an average college now for strength and conditioning or exercise science or kinesiology, mm -hmm. those fucking professors never did anything. They're there because they had their PhD and they did a little bit of a research project and now they're a teacher. Yeah. There's no money in it. So the point is, is like teachers don't have the same level. Like I remember Kramer being one of the first professors to talk about strength training and he could bench press over 400 pounds. Dr. Squat, that, that's another big one that I, I totally missed. Hatfield. Fred Hatfield, 1,000-pound squatter in the early 80s and was a doctorate. Damn. Okay? I didn't know that. <laughs> Talk about, I mean, uh, and I'm Squatted not, over 1,000 pounds. He weighed I'm, like 260 or something. Yeah, 242. And I'm not an asshole, <laughs> but he, he <laughs> is Louis Simmons times 10. If you really think about it, he was one of the best squatters to ever live mm -hmm. and had his PhD. And he was putting out compensatory acceleration papers in the early 80s, get faster to get stronger. What the fuck? Yeah. I mean, people get bitched at for talking about speed work now to get stronger. Am I mm -hmm. right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. And, he, and Fred Hatfield was talking about kinetic energy and compensatory acceleration and all these physics properties to get better back when nobody was talking about any of that. Mm -hmm. He's dead and gone. So my point is, is all those guys that set the path for the scientific research for strength, they've either lost steam, they don't have the funding, or they're gone. And so now I don't think that there's a lot of professors and researchers stepping up because I'll give you an example. Back at Ball State, we were studying there all he is. there he is, fucking badass. Look at this. Let's see his shins. Oh, damn, his shins. <laughs> Vertical <laughs> shin. Really? That's weird. That's interesting. Yeah, his knees didn't move at all. <laughs> no, that's weird. His, his knees didn't move. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> but hey, what the fuck do I know? So <laughs> God damn, so, he was thick, man. Yeah, he was only five foot four. Oh, oh, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I met him a couple of times in person before he died, and he was uh, he was he was awesome, dude. Man, he was so humble and, and so nice. And that's not a squat suit. That was just a singlet, right? No, that, that was a, a Z suit. suit. Oh, yeah. Z okay. Yeah, but it's okay. like about four times stronger than a singlet, so it's not really a squat suit. I mean, you got to remember that's the early '80s, the fabric technique. But I'll tell you what, they were using some really fucking gnarly knee wraps back then. Okay. For sure. Um, not to say that the technology today isn't better, but don't get twisted that some of that shit was fucking serious right. because I remember Eddie talking to me about shit they do under the knee wraps and there was guys that were taking like, God, what did he tell me? It was something stupid. I don't want to say it because it's not my podcast, but it was like fucking tennis balls behind your knee so that they would actually drown. Like you bounce. heard of that? Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. I remember mm -hmm. Ed, or, uh, what's his name? Uh, Louis used to talk about it all mm -hmm. the time back in the day. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying they did that at the world-class yeah, yeah. meets, but my point is, is they were trying shit, you know? So, <laughs> whatever you can get away with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They weren't stuffing e-wraps under their bench shirts or anything, but they were they were doing some wicked shit. So, yeah, that was always a weird one. Yeah, that was fucked up. So, um, long story <laughs> short is Hatfield, Louis, Paula Quinn, Kramer, all these guys are gone, and that was their real passion. It was not a money driver. Mm -hmm. It was, that's what they wanted to understand. You tell me the researchers right now that are doing that kind of shit. Exactly. I wouldn't know. Andy Fry is one of them. There's a couple of guys, but they don't I have Galpin and uh, who else? Galpin and yeah, some other people who are doing like doing some work with that type of stuff. Yeah, but, but not as much as it was. Yeah. And it's, and and show me the last time Galpin had a had a research article posted in Muscle and Finish or things that people mm -hmm. actually fucking read. Mm -hmm. <gasps> right. See, that's the other problem too. Is like when Fred Hatfield talked back in the day, people fucking listened. Mm-hmm. Because he was a big squatter. He had his doctorate. You know, I mean, back in the 90s when Louis wrote an article in PLSA, how many times did we sit and wait for that next article because we wanted to understand something new? Yeah. Now, nobody gives a shit. If I'm not strong in a year and I and I don't get strong doing an easy linear periodization model to easy to understand, mm. I don't want to fucking talk about it. That's the problem with today. <laughs> they don't want to be smarter at To me, it's just as much of a cognitive progression mm. as it is a physical progression. And that's where it really drives me to now that my body's older and I have to even train smarter to do the shit that I do. Yeah. Now it's a fucking mind game of getting smarter to keep doing impressive things. It's not the physicality anymore. Mm -hmm. The physicality dropped me to the education. Now the education keeps me physical. How can some people listening use compensatory acceleration well to the, gain some strength? The dynamic effort method. If you can beat something with speed, it's lighter. That's what that's what Fred Hatfield talked about all the time. If you can learn to store kinetic energy, which is usually speed work, and if if Hatfield was here today, he'd tell you bands and chains because it teaches you to grind through shit that is as getting heavier. Now, there's all kinds of stuff, people out talking about, well, bands and chains don't work in reality. The problem is you can't use research studies with that because the people they studied aren't fucking strong. Mm. Show me, go give me like 10 800-pound squatters 
that all have impeccable form, and you give me 15 weeks of training them accommodative resistance smart, and I'll show you progression. Mm. Right? Because mm. here's the thing is if I take guys that squat 200, they're probably squatting 200 because they have all kinds of issues. Yeah. And so you can't say you can't use bands and chains on that population. I'm not saying if you're weaker, you can't use them, but you can't use them for studies. And that's why I wish that the Soviet system was still around for that particular mm -hmm. reason, just to talk about it. Because in the 80s, right before it all fell apart, they were talking about cords and band. They were starting to develop bands and it just fell apart. And uh, that, that would have been interesting. But Alexiev used to use accommodative resistance. There's probably a picture you can find. Alexiev's doing power cleans out of water. Mm. So they didn't have, they didn't understand change yet. Um, see if you can find it. They didn't understand change yet, but what Alexiev would do is the Soviets built him a three-foot deep pool, and they used stainless bars and bumper plates that wouldn't rust. Mm -hmm. And the first part of the pool, he was doing out of the water. So he'd get the water drag. <laughs> yeah. Then he would catch it out of the water. And so that was the first that step. That would have a, a crazy feel to it. Yeah, it'd be slow. and then, whoosh, Well, yeah. so I got to talk with uh, Alexiev's coach, um, through uh, Verkashansky. So I actually got to talk to Verkashansky. He moved to Italy after the Soviet Union, and he gave me a lot of feedback uh, for many years before he died. And he said that the, the coach told him that he could do a power clean out of the water with 455. Oh, my God. You've got to remember, he had the world record in the clean and jerk and the total till 2014 since 1975. Jesus. So to me, is talking about all-time world records and the standing of the world record – you can't really touch Alexiev. I mean, he won, he's the only lifter ever to not only break that many world records, but also to be named Athlete of the Year by Sports Illustrated in mm. 1975. So see, he's doing it out of water <laughs> in order for him to gain compensatory acceleration. Now, here's what's crazy about Alexiev and started to push my winning warm-ups. His, even though he looks like a big fat dude with no muscle, his fucking warm-up was a 50-pound kettlebell swing for 15 minutes before he'd start Olympic lifting. Mm, GPP out the fucking ass. <laughs> Literally, in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was probably the most conditioned Olympic lifter you've ever seen. I mean, unfucking real And that was told to me directly by his coach. Yeah. And I got pictures of him doing kettlebell swings. So, see, he started training variability, too. Mm -hmm. So he was the first athlete in the Soviet system that was actually allowed to go off-grid and start training different ways. And that's when they created the Dynamo Club. Mm. And he had 75 lifters that he was training that were all capable of world records. Every one of them. Think about that. Yeah. You know how many variations of the two lifts they had? 75. They would rotate 75 fucking lifts for the clean and jerk and the snatch. So they learned that specificity wasn't the way to get better either. So imagine... Look at that physique. <laughs> yeah, but look at... Find, I love pictures, that find pictures of him young. That's when he was Peak. older and starting to get unhealthy. Peak but physicality. See, look, <laughs> see the top right picture, he's the only lifter, powerlifting, Olympic lifting, it doesn't matter, athlete of the year in 1975. Wow. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Break all the world records in powerlifting and see if Sports Illustrated will put you on the front cover. Mm. John Haxon on the front cover. Right. Mm. See? So look at him younger. Fucking oh, Jack. Shit. So yeah. in those pictures where he was fatter, he was already in his mid late thirties, and he was just trying to break the total numbers. Mm -hmm. He didn't care about being "quote unquote" healthy anymore. So when he was younger, he was fucking cranked. But here's the deal: so he had seventy five variations of two different lifts. So he was really him and Mevdiev. If you read the book, I think it's called "Development of Special Strengths." If you read the book, it talks a lot about it. But what they started to realize is that there was only so much progression you could specify in those two Olympic lifts. So they started breaking the lifts into pieces, both in maximal strain, like a front squat. And yeah. then they would do an overhead squat. And then they would do, you know, a part of the clean just from the hang. And then they would do a high bar back squat narrow. And then they would, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the, the mixture was endless. But the point was, is that if they mixed and matched the movements and then they put the specificity in at key points... They were well-rounded athletes that would fucking destroy everybody in the, in the world in Olympic lifting. And not only did it work for Alexiev, he had 75 potential world record holders in the same fucking gym. Jesus. Imagine walking out in super training and 75 guys are out there right now and they all train here and they're all capable of winning the Olympics. That's fucking insane. Exactly. But, but why don't out. we train that way now? Yeah. I do. But you know what I mean? What, uh, what are bands and chains for? So bands and chains change the force velocity curve. So if you were to look at your highest amount of force is your slowest point, right? So if I'm, think of it like, let's start at the bottom. Can you pull up a force velocity curve on the page for me, please? 
So I'm going to talk you guys through this curve, and I think it might make sense of why you might need bands and chains. Now, obviously, there's a lot more physics involved, and I'm talking about it at a very elementary level so that everybody can just go, oh, that makes sense. I'm mm -hmm. not trying to go way crazy into it and act like a smart ass. So let's go in here. Okay, so you see as force rises, the speed slows. So at the top, at maximal strength, that would be like the heaviest fucking deadlift you could possibly pick would be the top of that right line closest to the force point, mm. okay? It's going to just be like, how long does a max effort deadlift take? Five seconds? Yeah. Long time. It's almost isometric. Okay, so let's we understand what that is. But down at the bottom where it says speed, think of that like throwing a fucking baseball, mm. right? It's heavier enough to where you can really put some juice into it, but you can't put a lot of force into it because it's too light. Now, if we move up the speed strength, we're talking something like a plyometric, like a depth jump or something like that. We go into power, we're probably talking 30 to 40% range where I train speed work. You're talking strength speed, you're somewhere around 60, 70% closer to where Louie talked about speed work. So as you can see, that curve, when you use bands and chains, you actually move the red line up a little bit, creating more force at a higher velocity mm. because you're having to push on something that's getting heavier. I look at it this way and it seems to make really good sense to me because I'm a car guy. But let's say you're driving, you get in your car and you're driving 65 down the highway. Well, mm -hmm. let's say 80 now. But let's just say you're going 65 and you got it on cruise control. And that cruise control will not stop. You know, like when you touch the brake, it shuts off. Yeah. Let's say it doesn't. And you start applying the brake very slowly. How hard does that engine have to work to maintain 65 miles an hour with brake friction? Mm. A fucking ton. So why wouldn't that be the same thing for muscle action? See what I'm saying? So if I'm pushing against bands and chains heavier, heavier, mm -hmm. heavier, heavier, mm -hmm. heavier, heavier, and now I'm trying to put maximum force into it, I have to work harder to maintain bar speed. Yeah. The same way an engine would have to work harder as you apply brakes. So by adding bands and chains with the proper amount of weight on the bar and the proper amount of band tension, you're going to manipulate that force velocity curve. Does that make sense? So imagine you throw a baseball and you can throw it, say, 100 feet. Now attach a micro mini band to it. See, really when you throw a baseball, you're only throwing it for the first 16 inches. And then you've already created enough whip on it. You're just following through. Mm -hmm. If you had a band attached to it, you ain't following through shit. It's going to have to go all the way through <laughs> your hand. And that's what bands and chains are for. It's manipulating that force velocity curve. That also potentially uh, assisting with uh, less deceleration. Because sometimes if the weight's too light that you're using for speed mm -hmm. and it doesn't have a band or chain on there, you can kind of like, I guess, like mm -hmm. overpress into it and your body's smart enough to not hurt itself. Yep. Just like throwing a wiffle ball. Like it's not an appropriate weight yep. to put a ton of force into to Stop, you have to slow down. Mm -hmm. But with bands and chains, the amount of slowing down is much less. And a lot of the time, you might not be building as much fatigue as if you were just working with an 80, 90% no, load but here's, straight here's up. Here's why free weights, and again, we're going theoretical here. Here's why free weights don't work all the time. Free weights don't work all the time because they have the same force velocity curve. Mm. Where do you notice, and Mark, you've had a gym for a long time. I've had a gym for a long time. You've been around a gym a long time. I know you've been around. Where do people miss a fucking bench or a squat? either right off the floor or halfway up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're talking the halfway up guys right now, which mm -hmm. I would say is 80, 90% of everybody. So the bench on the chest and it can't get it. Why? You have all the work down here with free weights and none of the work at the top. Because once you beat the weight, you've already got inertia on it. And now 225 doesn't weigh 225. Mm -hmm. But on your chest, when you have to go the opposite direction, you might have to put 250 pounds of pressure to get 225 to move the other way. Mm -hmm. So now you're building all this strength in the bottom but hardly anything at the top. So then when you go to strain and that bar speed's not there, you miss in the middle because you didn't strain in the middle because free weight's only hard at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's like camming. It's like a cam. You know, like when you're, your machine's out there, you mm -hmm. can change the where the weight gets hard and easy or not at all. Yeah. Bands and chains change that too. So now you have to, once it hits here, you're used to it getting heavier and you just boom. Make sense? Yes. So the reason it got a bad rap was because bench shirts and squat suits got you out of the bottom. So the bands and chains were the hardest at the top. But if you look at muscle physiology, it's the same thing. You want to create a lot of kinetic energy. You want to get the bar moving really fast. Look at Maddox's bench, how fast it is off his chest. Where the fuck does he miss it? At the top, what does he not chain, train with very often? Bands or chains. So if he was theoretically utilizing a lot of, if you could pull up Maddox is missing a bench, you're going to see he misses it at the top every time. Why? He trains with free weights all the time. So his starting strength is crazy but he doesn't keep the inertia going because the weights got lighter in training. Therefore the work's not as high at the top. Mm. Make sense. 
It does. Makes tons of sense. Do you think that some of that training has also led to you having longevity because uh, the weights are lighter at the bottom and so heavier watch. at the top? He misses right. That's a good one. I think that was oh, 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 yeah. almost took his teeth out. But I'm looking for one he actually misses before he gets yeah, to the top. Yeah, it, it shows the 800 that he misses at the end. It's a fucking animal. Yeah, he's an animal. So see how much it slows down there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he was training with bands and chains, might be able to plow right through. He'd that plow spot. right through it. So 722. So these are all good ones. Mm-hmm. I want to see. Here his, it is. I want to see his fails. But yeah, you watch when he fails, and you can see that he's used to training with it off his, the, the weight's going to be the heaviest at the point they tell him to press. So right now it's 800. Oh, maybe not. God damn. I remember yeah, that. Getting, I was there at that meet, I think. Getting some weird liftoffs, man. <laughs> you know, that's the biggest problem with him. I try to talk to him all the time. I was like, you need to have the same liftoff guy every fucking mm-hmm. time. Yeah. He goes to these different gyms and doesn't have the same liftoff guy. And with those kind of weights, there's no messing around. I remember Mendelssohn years ago. His, so we watch where oh, he shit. misses. See yeah. that top point? Yeah. So... The thing of it is, he's used to driving it off of his chest. He's strong there. So let's say 800 pounds takes 850 to move. So again, if you do 800 to 800, <sighs> what happens to the bar? Nothing, right? You have to push over that. So he does have that starting power, but not the finish power. So that's just like an example of what bands and chains would do. But the average person is going to stick way lower than that mm-hmm. on the bench. And it's because if you look at free weights, they have limitations with inertia and kinetic energy. You get to the bottom, and it's this is the hardest point. Now it's already moving, so you just glide through. Yeah, Bands and chains will not let you do that. There's also a huge advantage when it comes to just sometimes doing stuff in a more advantageous position, mm-hmm. something like a, uh, like a skull crusher. You can do that with some chains on a bar, and now the weight is totally deloaded at the bottom where most of the time that might bother someone's or elbow. Or be the highest point of injury. Right. Everything stretched the worst. Right. So then that's the lightest point. Here's where you start to see why bands and chains have really been in papers as not really working. Mm-hmm. They don't have the right percentages of weight to band ratio because they're not lifters. They don't understand it. They don't feel it. Mm-hmm. And they're not using athletes that are strong enough to see it. Mm-hmm. You know? So that's that's why you're having an issue. I know Greg Knuckles talked on mm-hmm. Dave Tate's thing about bands and chains don't work. Yeah. Well, that's why. They they do work. They just haven't been put in the right position yet with the right professor, with the right fucking research. How about, so, so, I mean, I know there's a big difference between these two, but how about the individuals who try to employ a pause or a double pause to try to get that ton of benefit? So for example, on a bench, come down, press a few inches above, pause, and then drive we call it. We call that a ratchet. Okay. So a ratchet, like when you click, 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 click. Mm-hmm. So we'll do a lot of ratcheting on the eccentric. So okay. what you would do mm-hmm. is on a speed bench, one, two, three, bang. I'm a huge proponent of not fucking with the concentric. Okay. Oh, concentric is always bow. All right. Whatever you do. But on the eccentric, if you want to develop particular points of strain, I think you can change not only the tempo, but you can also ratchet down. But if you look, really the power, if you do a lot of research and reading, the power of getting stronger sometimes lies in the eccentric of the movement, not the concentric. Hmm. So if you manipulate the eccentric loading, timing, and positioning constantly you're going to get more benefit out of the same exercise but never teach your body to have a sticking point on its own got it you teach if you want that same amount of pressure add another fucking chain Mm -hmm. because now it's going to force you to punch through but don't teach it to stop you can do anything you want on the way down but do not do not fuck with that concentric makes sense some people don't have a good idea of how important um your rest interval can be and how important yeah the the uh are you talking rest interval as far as the training set or the day See that's yeah yeah just a particular a particular set you know like you're you can get stronger by having a specific uh, time domain associated with your rest interval like if you're let's say you're doing four sets of four and you have two minutes rest well that's a way different workout than if you just take your time with your four sets of four or you're going to you be a, five minutes rest right that'd even be some ways better for what you're saying so here's here's how i break it down <clears throat> but you can get conditioned through it as well. well so you could do a two minute rest right and you can get yeah. conditioned to so, t- tolerate more work in a condensed period so of time. again law of accommodation the body also adapts to rest periods so in my warm-ups i hardly rest at all boom 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 boom, boom, boom. so i'll do 300 reps in 12 to 14 minutes <laughs> right capacity but when you go to maximal strain let's say it's a max effort day what you would do is if you look at ATP replenishment at the cell, it takes anywhere from four to six minutes depending on trainability. 
So what you would do is on the lighter sets, let's say I'm a 400 pound bencher, 135. I don't need any rest to go to 185, maybe a minute. Yeah. 225, now we're getting half. So now I'm thinking, okay, maybe a couple minutes. 275, now we're in the 60, 70% range, three minutes. When I start getting over 70, 80%, you need a bare minimum of four minutes rest if you're trying to do a max effort day, but you also need to maintain some lack of full recovery because you have to ask yourself again, are you testing or building? And I want to test in a beat up state when I'm not at my perfect rehab because I say that for meets only. Mm -hmm. Well, how long does it, how long do you wait between a bench press at a fucking meet? 15 mm -hmm. minutes in a flight? Long time, but you're fully recovered. Yeah. So what I find is that I would say on average, I, and this is just a general rule of thumb, I try not to rest more than two minutes in training. And if the max effort is very important. It'll go up to four to five minutes between sets as the weights get over 60, 70%. So like uh, you guys weren't here yesterday, but when I benched 500 with that Cadillac bar I'd never touched before, mm -hmm. I benched 135, did a set of face pulls, rested about 90 seconds, then benched 225 for like five face pulls, rested about 120 seconds. 315, set of face pulls, rested about three minutes, 405 face pulls rested four minutes, 500 rested five minutes, smoked it. <laughs> but if I'd have just done 90 seconds rest, 135, 225, 315, 405, 500, I probably wouldn't have got the 500. Wow. I just wouldn't have the recovery ability. So yeah. on your lighter sets where you don't need the recovery, push the capacity. And then when the weights become important, i.e. the maximum bench, yes. increase the rest so that the cell level has an ability to recover because you can't feel that. Mm -hmm. You know how many I don't know how many times on online coaching or just fucking around in the gym and you let somebody to their own devices, especially a beginner intermediate guy, and then you watch them warm up and then they miss their lift that they wanted to get that day. Yeah. And then you ask them, How long did you rest? Well, I felt really good, so I just went for it. <laughs> so you're telling me you only rested like a minute between the last set? That's why you missed it. And then you make them rest five minutes and do it again and they'll get it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, What? And I'm like, dude, you you can't feel when you're ready. It's a fucking biological time clock at the cell. So when the ATP gets, you know, um, gets drawed out, you, it takes four to six minutes for it to come back to a hundred percent. And I would say even 95%. So rest periods are very important, but remember, don't test all the time, build. And when you build, you want to keep yourself at a deficit, even in the rest periods. So law of accommodation or basically doing the same thing too often, don't get caught up in using the same rest periods either because Again, when's the last time I benched 500 on an empty stomach with seven hours of flight? Not very often, yeah. but because I trained so fucking crazy, it wasn't a big deal. But how many people have you seen fly in, mm -hmm. they come in and train, and they're like, well, I, uh, I can't do my best today because I just got off the plane. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you see what I mean? My, my body's used to going, ah, he wants to do this shit again. Here we go. You know what I mean? It's just burp, turn the switch and go. Yeah. But I still understand rest periods. See? So rest periods are huge. That what you, what you mentioned though is it, we haven't seen it many times but the other person that we met we saw do it was john hack <laughs> john came here and it was stupid how dude how much did he bench and squat he benched like 535 and he squatted like seven maybe like 705 but his knee was weird that day maybe yeah. it was maybe it was a little bit less than seven but yeah he <laughs> he he did them back to back and he he did it like uh in a real short period of time, it might have took him 30 minutes from start to finish to get through his squat and his bench. And then get this. He drags a sled for maybe like five minutes straight, and he threw up from the sled because he's like, he's not used to it. Whoa. <laughs> he did that afterwards. because <laughs> Totally <was> different <laughs> stimulus for him. It shows yeah. you, though, that how specific even work capacity is. So let's say, mm -hmm. let's say I'm in really good shape, like Bell's running a bunch. Uh-huh. He comes in and does jujitsu with you for five minutes. He's going to felt like he ran a marathon. Dead. I went and I ran with him. Right. Yeah. Like for the first time, because I, I don't usually run. I yeah. went and I ran with him. And towards the end of the run, I was like, I can see what the fuck you're doing, Mark. You're starting to speed up because you're trying to smoke. And he did. <laughs> like he, he like he left me behind a bit. I was like, fuck you. Because uh -huh. he's been running a ton, yeah. you know. But did he, did he come over and do your shit? <laughs> he, what? Did he fucking <laughs> no, I know better than that. <laughs> He wouldn't do that. That's stupid. That's just stupid. Oh, yeah. But you get my point, though. I go. So the thing of it is, is capacity is can be specific in goal. That's why I always look for transferability. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, going back to the knees over toes. I don't want to drill that in, but what does it transfer to? 
And that that's a question that everybody has to answer to themselves. Yeah. Don't know. I mean, maybe if it's, it's somebody's always a weaknesses. great question is to ask yourself, yeah, what are you doing something yeah. for? You again, know, what's the result you're looking for? Again, you're not going to show me a squat, a deadlift, or a bench press that I'm not good at. And even if I've never seen it before, I had never touched that Cadillac bar and go to 500 mm -hmm. with no meals and no rest and just do it. You see what I'm saying? But see, that's what I do. When I go into other gyms, I was talking to your brother. I, he's like, what are you looking around for? It's like, I'm looking for something I've never seen, which was that Cadillac bar. And I'm like, let's do that. He goes, you're just going to pick something you've never done before? I'm like, yeah, because my body's never seen that stimulus. But I learned it like, Phew. see, and that to me is, that to me is smart training. Give me somebody that's never seen something and they're, now I'm not saying they're the best at it, but they're really good at it. That means that they're transferring their training to almost anything that they want. But running is awesome. But if you go to a jujitsu mat, and let's just say Mark knows how to jujitsu, the running is not going to help him much. So is it good for cardio? Well, for transferability, maybe not. And maybe it is. Again, swimming. Michael Phelps might look amazing in the pool. Give him a 50-pound kettlebell and see how long he can swing it. Mm. You might be surprised. Not very long. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a little bit of an individual thing, but I yeah. would also say like that uh, – each person can work towards a particular capacity. So Absolutely. like for, you know, someone who's doing jujitsu, like for them to run two miles, just shouldn't be that hard. Right. You know what I mean? It's well, like that's if you're, thing. if you're trying to be high level. Oh, sure. And that's the thing is like, what are you, what are you weak at? What do you need work on? And again, are you picking things that might transfer to other things to hit multiple birds with one stone? And, that, and that's really what you have to start realizing with your training is, okay, I can squat this particular position, but if it only makes me strong one particular way, it may not be a good investment in time. And that's where I try to get people to understand is like, look, the average person's not trying to break a world record. The average person is trying to put a little muscle mass on and get a little leaner. So what exercises can you pick that's going to allow that to happen and transfer to all other things easier? And that's always been my thought process. You know, everybody's, well, sumo's cheating. Sumo made my conventional fucking strong because it made me use my hips. Yeah. You can't really, you know, people... I would say sumo is only cheating if you're perfectly built to pull sumo, you know, and you have the mobility to put yourself in almost a leg press position like some of these new guys mm -hmm. are. But you give somebody that position that's not really built to deadlift, it's going to work muscles that they really need to focus on. What are some of your thoughts on uh, athletes and as it relates to their strength in the gym? You know, and uh, let's say a good athlete, it's like a running back and really struggles to squat like 225. Like, do you think, is that something that's like a... Uh, do you think if you get the guy to squat 315 that he'll be a better athlete or where do you kind of sit on some of that? I, I think it's some of it's individual. So <clears throat> I'll give you a prime example. When Charlie Francis talked at Swiss conference before he died, I got, I didn't get to see it. Um, Dr. Kanakin, the guy that runs Swiss sent it to me and I watched it and I thought it was really interesting. So he gets a hold of Ben Johnson in the early eighties. Ben Johnson was a fucking freak sprinter, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he had the world record until they took it away from him in 88. You remember from the drug thing, yeah. but he ran like, I want to say it was a 9-8 flat or some shit back in 88. It was something crazy. Well, when, when Ben Johnson and Charlie Francis got together, he noticed that Ben Johnson wasn't strong enough to maintain top speed after 50 meters. So Ben Johnson, I believe, still has the fastest start ever. Mm -hmm. And But when he got mm. to 50 meters, he slowed down because he couldn't maintain that amount of power. So Charlie Francis started looking at his training protocol. His training protocol, he was doing a ton of heavy singles. So Charlie Francis switched it to triples to match the time of the 100 meter. And he went from 550 for a single to 635 for a triple at 190 body weight as a fucking runner and broke the all and broke the all-time world record. And interestingly enough, his squats they weren't below parallel. No. They were specific like they were running. they were intentionally a little higher. And uh, Charlie Francis would spot him and, and assist him a little bit, mm -hmm. and he would have knee wraps on. I just found all that to be and a belt. Well, so what? So again, so what Charlie Francis talked about in this talk was neurological hyper adaptation. So what he was trying to get Ben Johnson to do is make his body weight to his mind feel insanely light. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter if he had fucking knee wraps on or didn't go deep. He's trying to get the maximal neural drive out of maximal weights on his fucking back. So when he's set up in the blocks, he's used to pushing against three times body weight. And now he's just like, bow, out of the gate. And he's strong enough, long enough to maintain that level of power after 50 meters and fucking smoked everybody. Yeah. So the answer to your question is, where's the weakness? Now, if you sell, you tell me that a pro running back or a high-level college running back is only squatting 225, 315 will absolutely make him faster. If he's already squatting 650, probably not. Mm -hmm. 
But here's the thing is whatever you suck at is the limiting factor. And a lot of times today in sports, the limiting factor is strength. The guys aren't that strong. I remember clean as fucking day. This is crazy as shit. 2003, I'm doing my internship at IPI. Vince Carter's there with the Raptors. (laughs) So this is the first superstar I've ever even had my eyes on, but let alone get to watch train because I'm just a fucking intern. Yeah. So the the, the Raptors are down there, and I'm watching watching uh, Vince Carter and I'm just enamorated by this fucking guy because this dude could jump so right before we start training they had some rookies down there and some other guys they're all throwing money down on the floor and they're betting Vince Carter sitting on a bench with one foot off the ground so like a pistol squat sitting on a bench that he couldn't jump up to a 40 like a 40 something inch box with one leg he fucking does it (laughs) boom one legged and then lands at double leg and gets down give me my money I'm like what check this out 30 minutes later, he can't fucking squat 185. Could you imagine if that fucker would have been strong? Even at, even at a Ben Johnson depth, he didn't want to train weights, and what happened to him? He was so fucking fast, he was injured all the time. He was constantly injured. Mm-hmm. He had a long career, but there was a lot of times he was out for ankle issues, knee issues. All He's kind of like a Bo Jackson. He was so explosive. So this is Ben Johnson squatting... I don't know if it shows the side of it, but sometimes he's squatting onto a box. He too. is on a uh, yeah. So people ask right me here. all the time. Yeah, so he's squatting on a box. Quick question, Matt. Have you heard of like the Gota guys and all these guys that we've had on the podcast recently? Probably Gota. Yeah. Gota. They're uh, they're against weightlifting um, for for sport athletes because they're uh, a big concept in their belief is like something like a squat would compress the ankle and it will compress the joints so that when these individuals go into cutting movements that may lead to knee injuries Mm. so like that's their take on this so they don't have many of their lifters lift they'll do other things to build strength they do some forms of resistance training but not really lifting weights not lifting my question is do they have anybody as fast as ben johnson nope no See, this is yeah. where it gets confusing because maybe Ben Johnson is just a freak. So most of the athletes are field athletes, by the yeah, way. Sure, not, sure. I get it. But I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. My thoughts are bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. my fucking thoughts. Okay. Straight okay. up. Fair. And here's the thing is like <laughs> ben, Johnson. ben Johnson just disproved that completely 35 years ago. Mm-hmm. Number t- number one. Number two, the big thing is, is that where's most of those athletes weak? <laughs> Right? This Where's most of these athletes weak? And if and if that was really true, you really think that Charlie Francis wouldn't have known that to do that to Ben Johnson to win a win a fucking gold medal? One of their probably rebuttals would be he's a track athlete. He's trying to create as much power going linear. there as pot linear. He's not changing directions swiftly, right? And his 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 ankles aren't having to swiftly change direction. So their thing would be like these heavy forces compress the ankle. So then if the athlete changes direction, all those forces don't travel the right way yeah. and boom, ACL, so all my, these types so of things. So my rebuttal to that is, is if you think that looks heavy to Ben Johnson to do and it compresses everything, mm-hmm. them changing direction 100 miles an hour is 10 times worse than that mm-hmm. on compressive factors. So why, why are they doing cutting drills? If it's compressing everything, why are they doing that? Because it's sport specific? Get my point? Yeah. So everything that they do with field athletes, that's compressive too and way more. It's just the reason you and I don't think it's way more is because you don't have a fucking force plate on the ground showing you how much it is. So here's the here's the check. We did this with the fire department just to get an idea. On a, The last step off of a fire truck is about 16 to 18 inches. Mm. Okay? Not very high, right? We're talking here. When they put 60 pounds of gear on, a 190-pound fireman weighs 545 when he steps off the thing, mm. like if he jumps down. Yeah. Oof. So yeah. they're completely negating all of those processes and thought processes. If why do all those why do all those drills if they're compressive too? Because mm. they're specific. So what I started to find was if I got the guys stronger doing those kind of lifts, their ligaments, tendons, and bones were more resilient to getting fucking hurt. And then when they do the change of direction, they're like. They got a stronger frame. They don't get hurt. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're avoiding one thing to possibly cause an injury on the other thing. There's never, it's never clear cut. Maybe they're right with the lifting, but it's still going to happen in the sport. Just because it's changed the direction or linear doesn't matter. So yeah, I think, I think what I found for myself is like (laughs) that 
just be careful of the particular exercise you select. Like sure. try, I mean, it's you can fuck around in the gym a little bit, but try to have a good reason on why you're selecting particular exercises. On top of that, maybe just think about how you want to do the exercise in accordance to the results that you're looking mm -hmm. for and try to make sure that makes some sense. It doesn't, you don't have to like be crazy scientific about it or no. anything, but let you me, know, if you're, if you're trying that, to, if trying yeah. to overload or handle weights the way that like Ben Johnson was doing, I think it's totally appropriate to not worry about the depth at all. He's not trying to, wasn't no, again, trying to he be wants that neurological kid. function. But here's the thing. Right. If I were an athlete, there would be some different things that I wouldn't train like a power lifter. Here's how I would do it. One, and don't get it twisted. I'm not telling you this because I sell them. I would, I would belt squat them more than I would back squat them because I'm going to get, as you, I posted a paper today, University of Connecticut studied my belt squat and showed it almost got the same amount of muscle activation with no spinal compression. Mm. So there's a savior because mm. what's the probably number one thing that athletes have issues with in the weight room, low back. So if we negate that and just do a lot of bracing work, a lot of GHRs, a lot of reverse hypers and belt squats, we'd be good there. The other thing too is if we know the posterior chain's a weakness, we could use a good morning machine because now the pressure is pushing us forward but not directly down. So if we keep good posture, we're going to smash all those muscles on the posterior chain, but we're not getting any vertical compression. So now the joints are saved. Mm -hmm. So again, what we do is what we're going back to, I think, is compression versus traction. So what we need to do is find exercises that are going to attack muscle groups that allow us to gain what we want out of these big lifts, but do it in a non-compressive or moderate compressive state and leave the compression shit out on the field. That's how I would do it. And yeah. I don't give a shit what sport it is. So you're right. Back squats, deadlifts, and sometimes even bench pressing are not viable all the time. So I think back in the day, if Ben Johnson would have used a belt squat instead of that squat, may have been better, mm -hmm. in my opinion. If he'd have done more GHRs and more, you know, um, reverse hypers, if they'd have been around at the time, I think it would have made his training a little bit better and a little bit more thoughtful, but they worked with what they had. Yeah. And so my thought process is I wouldn't agree with what you were saying and base it off of a compressive factor because that's what they deal with in sport anyway. Yeah. Um, and with yours, traction versus compression is the only thing you need to go into education. When you walk into the gym, is this exercise going to make me strong without adding extra mileage? If the answer is yes, fucking do it. If the answer is like, eh, that exercise got high mileage and I'm not real good at it, you might want to just use that as a technical exercise and go smash your ass with something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people think they have to do certain exercises no. too. They're like, last time I tried these squats, I hurt my knee. Yeah. It's like, well, trust your intuition. Maybe mm -hmm. do something different. Like you don't have to necessarily do a squat. Hell no. You Pick could, some other version of a squat or something like that. My opinion is I would take, after being friends with Boyle for a long time, Boyle doesn't really do any bilateral back squats. He's a huge unilateral guy. And the more I look at it from a perspective of general population firemen, I'm a unilateral guy too because it fixes left and right imbalances, which yeah. is the problem of bilateral shit anyway. In field sports, you're never driving off the same two feet at once. Even Ben Johnson isn't. Mm -hmm. And you notice even when he takes off linear, he still has to go left, right, left, right. So it's still lateral too. Yeah. Because if you watch him, he's still doing this. So it's not it's not linear. I mean, he's his race is linear, but it's still single-legged each time. Mm -hmm. So I find that if you are limited in education, you don't know a whole lot, Think traction versus compression, unilateral balance before bilateral loading, and then making sure that your TVA, your core muscles, and all of that are ready for vertical loading. If you do those four things, you're fucking in like Flynn. If you avoid one of those, it's going to come back and bite you in the ass, and the, the timeline is just dependent on how lucky you get. Mm. That's my thought process mm. on the situation. Anything else, Andrew? No, that's it. I'm just really interested in getting some advice on working those TVAs after this. Though. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. Well, actually, we should what maybe you got? talk about this too because uh, we, we were talking about all those weaknesses and uh, how about the mobility stuff? Because mm. you've mentioned that multiple times. I don't think we've kind of gone in on what you do or what maybe. I, I know you can't just suggest a general thing for everybody, but that's one area where a lot of athletes just kind of are like, eh, well, if I have enough mobility to get into my specific movements and I'm mobile enough to squat, bench, deadlift, comfortably why the fuck would i need to work on it anymore because the body starts to stiffen up to the point that those motions don't work well either i mean me and mark could tell you straight up being older now and getting closer to 50 that for me to even 
go to slightly below parallel now is a fucking warm up to do it because the hips have been getting grenaded for 30 fucking years. Mm. So that's one of the reasons why I developed the winning warm up. But mobility is movement under a range of motion. Mm -hmm. So what you want to try to do, especially as you age, is try to maintain mobility. Now, that might mean gaining some too, but I find that sometimes mobility and flexibility, some of that's genetic. My dad was tighter than a banjo string. I, I do some form of mobility work every fucking day, and I'm still not the most flexible guy in the world. So if it was training, I'd be flexible. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's a car accident too. Remember we were yeah. talking about that. Why Everybody asked, why the fuck you wear sandals all the time? Because when I was big and I had all that damage in my legs, I couldn't put on my fucking shoes. <laughs> now I can, but I just yeah. don't, I choose not to. Yeah. So the point is, is mobility is always about range of motion and movement. It's It's exercise. And that's where we got away from doing static stretching and the late 90s, early 2000s, and went to dynamic mobility, mm -hmm. which is like lung twist reach, alternate toe touching. You know, you watch, if, it'd be interesting for the average person to go and watch how NFL players warm up before practice now. They're not going to see what they think they see if they're not into the field. They're going to see a lot of movement mobility, not just laying on the ground stretching. Yeah. And so there's a huge difference between mobility and flexibility. Flexibility means you can stretch. Mobility means you can move. Mm -hmm. And movement will create flexibility, but flexibility will not create mobility. Not all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that just try to push your range of motion like you were doing in the gym today. Push your range of motion just a little bit out of whack with lighter weights and sometimes make the exercise, again, law of accommodation, make it more difficult because it's higher range of motion. Again, I squat like Ben Patrick does every once in a while, but I don't do it all the fucking time. But I can still do it with insane weights if I want to. Yeah, That's the difference. So you find that people that sell you a specific Band-Aid for a particular problem, well, that might work for a minute, but then it's an issue again on another way. Mm -hmm. So for me, mobility is all about maintaining range of motion, and that's why I, a lot of times I do the winning warm-ups. It's to potentiate weak muscle groups, but also get the body ready for those actions of range of motion. So if I'm going to squat that day, I'm belt squatting 100 reps before I even squat because now that mobility factor is gone. Mm -hmm. It's all warm, it's ready, but it's specifically ready to do what I ask it to do in the task. Now, I have a question on top of that. Since, like, you know, you've done all your competing, you might do some more competitions in the future. Who knows? Um, are you trying to just maintain that, or are you trying to increase your range of motion in any different areas? So right now, I mean, I'm kind of trying to keep playing with my diet, find something that's manageable, but keeps getting me leaner and keeps my blood work good as I age. Yeah. That's really been my big focus while maintaining as much strength as I possibly can and show people that this is possible for many, many years without getting injury if you're smart. Um, for me, it's all about, you know, when I started as a kid and I wanted to be as strong as I could possibly be, it was always a, a fact of trying to show people when other people want to quit, I'm not going to quit. And so I, I always have that in the back of my mind that I'm still strong enough to compete, mm -hmm. but now my business is more important. Helping the people that work for me is more important because the problem with me competing, and I'm sure Mark's ran into the same issue. When I go into comp mode, I'm not fun to be around. I'm not a good business guy. And I'm like this. And that's really hard to deal with when you're dealing with people of all different types and different abilities. You know, when I go into powerlifting mode, I'm fucking powerlifting mode, mm -hmm. everything, hundred percent, hundred miles an hour. And that's the greatest thing when you're competing. And it's the worst fucking thing in the world you can do when you retire. <laughs> Because then people are like, oh, well, Matt, you know, he's a fucking asshole, blah, blah, blah. Like, dude, I was prepping for meets, yeah. you know? So it, it's it's one of those things where, for me, the mobility is the winning warm-up. That's what I do. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's specific to staying strong. But I think the more important thing is I'm warming up the weakest muscle groups. I'm warming up the ones that I think are going to be the issue, and usually I'm right. So a lot of times, mobility can also be a um, a weakness. So what is a tight hamstring? It's a weak hamstring mm. most of the time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? If I'm always having shoulder problems, it's probably weak in some area and I'm compensating. So, again, I've never seen tight hamstrings that were strong per mm. se. So, I find that if I get my hamstring stronger in a full range of motion exercise, they not only get more mobile, they get stronger. Mm -hmm. So, usually a tight muscle is a weak muscle. Not always, but I would say most of the time. So, in that example of the hamstring, what would... How would you have a person work that hamstring through a long range of motion to have it become stronger? What would you have them do? Well, what I really like to do is I'll hang a band from a high belt, uh, squat rack. 
Okay. I'm laying on my back. I'll hook a band that's pretty decent amount of tension, say like an orange and a red. And now I'm suspended. My leg's hanging in the air. So if I scoot in close enough for the rack, it's causing me to stretch, and then I'm leg curling. Okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So now I'm creating some stretching and some strengthening at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm really a big proponent of, I don't think, if you're getting it strong and mobile at the same time, it's way better than just trying to get it mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It does create jack shit, in my opinion. Yeah. So for me, I will try, or I'll use a GHR, and I'll go all the way down till my head's trying to touch the floor, and then I'll come up. Yeah. And now I'm stretching that hamstring, but I'm telling it, hey, motherfucker, I want you to turn on to do a deadlift mm -hmm. versus going, oh, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit, you know? Yeah. To me, it's not it's not transferring over to the movement. I mean, that's just my opinion on things. But oh, That makes sense. That's, you know, the, the, the funny thing is what you're mentioning right there, the hamstring, there's there's a few things that Ben also, like you, I think you guys would align more than, yeah. than, than be separate. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things that you guys have similar opinions mark will with. tell you i align with people that squat 800 pounds yeah <laughs> <laughs> you pick up i love a, it you pick up I a weight it. you pick up a weight and bleed out your nose we'll have a talk about squats <laughs> okay mm -hmm. there you, you go. know you strain on something i can bench for 10 i don't think we're going to talk too much fair fair because <laughs> <laughs> 475 i think i've done for 15 on the bench. <laughs> oh but i'm not gosh. positive i know i've done 500 for 11 oh man but whatever hey the man has boosters man he can dunk hey i guess I guess. I mean, I can. I can probably hang on the rim at I, fucking two seventy. I'm pretty sure you could. I'm very certain you could. I mean, we can. We can do speed squats for speed and see who's faster. That'd be interesting. Have you ever tried to dunk? I can hang on the rim. <clears throat> oh damn. Yeah. I can't get. I can't dunk. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anybody at six foot two eighty that can dunk unless <clears throat> they're in the NFL. Shit. When you, uh, <clears throat> you know, you said you when you came to the gym, you know, you pick something different. Do you think in the future you might pick stuff that's way different? Like instead of like a bench press, you might. Uh, I don't know. Do something that's. Uh, I was looking at your. Or, I was looking at your machines with cams because yeah. I don't train anything like that. Like and some bodybuilding that way. Yeah. Well, I was thinking like, what if I did a five rep max with the prime machine and set the cam in an area that I'm not used to? So I was actually thinking about that because I didn't know those adjusted like that until yeah. your brother showed me, and then I was thinking, fuck, I almost yeah, they're neat, aren't they? I almost would have rather done that than the Cadillac bar just because it's so fucking wild. Mm -hmm. Again, so today, um, I do a little bit of arm training now. I'm retired. I don't give a shit. I went and found your bicep machine and changed the cam to something that didn't feel right. So I could train with something different. It was fucking crazy. My arm was like, boom. Mm. I can usually always tell if my training's right if I get a massive pump real quick. Yeah. Because my body, you've probably all been there, but my body doesn't recognize the stimulus and it's going, fuck, what's this? Mm. If, if I'm training and I do two or three sets and I don't feel my body's getting pumped, I already know that's a bad angle. My body's already used to it. It doesn't like it. It's not going to grow fucking shit from it. It sounds crazy. But it, it happens. You, have you ever ran into that? Okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm very curious what your guys' thoughts are on this because right now, when when people are looking at like fitness on Instagram and TikTok, <laughs> they're trying to reference everything. Show, as show adaptation to training. You have to type in like it'll show neurological strength. You'll pop it up real easy. I can't remember how you do it on Google, but it it's something about adaptate training adaptations. Mm -hmm. And what it shows is that strength is kind of medium. If I remember it correctly, neurological adaptation is quick, and then hypertrophy training is long. Mm -hmm. So if you are constantly adaptation or training, using your training to adapt to um, that super compensation, but it's going to be on loading. So it's going to mm -hmm. be like uh, it's going to show strength, hypertrophy, and neurological adaptation to training. But that's a good one too to talk about. But um, so basically, this is how you set up your training either in a one phase, like a, a workout or mm -hmm. multiple workouts. Mm -hmm. So super compensation is when you're better than you were before. Yeah. Now that usually in a workout requires 72 hours of recovery. So people that squat like every day, they're not ever hitting that super compensation. They're just digging a hole. Mm -hmm. um, super compensation <laughs> is about the timing of the session or developing every four weeks you have a deload so that the body can adjust to the training. Yeah. I just like this one because they highlight right here. Close. Steroids. Okay. <laughs> yeah, badass, right? So there's me and Mark on the steroid <laughs> yeah, one. Right <laughs> All the way over. Okay, so. And then Natty over here. There's Natty down at the bottom. So, all right, so let's take a look at this. This is really interesting. So if we look right now, the strength takes longer than everything, right? Uh-huh. The hypertrophy comes a little faster and the neural adaptation happens insanely quick. Now, the question that you're asking and the thing that's always baffled me on why that happens, this is my thought. When the neurological system sees an exercise or 
gets introduced to an exercise that's never seen, it requires more motor units to turn on and do the same movement because it's fucking confused, mm -hmm. which creates more motor unit activation with less intensity, which is exactly what you want. But if you use an exercise that's the exact same that you've been doing, the body's going to find a resistance path to not turn on as much and find its bare minimum to do the movement. Yeah. So when doing this, then the body has to turn on more motor units because it's confused. And I don't like to use muscle confusion, <laughs> but you get my point. I get what you're saying. The, yeah. the spinal cord and the nerves are like, what do we need to turn on? I don't understand this fucking movement. And mm -hmm. that's when you get the growth with the minimal amount of work. Now, if you look at the front cover, I don't know if we can find it, of Thomas Kurtz's book. It's called Science of Sports Training. And this has one of the best um, one of the best quotes I've ever seen on the front cover of a book. You have this book? You probably do, but yeah, it's been a while. It's like, it's like yellow and red. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see it pop up because I want to read this to you so you guys understand something that's okay. Oh, now yeah. let's read this bottom yellow. Training is effective. We'll click on it and blow it up for you guys. Now this this book changed my whole thought process on how you should train. Read that. Read on the bottom for me. Are you able to see it in SEMA? Training is efficient if the highest sports sports result is achieved with the least expense of time and energy. Ooh, what the fuck is that all about? <laughs> so let's not sell intensity anymore. Let's get fucking smart and train smart and get better with doing less work. Shouldn't that be the goal of everything? Fuck yeah, it should be. Because if you're running yourself through the same fucking gauntlet every day, every week and every month and every year, you are creating a resistance to getting better and you're not getting better with efficient movements. But the excuse is these these movements are mo the most biomechanical efficiently the most biomechanical efficient movements for these muscle groups. So why am I going to do something else if it's not efficient? Because biomechanical efficiency doesn't create hypertrophy. Hmm. So if I have to do something in a weird lever, i.e., a band, a chain, or a weird angle, the muscles have to fucking work harder. Therefore, they're going to grow faster. Okay. That's why. Yeah. So that means tempos. That means fucking different resistances, bands, chains, uh, boxes, different foot positions. Mm -hmm. What is the determining factor of which ones you use at what time? Where your fucking weaknesses are. Yeah. So the easiest way to get better is find the weakest shortcomings, the weakest links in the chain, and fix those links. And then the problem is those links change over time. Now, we know that if a hamstring quadricep ratio is off, it's going to take probably about three years to fix. But what happens when it goes one-to-one? -one? What do you do then? Or what happens when it gets better? There's always another weakness somewhere. You just have to be smart enough to find it. But that front cover of that book, when I read it in graduate school, fucking blew my mind. Because mm -hmm. it was everything Louis was talking about. It was some things Paul Quinn was talking about. It was some things Verkashansky and all them other guys from the Soviets were talking about. How do we get better with less energy? Because if we save more energy, we can recover better. And it all comes back down to how you can recover, not how hard you can train. It's not what you can do, it's what you can recover from. So if you get better with less energy, you have more energy to recuperate and therefore you can train harder longer. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that that book I recommend to everyone. And and to kind of end this or top this off, when you guys are like looking at movements for training, um, how often do you pay attention to like how a new stimulus feels? Because one thing too is people now are referencing biomechanics above the sensation of a movement like yeah not all movements are good like for example a chest press with this this is not a good movement but i think what i notice is people are negating how a movement actually feels for a specific muscle group if it doesn't fall in line with what they deem as biomechanically efficient hmm. it's a hard question to answer but I, I think what you're looking for is there is a fine line between biomechanical efficiency and accommodation. Mm -hmm. So basically, if I move, even though that movement pattern is perfect, sometimes a perfect movement pattern doesn't create a new stimulus, therefore doesn't create any new growth. See, there's only a few ways you can make something harder, right? You can add another set. You can add more intensity. You can you did it for eight last time. You could do it for 10. Mm -hmm. All those, everybody wears out. What about just changing the movement? Making the movement more difficult or different to where the body doesn't understand the stimulus anymore. And that's really what I think is efficient is doing movements that are specific enough to give you transfer, but in specific enough that the body has to adjust to it and then finding those movements and rotating them. So I'll give you an example. Um, on squats, we have 30 variations of back squats that we rotate. So I only do the same squat every 30 weeks, <laughs> unless I'm in comp mode. Yeah. If I go to comp mode, then every four weeks I do a straight bar and straight weight and I periodize it. Mm -hmm. But other than that, we have 30 different variations of squats, 
20, 25 different variations of deadlifts and at least that many on the bench press. And we constantly rotate. Yeah. And if I want to, every time I do it, I will break a PR. So when I go back to a straight bar, some of the movements help me at the bottom. Some of them help me at the top. Some of them help me at lockout. Some of them help me in the middle. Some of them help me stabilize better, like hanging kettlebells. Mm -hmm. All of those factors become huge issues, and one of them is the weakness. But at that time, which one is it? Well, if I train all of it, then there are no, none of them are weaknesses. So that's why I can hop in, jump in here, bench 500 with a bar I've never fucking seen, and still do it at a high level. Because I train that way. Mm -hmm. There is no weak spot as far as triceps, pecs, lats. Everything's balanced. So, again, it's efficiency because transfers high, but also weaknesses are very slim. Yeah. And so if you follow those particular parameters, I think your training would not only be smarter, you're going to last way longer. Mm -hmm. And the person that lasts the longest usually is the one that gets the strongest. You can show me an awesome program that gets somebody strong in two years, but in general, if you take that same person and stretch it out and train a little smarter, they're stronger in 10 years than they are in two, yeah. just based on time, yeah. right? It's like jujitsu. You might have a guy that's a freaky athlete, and in one year, he might be able to, like, say, fight in the UFC. But if you stretch that out and you made him learn everything in six or seven years, you're telling me the same guy wouldn't be better? Mm. He would be way better because the absorbability of the training, the experience, getting in different moves he's never seen before. You know, he might be good in certain ways, but other ways he might be really bad. You just don't see it yet. So it's always finding those weak links. So, again, time and experience is something that can't really be bought in a short period of time, and that's what everybody needs to focus on. Because at the end of the day, again, the, most of the sports that we're involved with, nobody's making any real fucking money doing it, so why blow your body apart for nothing? Now, if you're a, if you're yeah. a pro running back in the NFL and they're going to sign you another $40 million to run the ball and blow your fucking knee out, go do it. I'm under, and, and train any fucking way you want to do that. Mm -hmm. But the average person that has to get up and go to work and feed their kids, you're going to go blow your fucking knee off to squat 365 fucked up? Give me a fucking break. That's true. You know what I mean? That's that's what I think about the situation. And that's why I try to train so smart. I think a lot of times it's a good idea, like if you're trying to find something new you're trying and you're trying to get like a feel for something, I think it's a good idea to either have it on a day where – you have zero expectations of like really getting in a good training session at all. Like, let's say you're like, oh, I'm going to try out the bands that uh, Matt's talking about. Well, you don't have to necessarily go in and have a full workout with bands. No. Just put bands on the bar at the end of a workout. You already did your workout. Play around with it. Yeah, fuck around with it a little bit and see how it feels and, and just take note. Okay, it felt that way with 95 pounds on. Um, I think that felt pretty good. I'm actually going to give this a try the next yep. time I come in. Well, then, and That's then, the way well, I've always and then done it. Go back and with all the shit on the on the internet, right or wrong, go fucking read a little. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. I remember Dave just posted like a week or two ago about how pissed off he gets answering questions. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I'll send somebody a fucking two-page article, which is not that long. And they're like, no, 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 I want the answer. <laughs> the answer is in the fucking article, asshole. <laughs> we call it assholes. Mm -hmm. People that want to ask you something, but they're not fucking using it. And so that's, you know, that's something you got to deal with. But um, here's my thing with that whole situation, Mark is it comes back down to what we were talking about already. Consistency. It's all about consistency. So go experiment a little bit. Play around with it in a non-stress environment. If you're not competing or you're not trying to break a world record, what the fuck's your rush anyway? That's what I can't get. I get guys coming to the gym all the time. They're like, man, I really want to get my bench up. I, you know, I want blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, cool. How much you bench? 225. Shut the fuck <laughs> up. Start loving to train first. And then you'll work, then you'll get 500 one of these days, but you can't go from 225 to 500 with a magic trick. It's a fucking desire to learn, experiment, and constantly progress yourself. You know, I mean, when I did my first bench beat, it's going to sound insane. I benched 250 at 13. Okay. Fucking crazy, right? Yeah. It took me a year and a half to bench 315. It took me three more years to bench 380. Uh, sorry, two more years to bench 380. And then a year and a half later, I did 475. Think about that timeline. Now, here's where it really gets fucked up. I benched 500 at 19 at Worlds, and it took me three years to bench 520. Then it took me four more years to bench 600. Damn. I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. I just like training. Mm -hmm. But see, everybody goes, oh, I want to bench 600. Okay, stick. And let me, let me tell you something about that. Every time I stuck, I learned something. Yeah. I wasn't doing enough back. I wasn't doing enough triceps. I didn't have my work capacity high enough. Blah, 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 blah. So the fucking sticking points are the learning points if you're willing to sit down and analyze what you're fucking doing. Mm -hmm. Sticking points are education points. 
And most people stick, then they don't get any smarter, then they don't get any better, then they fucking quit. Yeah. Instead of going, what's the problem here and how do I fix it? Same thing with business. Okay, I didn't make as much money this year as I did last year. What's the problem? Well, I wasn't marketing my manuals, right? Wasn't getting equipment out on time and people canceled their orders, whatever the fuck it is. But the point is, is that self-analyzation in both training, business, and life is the key if you know where to take that information and actually make it work for you. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the trick. And that's why you find successful people don't care about roadblocks. They want to learn from the roadblock. So one, it doesn't happen again. And two, it's never that issue ever again. Yeah. You know, it's all, it, it might, and there's always new issues that pop up, you know, and we constantly change. I mean, who would have thought 30 years ago, the internet was going to be this powerful for business and all this other shit. I mean, your business wouldn't be successful if the internet wasn't around. No, it's only on the internet. We, pretty me much. And you would have both just owned a fucking gym. Yeah. Am I right? So how did anybody know? How were our parents going to teach us that? Mm -hmm. They weren't. We had to evolve. I would say, here's our P.O. box. Send me 50 bucks for a slingshot. <laughs> yeah. So here's... Yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty close voice, too. <laughs> so, um, so think about it in that perspective, right? Like, that's huge. So the point is, is that evolution is, in anything, is key. You have to fucking be thinking about the next step. Mm -hmm. or where your weaknesses are, or what you need at this time. And sometimes it's not simple. And not to go into a deep story, but you know, I'm, I hit the third highest total of all time raw in 2013. So I go from equipped to raw and hit the third highest total right off the fucking rip. Yeah. And what happened was, is that I had just been 600 at a contest. So I was like the 15th guy to ever do it. And Halbert handed out to me. It was fucking mm -hmm. awesome, right? Because Halbert was like, dude, I know you can bench 600. So we trained for it. He got injured. I didn't. Smoked 600. Um, long story short is, so I'm now I'm looking at these records. Dan Kovacs' record, 2202. I'm like, I can fucking beat it, man. I know I can. So I go to the meet. I squat. I hit like 788. Pretty good for, I mean, no knee wraps, no sleeves. Mm -hmm. Walked out. I didn't know it was a walkout meet until I got there. Fucking, that sucked. So <laughs> anyway, I go to the bench, and I already smoked 600 at a meet. I only benched 574. I tried 606 or whatever, and I fucking got crushed. Mm -hmm. I'm, go, I'm driving home like, what the fuck happened? Because I had just done like 565 for a triple. Yeah. I knew 611 was there. And I drove back home, and I'm thinking in my car, and I had the epiphany that no other fucking powerlifter has ever had. I wasn't fit enough. The squat kicked my fucking ass, and I was too tired. Oof. So winning warm-ups started. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, with the bench. So I start, and you saw me the next meet. I'm doing 35 pound, and I try to tell people it's not about progressing the fucking weights. Nobody wants to listen. 35 pound dumbbells for four sets of 25 is all I use for the next six months. Just to get a little, in my mind, it was pre-fatigue and just conditioning. Mm -hmm. What I was doing is potentiating. So I did some lats, some tries, and some presses. 35 pound dumbbells. Nine months later, I go to Royal Unity and fucking smoke 606. You remember it? Yeah. After squatting the world record. So I had one of the highest subtotals in history, especially under 300 pounds, because at that point, I was only a... 295, 290. Yeah. And I started to realize like, holy fuck, I was onto something. So the next meet, I institute it with the squats. Squat goes from 832 to 865 and a half. Bench goes to 611. I was like, and I, and I didn't change anything in my training other than I added in the warm ups, conditioning, GPP before I did my big lift. So I couldn't get tired. And everything about the winning warm ups on your YouTube channel? There's some on there. Yeah. Some on there. Some on there. Yeah. Okay. We, we show the workouts on the Patreon on how to do it because there's a lot of variate. You need variation constantly. Mm -hmm. But what I find is the biggest problem with most people when they do the winning warm-up is they try to go way too heavy. It should never affect the main lift. So depending on what you can do, how good a shape you're in is what you can do for the warm-ups. Yeah. So if you're a big fat power lifter that's never really done any conditioning work, you might be at 20-pound dumbbells to not affect your bench that day. Then you work it up to 25s, then 30s. But this is talking over months mm -hmm. and months. And it's four sets of 25. You might do something else in between. Or are you staying on like the incline bench or flat so bench? So whatever you pick is what you stay. So here's how it works. On the, inc on the winning warm-up, if I'm going to flat bench, the dumbbells are flat benched. I'm warming up and potentiating the exact movement pattern that I want. Yeah. If I'm going to max on incline, it's incline. If I'm going to max on decline, it's decline. If I'm going to do a floor press, it's floor presses. Pretty mm -hmm. simple. That way my motor pattern is exactly dialed for what I need. The other two weaknesses... For most people, are going to be tries and lats. So yeah. I go smack those. And I do four sets of 25 of those three exercises in 12 to 14 minutes. I rest three minutes, and then I start the main lift. I mean, it's pretty simple, but you're potentiating weaknesses. You're getting more fit. You're not resting. So your body's just fucking getting conditioned out the ass, but it's specific enough to get strong Yeah. versus just, say, going and running a couple miles. Do you do a running warm-up for the lower body? Yep. 
So yeah. we belt squat, then we'll do hamstring curls, and then core or glute activation, like glute bridges. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say the belt squat probably reacts for, I'd say, 75% of it. But we'll go really narrow, knees over toes, really wide, sit way back, elevated heel, flat-footed. You name, name Sneak it. Sneak in a set of calf raises. Oh, yeah. Always right? trying to get calves like you, you uh. know. <laughs> You know, so th- my point is, yeah, I mean, calves, I don't do anything that's bodybuilding style for the warm up because I want to potentiate muscle groups in which I know need to function better for the movement coming ahead. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like GHR, well, not GHR because it's too hard, but like 45 degree back extensions, yeah. kneeling cable or band crunches, winning planks. So all these things I'll do for bracing and developing weaknesses, and then I smack right into the main lift. But what I notice, is it actually enhances my motor patterns for the lift at hand. Mm -hmm. Because I just gave it, it's like I just taught my body how to spell, then how to read, and now I gave it a paragraph. Mm -hmm. So the paragraph's the core movement. The spelling and the reading is the warm-up. And now, not only are you less injury prone, but you're also more dialed into your training. Yeah. So to me, there's no downside to it unless you're out of shape. Or going way too heavy. Or going too heavy. And that's a huge issue. But on average, I use 40 pound dumbbells and I can still probably bench about 585. So if you're going heavier than that and you bench 315, you're a fucking idiot. I to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave you the answer there. Take us on out of here, Andrew. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Uh, please that's drop good. those comments down below in the old comment section. I want to hear what you guys have to say about today's conversation. Uh, make sure you guys like today's video and subscribe. Uh, if you guys are not subscribed already, turn on all those bell notifications so you don't miss any other uploads. Uh, please follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z N Sema. Where are you at? Discord's almost Discord. at 2200. So go to the Discord link below and Sema in on Instagram, YouTube, and Sema Yin Yang on tiktok and twitter sorry damn i gotta ask you one more question matt Go this ahead. is too general but um <laughs> yeah this is gonna be way too general for you but um hypothetically you know, if you're doing jujitsu and you're trying to get really strong exactly <laughs> uh, no. but you know you, you're you're an encyclopedia of a lot of really good information when it comes to where people can find different sorts of information and um if there's strength coaches listening and they want to understand maybe where are some books, five or eight strength training books that you hold in high regard that should be in every strength coaches or Mm -hmm. individual's library that wants to learn more about this, what are the ones you would suggest? Well, again, it's going to depend on where your weaknesses are. So if it's mobility, you're going to need mobility work, you know, Mm -hmm. mobility books. If it's strength training that you're deficient in, um, those would be issues as well. Um, So maybe like two or three strength, two or three. Okay. So Thomas Kurtz, Science of Sports Training, we just showed Mm -hmm. on there. That's a fucking awesome book. Um, that's amazing. I also like any of the science and practices strength training by Zatsiorski. Yeah. I am a huge proponent of the original Greenback that came out in 94 because that was all the translated Soviet texts. As it progressed, I think the newest one's better because Andy Fry helped with it, but the one in the middle wasn't as good because they tried to water it down to get people less educated to understand. I open up the Greenback every time and I learn something new and I've had the book for 20 fucking years. <laughs> so that tells you how badass it is. The other one that I think en- encompasses a lot of great information, but is more of a, more of a, I don't know what you call it, an index or a glossary, is Super Training by Mel Siff and, and Verkashansky. Mm-hmm. But that book, you don't open it and read it front to back. You open it with a question, you look in the front contents, and you look up the title in which you're trying to find, and you go read that, and you close the fucking book, <laughs> because you're going to go down the fucking rabbit hole, am I right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that's an amazing one. And then anything that Verkashansky or Mevdiev wrote, which is going to come in like Lilavati Press, that's printed in Michigan. They're more like manual texts, mm. but they were the old Soviet translated books. There's one called, I think, Special Strengths and Multi-Year Weightlifting. And you start to read that and go, holy fuck, these guys were way out of hand as far as what they knew. Yeah. Um, so strength training wise, those would be some big stop. Now, anything that Tudor Bompa writes mm-hmm. for periodization is amazing. Um, so I have a lot of his texts. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Any, you know, the old articles, if you can find them from Charles, they can go off the deep end a little bit, but they do have some very solid information. Um, some of the references that I've used from my book coming out is actually Charles's articles where he has references from shit that's not even in English. So like wow. you would be surprised what came out of France, East Germany, mm. Bulgaria back in the 70s and 80s that the Americans have never even seen. Mm-hmm. Again, like you know we were talking about RPE, uh RPE scale was switched to the Bulgarian system I want to say in the mid late 70s because what they found was that no matter how much they controlled all the variables in training <clears throat> 
their strength fluctuated 10 to 20% per day. Wow. So how in the fuck can you base that on percentages? You can't at a high level. Mm -hmm. So what they started to realize was RPE was a better scale to keep the guys, you know, again, we were talking about how much water is in your cup today to train. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust that. So um, those are huge. I would say the book I showed you by Leon Chatel for soft tissue manipulation is fucking amazing and will yeah. open your eyes up to shit you never even thought of. I can't wait for that one to come You're going to love it. <laughs> yeah. So you have to text me and tell me how you like it. Mm -hmm. I will. Um, we'll so to track I, that guy down, it sounds like. Is he alive? I, I don't know. I mean, he was older guy back yeah. in the early 2000s. My guess is he's probably dead. Oh. But he trained all of the physical therapists and massage therapists at IPI. They had to be certified through him in Canada before they could come work with the athletes. Wow. And the shit they knew, I was like, what the fuck, right? Charles knew a lot of that. Um, so I would say those those areas would be great to start on. But the Thomas Kurtz book's nice because it doesn't just go into lifting. It's track stuff and plyometrics. Um, there's a book, a Polish Polish sprinting and jumping book. I think it's Travisky is talk about um he's talking about plyometric sports and training. And that book is where Louie got a lot of the uh, information for not only speed work but different types of jumping activities to be better at sports. Mm -hmm. So like you saw in that video Ben Johnson doing those hurdle jumps and then sprints. Yeah. He got a lot of that from the old East German uh, mm. training stuff. So this is what's crazy. In my research for my book, what I found was is that East Germany was actually the hot spot for the advanced knowledge that the Soviets had. And here's the reason. So Soviet Union had so many scientists and so much drive to learn strength sports, mm -hmm. you know, especially for Olympic lifting to win gold medals because they wanted to show they were better than us for the Soviet Union. And strength training, they were. Um, but the problem is they had economic issues. So although... The training halls weren't very nice. A lot of the professors weren't getting paid very much. Bulgaria had the same problem. Yeah. They had a great population to grab a hold of. They had great coaches, and they learned a lot from the Soviet Union how to develop that, but they were also economically strained. Mm -hmm. East Germany was weird. East Germany had a lot of money as a country, but had all the information shared from them from Russia. So I believe that if the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall, would have stayed up for maybe another 15 or 20 years— the information would have been insane because East Germany had the Soviet literature, some of the Soviet coaches, and the money. So the shit that you see coming from East Germany from like 1983 to when the wall fell yeah. was like, holy shit. They had it dialed the fuck in, but it just wasn't long enough. Mm. So if you look at a lot of the big records that were broke in the 80s, it was East Germany. And people will blame it on drugs and everything, but it's not. Is it uh is it true? Uh, you, you might have knowledge of this. Is it true that like the Soviets, it, it appeared that they studied like everything. Like, if an athlete had milk before they trained, mm -hmm. if they had milk after they trained, and people were just fired so just like check, that. Check this. If they did, didn't now, get results, right? I would have to have my research right in front of me to tell you, but I'll give you the I'll give you the uh, the roundabout numbers. In Saint Petersburg, where the big lifting halls were for the Soviet training center. They had 650 researchers for just Olympic lifting at that center. Now, you fucking tell me that they weren't studying everything. Now, Holy the guy that started, this is how advanced the Soviets were at this time and why I hope everybody listening is going to go and read as much as they can find on the Soviet training system. 1910, there was a guy named Kravosky. <laughs> Kravosky was a fucking physician that was telling, 1910, was telling the athletes, no smoking, this is when you're going to sleep, this is when you're going to train and started the first implementation of blood work. 19 fucking 10. If you were to come in and an athlete comes, yeah, I'm at the USOC and they draw my blood every two weeks and they're telling me to do this. You're like, wow, they really got it advanced. They were doing that fucking shit 120 years ago <laughs> in Russia. Wow. And you're like, what the fuck? But Kravosky was like a huge proponent of strength. He wanted to see what the human body was capable of and he had, within reason, a decent amount of money because he was a physician. Mm -hmm. So he started the weight training program in St. Petersburg and he's the one that trained Hatch, Hacker Smith and also mm. had big connections with uh, uh, Eugene Sandow. Wow. So we're talking all the pioneers of strength training. Yeah. yeah. And so what you find is really interesting is that Kravosky was 75 years ahead of his time. Um, the Soviets put so much emphasis in strength and power because of the amount of gold medals you could win. Think about this. In, in Olympic sports, if you could win all the hammer, all the shot put, all the discus, all the track sports that are sprinting activities – Javelin, shot put, hammer, sprints, triple jumps, 100-meter dash, right? Let's go on and on. Mm -hmm. Now all the Olympic lifting classes, both male and female, you fucking win the Olympics. That's why they cared so much. 
They wanted to show, look at the communist system, look how much more advanced we are. Mm-hmm. They just didn't have the money. Why, why do you think the training is so similar for track and lifting? Like they seem to parallel each other pretty well. Because everything's usually under 10 seconds. Mm. That's why. Energy systems are similar. So if you look at a 100-meter dash, it's over nine and a half. Well, nine, I don't even know what fucking Usain Bolt runs now, but it's yeah, under 10. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You look at a max effort squat, under 10. You look at a max effort clean and jerk, under 10. You look at a triple jump, under 10. Pull vault, under 10. So if everything's under 10 seconds, it's all anaerobic capacity, ATP, PCR. Mm-hmm. That's why it matches. It's the energy systems match. And so when the energy systems match, they share similarities on how to train. Sometimes when something takes longer, though, it seems to even match, like in the case of like a 400 or a mile. The, well, the rest intervals that were mm-hmm. associated with sprinting and the rest intervals associated with lifting are somewhat yep. similar. Because what you find is anaerobic capacity, which is the ability to do something fairly like 520 for 24. That transfers to maximum strength and mm-hmm. endurance mm-hmm. and speed. You can't do that if you're not quick because if it takes you six minutes to do it, you're fucking dead in two. Yep. So that took me – If you, that's the sped up video that's because we had to fit it in a minute. But it took me a minute and 47 seconds oh, to man. do it. Wow. Oh, shit. So imagine just the average person listening standing there with 520 pounds. Hey, that's a great challenge. That's a good winning yeah, just challenge. Stand, just stand there. Just stand mm. there with 520 for a minute 47. And you tell me how you fucking I think feel. a good challenge would just be somebody just to squat whatever weight they felt they could squat for one minute straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That alone would be brutal. The hard part with 520 to do that many reps is that you have to stabilize at the top every time. Mm-hmm. So you would come up, stand, rebrace, ba-boom, mm. rebrace. If you go like this, boom, 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 boom. By 12, you're toast. Yeah, you miss one. You have to boom, boom, reset, boom, boom, reset. So you boom, reset boom, on reset. every rep. There weren't any reps where you held, boom, boom. Nope. Come up. Couldn't. Wow. Couldn't. I, I I'll tell one. you why, because I tried. Yeah. This was like five, six years ago. Michael Hearn called me out and said, hey, Matt, hey, Matt how many times can you do 500? I said, more than you, fucking piece of shit. Right? <laughs> so we do it. We do it. And I think Stan, he's telling Stan, too. This was yeah. like 2017. Uh-huh. And I'm still like beefy i'm like almost three wheels right yeah. but i don't have that level of endurance <laughs> but i've been doing warm-ups so i'm pretty good shape mm-hmm. so i get 20 o'hearn gets like 18 and stan gets like 12 because he's already on the way down and he was already he's older than well I think, yeah he's older than both of us so the point was is i was doing that and i'm like i'm gonna smash the first fucking 12 no breaths mm-hmm. no nothing so i fucking pick it up and boom 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 i got to 15 and i was almost gassed and I was like, fuck, I should have stopped between each one and got a breath, yeah. reset myself. Because a couple times, it threw me a little bit back mm-hmm. and a little bit forward. Well, a little bit back and a little bit forward waxes the stabilizers. Mm-hmm. Versus if I just stay yeah. right planted where I want to be, then I can keep everything minimal expense. Because as soon as something gets out of plane or out of your positioning, yeah. you're not going to have as much power and you're going to wear out faster. Mm-hmm. You know, be jujitsu. You get one inch out of position, how yeah. much more energy do you have to use to get back? A lot. But if you stay in position, not much. Mm-hmm. Well, minimal. So the point is, is that's the same thing with those kind of levels of squats. So I'd already tried that and did 12 with no air. Yeah. And I noticed it killed me. So I, I learned from that mistake five years ago. There we go. Yeah. Uh, what's the most valuable thing you learned from Louis Simmons? Whew, that's a good one. <clears throat> well... How do we do this without going into a half an hour? Because there was a lot. Take the, your time. Okay. No well, rush. the first thing I would say I learned was the value and the intensity in which it was going to take to be a world record holder. So, you know, as well as I do, um, especially at that time in the late 90s, you walk in to Westside Barbell, you better bring your fucking Wheaties. Because every day is a contest and you training at Westside is about five times harder than doing a contest. Because not only are they going to push you past their expectations, you're going so far beyond what you think training is, you don't have a fucking clue what that takes. And that's why every workout we ever did past then was fucking easy. So I learned by, and maybe it was too much, but I learned by watching Kenny and Chuck and George, the amount of veracity, intensity, and focus it was going to take to break world records. Because I'd already won a world, but I was a teen and I wanted to be the best in open. I wanted to be the best 275, three, I didn't know I'd be a 308 at the time. 275, 308, I could be. Mm-hmm. And so I'm watching these guys as a uh, as a mirroring effect. Like, I, okay, this is what I need to be to be this good. And um, that's exactly what I needed at that time because I had gotten to that point lifting them either kind of by myself or at, at a YMCA. Mm-hmm. They're playing fucking Backstreet Boys over the radio. 
and they won't change it for me. And I'm like, I'm getting ready to go to Worlds, man. I need some shit. No, we got Mrs. Smith over here walking on the treadmill, you know? <laughs> so I got my Walkman fucking cranked, and I'm yeah. trying to do 600 over here in the corner while this asshole is walking on the treadmill. So <laughs> when I got there, there was none of that problem. It was fucking like a rock show, mm -hmm. and chalk everywhere, fucking blood all over the floor. And I'm like, this is what it's going to take to be the best. So that was probably the biggest thing I took from him is that switch. Mm. When I came into the gym after training at Louis, I had a fucking switch. Like, one, I felt invincible at anything I did. Two, the confidence level was fucking insane. And three, I hardly ever failed. I mean, when did you ever see me fail in training? Right. Not very often. It's because I was going to make my fucking self do it because that's how I got grenaded when I was a kid. So the intensity was high. The next thing is, is that Louie taught me that it was just as important to read as it was to train. I was already reading and I'd already been kind of baffled by what he knew because he was bringing a physics equation into the training, almost like Hatfield did 10 years beforehand. He's talking about getting faster to get stronger. And he's talking about all these special movements. Forces, of just, mass times acceleration. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, doing the dynamic effort method. I never heard to work on getting quicker to get stronger yeah. from the fucking why. And so we did linear periodization, but this is what's crazy is I, my shoulders, my elbows, my knees were already getting pissed at 20. Mm -hmm. When I switched to this system, took a year to get my body to understand what I needed. I switched the system and pain-free. I mean, my joints felt like I was young again, like young meaning I was young, but young, like I wasn't already been lifting for eight years. Yeah. And I'm like, motherfucker, I feel so much better doing this system. It was a no brainer. So learning to economize my energy, not specifically train one particular way too often, mm -hmm. which we just talked about for three fucking hours, um, that that helped. And then the next thing was um, what he didn't teach me by doing something incorrect. And what I mean by that is that by the time I was there and almost had worn out my tenure, I started to realize some things on how not to act. Meaning like Louis would play favorites. Louis would have ulterior motives to get somebody stronger. I never wanted to be that. I wanted to be face value at all times. Um, and, and that's what my firemen really like me because I treat them all the same. Mm -hmm. I don't play favorites. I don't do anything like that. And I don't switch on people. So Louie could be your best friend one day and your worst enemy the next. And to me, it's about stability. Like when somebody comes in, you need stability, especially when I need to have these firemen stay around me for 25, 30 years. Yeah. The reason Louie acted like that is because he didn't care if you came or went, and he knew your shelf life was probably about a year and a half, two years. So for him to be a dickhead was was fine. And I, I'm not saying that maybe some of the guys didn't need that, but he lost a lot of his best lifters because of his attitude, in my opinion. Mm. Um, you know, when he felt like Mark had had enough of him or vice versa, Mark didn't like Mark for a while. Same with me. When he thought I was spent and didn't have any more left to give, then I was the ultimate asshole. And I, to me, there's more to lifting than that. You know, I, I'm still friends with Mark, even though we don't train the same way. No, I haven't for a while. But, you know, the thing of it is, is like Louie wouldn't be friends with somebody he doesn't have that exact same passion with mm. at that exact same time. And you start to realize that relationships are more important than numbers. And I think he realized that the last couple of years and why he sent me the books and signed them and told me he was proud of me. But, yeah, there was a couple of things that I think that made him, made me realize that there are certain ways I want to be like him and other ways I don't. So I, th I think that kind of answers the question, sort of. What about for me, grandma? Oh, my grandma was out of hand. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you had good stories on previous shows oh, that we've fuck. done. Well, I mean, we could redo them a little bit, but so uh, the 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 bike the the motorcycle rides kind of was a fault. I didn't realize that was going to happen. It was like 2012 Easter, and uh, my sister had talked about wanting to see Montana, mm -hmm. and we were looking at the timeline, and I had just got back from one of my big military contracts, so. Um, I had extra money in the bank and extra time. And so my, my sister's like, well, I'll just meet you out in, um, out in Glacier and we'll just hang out for like a week and come home. And my grandma's like, well, fuck you guys. I want to go. And that's how my grandma was. Yeah. And, uh, I was like, grandma, come on, like ride the chain with, ride the chain with grandma or with Megan, my sister. And, uh, I'll meet you guys out there. And she's like, no, I want to ride on the motorcycle. I'm like, seriously, that's 2,700 miles, one fucking way. <laughs> and you... She's like, I'm used to sitting on my ass all fucking day. It ain't going to matter. Yeah. And uh, the story gets funnier. But so he, so I'm like, okay, fuck it. So I'm like, she came over to Columbus and I got her leather jackets and boots and 
fucking assless chaps and <laughs> you know fucking decked her out yeah and, yeah and uh so we get we get that all done and i take her back and i can't remember if we eat for like labor day or something like right before the trip and she gives me this this is one you haven't heard she sits and she gets all serious she gets serious when she called me matthew i'm like yeah what's up grandma she goes when do you start going back to church and i said well why the fuck would I do that? <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and she fucking gets beat red, dude. She's like, well, don't you want to go to heaven? And I said, well, why? I won't have any friends or family there. And the whole the whole family's at the table. And and she looks at me, and my mom starts laughing. And she goes, well, fuck it. Fair enough. <laughs> like, she knew we were all going to hell, so it didn't matter. <laughs> Goddamn. So that's how me and grandma were. So I'll give you another uh, story you hadn't heard. So the first trip we ever do, we go to Montana. And the first day, we go from Columbus, Ohio, all the way to the Finger Lakes in Wisconsin, like two hours above Chicago. Eight-hour day on a bike with a 73-year-old lady. And so I get off and I'm filling up my bike and this lady's giving me weird looks like she can't figure out if that's a relative or my, like my sugar mama, you know, like, or maybe I'm into old ladies or something. So I play it up. So I'm, I'm getting ready to fill up my bike. I'm like, hey, grandma, go get me a drink. And I smack her on the ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the lady, the lady is like, is looking at me super fucked up, right? Like thinking, oh, this, he's banging this chick. And, and like, I, like she went and bought me the bike and I'm just out of prison and I'm just living off her money or something. <laughs> and so I'm just really digging it. Right. And so she comes back. I said, did you pick up any sunscreen? And she's like, why would I get sunscreen? I said, because your arm on the backside's burnt where your triceps used to be. Because <laughs> oh. I was like, told her she had fucking Walmart arms. Oh, oh. And so now this lady is pissed. She comes around the corner and goes, I wouldn't believe you would talk to somebody like that. And I said, and I said, well, she likes it. You know, she likes it a little rough. <laughs> oh, and then I hop on the bike, vroom, fucking take off. And she's on the back. It's hilarious, dude. Oh. So yeah, we had a blast. You know, but it was weird. She was kind of a control freak. Yeah. So she wasn't trying to control me riding, but we get up in the morning. Well, where are we going to make it today? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. We're going west. Yeah. Because I that's the funnest part about She wants to know the plan. Mm. She wants to know where we're gonna stay, where we're gonna eat, how far we're gonna go. I'm like, Grandma, when we take these trips, we ride a direction. I don't give a <laughs> fuck where we go. Like, I want to know structure. I just want to hit the fucking road. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah, you know, that's cool. My grandma hated it. Yeah. So like the first five, six days that we're gone, she is just trying to control the shit out of me. And I'm like, Grandma, you either sit back and shut the fuck up or I'm putting you on a plane and you're flying back. I'm not dealing with this shit anymore. So this is another story you haven't heard. So the second ride, we're coming back and we rode all the way into Canada uh -huh. through the Upper Peninsula, through Sault Ste. Marie and all that. And then I got up to a point where it was all French signs and I didn't know what the fuck I was saying. So I'm like, we need to turn around because I'm like, we're, I don't know where we're going. Yeah. So we end up coming back around Wisconsin and whatever. We stop at this fucking Amish place that she somehow looked up and goes, well, I, I'd like to stop at this. I'm like, I'll stop wherever you want. I don't care. She comes out with this fucking gallon of lavender ironing water. I'm on a fucking motorcycle. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want me to do with that? Well, you have anything on the bike you can just throw away and put in there? Like, you mean my fucking clothes? <laughs> she made me throw away five of my shirts so she could fit <laughs> ironing water. What the hell is ironing water? So it's like that water iron. you put in your iron. iron, but uh -huh. it has smell to it. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, who the fuck uses ironing water my anymore? My clothes are going to smell so good. Yeah, so I basically threw away like literally half of my clothes to fit her fucking ironing water on the way home. And, and I was just so pissed. But, I, you know, I had to let her do it. You know what I mean? Oh, man. You still got your bike? <laughs> yep. So I have a new bike. See if you can bike. pull up the clip of uh, him at the at old gym. ST? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. That. I so that. I don't have that one anymore. I got a newer one. So the big Ford dealership, I, I work at the seventh largest Ford dealership in the country. And they built me my own facility. But they also own all the Harley dealers in They in built town. you a gym inside the Ford inside dealership? Inside the Ford dealership. And that's where the employees and stuff work out? Mm -hmm. So oh, I go there awesome. twice wow. a week, and I train cool. all, the, all the diesel mechanics, any of the gas mechanics that want to come in and some oh, of the administration. Oh, you were saying, yeah, they got to lift heavy-ass yeah, pieces, they were getting right? getting all kinds of injuries. Because think about this. You know, you got a big... They also work on commercial vehicles, too, mm -hmm. like box trucks. Oh, shit. So now you're leaning over these hoods, picking up these huge parts off these diesel engines, one of the tires and rims on one of those on one of those trucks weighs 325 pounds, and most of those Damn. guys don't work out. Could you imagine moving those all day? Oh God, yeah, that's. Oh, is this where right I come now. in on the bike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you remember when we put Smokey on the back and I he fucking pulled so, a fat wheelie with him on there. He was so happy. <laughs> so this was me coming back from a trip. That was probably one of my favorite bikes. That that's was a, a sick bike. That was a 120 cubic inch Road Glide. When that bike was, that was one of my favorite. And you could tell I'm way more bloated. Face is a bit rounder. <laughs> Got some more yeah, cheeks. sandals, dog. <laughs> so I rode sandals like literally all the way across the country. Oh, God, man. you're so fat right there. You look like Jesse Burdick. I know. I know. <laughs> way stronger though. Oh, look at the helmet. 
Yeah, helmet bench pressing. Safety first. How many reps do I do here? I don't even remember. Still got some veins on the bicep though. Mm-hmm. What's your best with two twenty five? Sixty three. What about three fifteen? You ever do that? Uh, thirty two. So I've done thirty two with three fifteen. Thirty two reps with three hundred fifty. Sixty three with two twenty five. <laughs> twenty twenty two with four oh five and eleven with five hundred. God, we were we were both a little more bloated back then. <laughs> God, yeah. you were already starting bit. to get leaner then, though. Y'all have some double chins. Yeah. Well, you want a backup chin. <laughs> <laughs> was this twenty fifteen? Probably somewhere in there. Yeah. So this is about right after I squatted the all time world record raw. Yeah. Yeah. Just was, whipped from equipment. So I was already getting, dude. I was way thicker than that five years before that. Oh. Remember? Yeah. oh. So I was just starting to get more athletic there. This would have been around two thousand seven. This is Bill trying to hang with me on the bench. <laughs> and it not and it not working out well for me. <laughs> I, I could cheat better than you. On you the could. Bench. You were a fucking animal. Oh yeah, man! I can't believe this was seven years ago. It's just time just goes by so fast. Was it? This was even at the other gym, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it. Was that gym bigger than this one? I can't remember. Ah, uh, that gym was a little bit smaller than this one, probably. It was actually much smaller actually than quite this a one. bit smaller. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Forgot we, yeah, we have the uh, the. Uh, the turf and all that shit. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's quite the a bit bigger. The worst part about yeah. that whole thing is that's a 3X shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you filled no. it out quite well. Yeah. Dang. Where can people find it? Yeah, where can they it. order uh, the manuals you have on your website? Mm -hmm. And where can they pick up a bench press and all the so different stuff that you sell? Five, we did, oh, that was today yeah. or yesterday. Um, so winningstrength.com has all the Super stuff. Easy. Obviously, if you're on Instagram, uh, real Matt Winning, because there's a lot of fake ones out there. Um is I show a lot of the training clips that we do. The YouTube channel is just winning strength. We show a lot of different ways to train. Um, we put a lot of the more detailed information, kind of like what we went over in the podcast on the Patreon channel. And I show every workout, every rep, everything I do at That's the highest awesome. tier. The next tier at 25, we show three times a week and what all my firemen and my businessmen do. And then we have two other tiers where we show weight loss and uh, 50 plus if you're retired. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create some other tiers that were really affordable for people so they wouldn't go in and just do stupid shit like we see all the time. Um, so with that, we put a lot of special projects on there. And then over the next six to 10 months, we're going to flip the website over on a spot to a uh, membership. And then what they'll be able to do is get special like uh, seminar footage videos me doing like one and two hour tutorials on squatting or deadlifting and then they just pay a monthly fee and they can go on there and see anything they want to see at all times Sick. and then they'll each, they'll even get manuals for free mm -hmm. so i think that might be a better idea plus we can protect it a little bit better too um but yeah the the manuals and stuff i mean in my opinion and like i said everybody has their opinion but have you have you looked into a couple of my manuals or seen any of them you used to program for our gym and stuff and then you uh you sent me a thing a long time ago uh for my son jake yeah and so i'm very familiar with i haven't seen this yeah. manual some of the, some of the ones, manuals specifically so the newer but, ones we put a lot of i put a lot of papers and research into them so not only do we train smart but we also back it in the manuals and they can and just get that why, from your website yeah and that's why human kinetics asked me to write a book on training which they didn't even ask louie to do mm -hmm. which i thought was really impressive louie had books out but not necessarily a published author by a reputable yeah that's um, a big company publisher they're, they're the books that i had reading in college yeah and they're like we want a functional conjugate training book from you with everything that you've learned and i'm like okay so point being is um a lot of that is spawned from they saw the manuals, how successful they were, how much information and time and effort I put into them. And basically just wanted me to conglomerate it down into an educational book. We already got like 50 professors that want them to use them in their class. How long do you think it's going to be until it's I know you said it's going to be a few years. I've been but. busting ass on I got nine chapters laid out in my computer. Mm -hmm. I got them each about 60 to 70% done. Then it's going to go through editing. My guess is I should have everything done written-wise by – January, February, hmm. and then I want to have it go through editing. It's going to have to go through editing for probably four or five months mm -hmm. to add the right graphs. So I have the graphs that I want in the book already there, but they're not my graphs. Hmm. So we have a copyright issue. So I'm going to have to make my own graphs. Well, there, Human Kinetics does all that with the yeah. editing. Yeah. So I'm hoping that it's available by the end of 24. Nice. That's the goal. But they said once the book's done and ready to print, it's one year to get it re to get it on the table. Because it's going to be a hardback, mm -hmm. which is like science practice strength training, which yeah. to me is like putting mm -hmm. me in that yeah. legend status, you know, like, and Kramer's going to help me polish up oh, a lot nice. of the anatomy and physiology. It's mm -hmm. kind of his last hoorah mm. to help me with it. I, I messaged him and basically begged him like, dude, 
I know you don't owe me anything, but it would be an honor for you to help me with this book. He's like, fuck yeah. Yeah. So he's he's all about it. So him and uh, Kramer, I'm going to get Voigt to do a little bit probably on nutrition. So I got some heavy hitters helping me with this mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. which I think is going to be one of the better ones ever written, especially in conjugate. But yeah. I read, I like Bompas and I like those books, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. But when I read those, I don't get as much out of them as I think I would. Like they're, they're, you have to be highly educated to really understand what they're saying, and the application of the knowledge is very vague. That's piece a lot of shit together. You have to piece a they lot. They don't really give you like a summary. So I want to break it down. Super to training is really bad that way. It's really bad, yeah. yeah. Because super training is more of like a, like a dictionary. Yeah. It tells you a lot of shit, but it doesn't tell you how to put it all together. So I, I haven't don't, read super training. I need to get that. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to do a book that way, so I want to do it that way. But, um, but yeah, so. Um, I would say that the YouTube is a great way to see kind of what I do, what my thought processes are. I mean, it basically breaks down a lot of shit we talked about mm -hmm. in a higher depth. And we really just made the Patreon to help with the cost of YouTube channels and shit. I mean, I'm, I'm paying a fucking media guys like five G's a month mm -hmm. just to give out free videos. That's where I try to get people to understand. I'm like, you're free to you. They ain't fucking free to me, you know? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was more to, hey, let's support Matt Winning and help him out with getting out better content. So that's kind of what that's we awesome. did. Do you have any desire to uh, be like a teacher and maybe certify people in uh, that's all kinetics. things related yeah, to that's, Matt Winning? That's Kinetic's idea. So they want to launch the book. They want to sign, they signed me to a deal. They want me to sign a three edition deal. So it'd be first, second, and third edition. So we're talking like 15 years. Mm -hmm. And they're like, the next step is we want to create a certification on your training methods, but through human kinetics which is fucking crazy. I mean, that's yeah. like NSCA level shit. Yeah. So what I would like to do is talk to the NSCA and see if I can have a branch off of the CSCS. It's a conjugate mm -hmm. thought process because they did it with tactical, but I'm not really impressed with what they did with it because they, they piecemeal it together and it's a good test, but it's not great. And if I can have control over the test, because a lot of people don't know, but I designed the Westside Barbell certification. But when I left, I let Louie keep it and then he dumbed the test down so people could pass it. We gave it to the people at Westside Barbell, and three people passed it. Me, uh, Louie, and George Halbert. That test else. was hard as fuck. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, the first couple questions, I'm like, whoa, I'm in for it. <laughs> Fucking A. So I had an 85% pass rate, and it was, I mean, it was brutal. We only had three people pass in the gym mm -hmm. that trained that way, and which isn't uncommon. A lot of them weren't highly educated, but my point is, is that um, I would like to have a really high-level certification that you really need to know your shit to get. I think that's a big separator right now. They become about money mm -hmm. instead of education. And I I want to get to that point maybe in five years where the money's not an issue to me. I want people that have that stamp of approval. They're really trendsetters in the field. That's mm -hmm. that's my goal. Thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Strength is never weakness. Weakness never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. <laughs>